crackling. Depending how long they'd burned for, their flesh was sometimes grey and hard, sometimes raw and bloody like seared, undercooked pork. Cleo had read once that cannibal tribes in Central Africa called white man Long Pig. She understood exactly why. It was the reason many people who worked in mortuaries were uncomfortable at barbecues, particularly when pork was involved. Together they rolled the cadaver onto her stomach and examined her back for tattoos, birthmarks and bullet entry wounds, but found nothing. With relief they finally eased her into a body bag, zipped it up and slid it into fridge number 17. Tomorrow the process of identifying her would begin. The soft tissues from her fingers were gone, so there were no prints that could be taken. Her jaw was intact, so dental records could be checked. DNA was a longer shot. She would need to already be on a database to find a match. Her description and photographs and measurements would be sent to the missing person's helpline, and Sussex police would contact friends and relatives of anyone who had been reported missing who fitted the description of this dead woman. And in the morning, the consultant pathologist, Dr. Nigel Churchman, would conduct a post-mortem to establish the cause of death. If, during the course of this, he found anything suspicious, he would halt his work immediately, the coroner would be notified, and a home office pathologist, either Nadiushka or Dr. Theobald, would be called in to take over. In the meantime, both Cleo and Darren had several hours remaining of a glorious August Sunday afternoon ahead of them. Darren left first, in his small red Nissan, heading for the barbecue he really could have done without. Cleo stood in the doorway, watching him drive off, unable to stop herself from envying him. He was young, full of enthusiasm, happy in his relationship with his girlfriend and in his job. She was rapidly heading for the wrong side of thirty, enjoying her career but worrying about it at the same time. She wanted to have children before she was too old, yet each time she thought she had found Mr. Wright, he would spring something on her from left field. Roy was such a lovely man, but just when she thought everything was perfect, his missing wife popped up like a bloody jack-in-the-box. She set the alarm, stepped outside and locked the front door, with just one thought in her mind, to get home and see if there was a message from Roy. Then, walking across the tarmac drive to her blue MG, she stopped dead in her tracks. Somebody had slashed the black canvas roof open, all the way from the windscreen to the rear window. Chapter 64 The woman behind the wooden counter and glass window handed him a buff-coloured rectangular form. Please put your name and address and other details on this, she asked him in a weary voice. She looked as if she'd been sitting there for too long, reminding him of an exhibit in a museum showcase that someone had neglected to dust. Her face had an indoors pallor, and her shapeless brown hair hung around her face and shoulders like curtains that had become detached from some of their rings. Above the reception desk of the Accident and Emergency Unit of the Royal Sussex County Hospital was a large LCD display of yellow letters on a black background, currently reading, Waiting Time, Three Hours. He considered the form carefully. A name, address, date of birth, and next of kin were required. There was also a space for allergies. Everything all right? the woman asked. He raised his swollen right hand. Difficult to write, he said. Would you like me to fill it in for you? I can manage. Then, leaning on the counter, he stared at the form for some moments, his brain muzzed by the pain, really not functioning that well at all. He was trying to think quickly, but the thoughts he'd wanted didn't come in the right sequence. He felt a little dizzy suddenly. You can sit down and fill it in, she said. Snapping back at her, he shouted, I said I can manage! People all around looked up from their hard grey plastic seats, startled. Not smart, he thought. Not smart to draw attention. Hastily he filled out the form and then, as if to make amends, beside allergies he wrote wittily, he thought pain. But she didn't appear to notice as she took the form back. Please take a seat and a nurse will come and see you shortly. Three hours, he said. I'll tell them it's urgent, she said flatly, then watched warily as the strange man with long, straggly brown hair, a heavy moustache and a beard, and large tinted glasses, wearing a baggy white shirt over a string vest, 
grey slacks and sandals, walked over to an empty seat between a man with a bleeding arm and an elderly woman with a bandaged head, and sat down. Then she picked up her phone. The time billionaire unclipped the blackberry from its holster, which was attached to his belt. But before he had time to do anything, a shadow fell in front of him. A pleasant-looking, dark-haired woman in her late forties, in nursing uniform, was standing over him. The badge on her lapel read, Barbara Leach, A&E Nurse. Hello, she said breezily. Would you come with me? She led him into a small booth and asked him to sit down. What seems to be the problem? He raised his hand. I hurt it working on a car. How long ago? Thinking for a moment, he said, Thursday afternoon. She examined it carefully, turning it over, then comparing it to his left hand. Mm, it looks infected, she said. Have you had a tetanus injection recently? I don't remember. She studied it again for a while thoughtfully. Working on a car, she said. An old car. I'm restoring it. I'll get the doctor to see you as soon as possible. He went back to his chair in the waiting room and turned his attention back to his Blackberry. He logged onto the web and then clicked on his bookmark for Google. When that came up, he entered a search command for MGTF. That was the car Cleo Mori drove. Despite his pain, despite his muzzy thoughts, a plan was forming. Really quite a good plan. Fucking brilliant, he said out loud, unable to control his excitement. Then immediately he shrank back into his shell. He was shaking. Always a sign that the Lord approved. Chapter 65 Reluctantly cutting short his precious hours in Munich, Grace managed to board an earlier flight. The weather in England had changed dramatically during the day, and shortly after six o'clock in the evening, as he went to get his car from the short-stay multi-storey car park at Heathrow, the sky was an ominous grey and a cold wind was blowing, flecking the windscreen with rain. It was the kind of wind that she forgot even existed during the long summer days they'd had recently, he reflected. It was like a stern reminder from Mother Nature that summer was not going to last much longer. The days were already getting shorter. In little over a month it would be autumn, then winter, another year. Feeling flat and tired, he wondered what he had achieved today, apart from earning another black mark in Alison Vosper's book. Anything at all? He pushed his ticket into the machine and the barrier rose. Even the rorty sound of the engine as he accelerated which ordinarily he liked listening to, seemed off-key tonight. Definitely not firing on all cylinders, like its owner. Sort yourself out in Munich. Call me when you get back home. As he headed towards the roundabout, taking the direction for the M25, he stuck his phone on the hands-free cradle and dialed Cleo's mobile. It started ringing. Then he heard her voice, a little slurred, and hard to decipher above a raucous din of jazz music in the background. Yo, Detective Superintendent Roy Grace, where are you? Just left Heathrow. You? I'm getting smashed with my little sister. We're on our third sea breezes. No, sorry, correct that. We're on our fifth sea breezes, down by the arches. It's blowing a hooli. It's a great band. Come and join us. I have to go to a crime scene. Later? Don't think we'll be conscious much longer. So you're not on call today? Day off. Can I swing by later? Can't guarantee I'll be awake. But you can try. When he was a kid, Church Road Hove was the dull backwater that Brighton's busy, buzzy shopping street Western Road morphed into, somewhere west of the Waitrose supermarket. It had perked up considerably in recent years, with trendy restaurants, delis and shops displaying stuff that people under 90 might actually want to buy. Like most of this city, many of the familiar names from his past along Church Road, such as the grocer's Cullens, the chemist's Paris and Greening, the department store's Hills of Hove and Plummer and Roddis, had now gone. Just a few still remained. One was Forfars the Bakers. He turned right shortly past them, drove up a one-way street, made a right at the top, then another right into Newman Villas. As with most lower-rent residential areas of this transient city, the street was a riot of letting agency boards. 
Number 17 was no exception. A Rand & Co. sign, prominently displayed, advertised a two-bedroom flat to let. Just inches below it, a burly uniformed police constable holding a clipboard stood in front of a barrier of blue and white crime scene tape that was cordoning off some of the pavement. Parked along the street were a number of familiar vehicles. Grace saw the square hulk of a major incident vehicle, several other police vehicles double parked, making the narrow street even narrower, and a cluster of media reporters, with good old Kevin Spinella, he noted, among them. Anonymous in his private alpha, he drove past them all and found a space on double yellow lines around the corner, back in Church Road. Switching the engine off, he sat still for a moment. Sandy. Where did he go from here? Wait to see if Cullen came up with anything? Go back to Munich and spend some time there? He had over a fortnight's leave owing. Cleo and he had discussed going away somewhere together, with her perhaps accompanying him to a police symposium in New Orleans at the end of this month. But at this moment a big part of him was torn. If Sandy was in Munich, given time he knew he could find her. The day had been stupid, really. He was never going to be able to achieve much in just a few hours. But at least he had started the ball rolling, done what he could. Marcel Cullen was reliable, would do his best for him. If he went back for a week, maybe that would be sufficient. He could have one week there and another in New Orleans with Cleo. That would work, if he could get her to buy it. A big if. Switching his mind to the task immediately in front of him, he hefted his go-bag out of the boot and walked back to number 17. Several reporters shouted at him. An eager-looking girl shoved a foam-padded microphone in his face, and flashbulbs popped. No comment at this stage, he said firmly. Suddenly Spinella was blocking his path. Is this another detective superintendent? he asked quietly. Another what? Spinella dropped his voice even more, giving him a knowing look. You know what I mean. Right? I'll tell you when I've seen myself. Don't worry, Detective Superintendent. If you don't, someone else will. Spinella tapped the side of his nose. Sources. Harboring the pleasant thought of punching the reporter's lights out, almost hearing the crunching sound of Spinella's nasal bones already, Grace pushed past him and signed his name on the clipboard. The constable told him to go up to the top floor. He ducked under the tape then removed a fresh white paper suit from his bag and began struggling clumsily into it. To his embarrassment, he almost fell over in front of the entire Sussex media as he jammed both feet into one leg. Red-faced, he sorted himself out, pulled on disposable overshoes and a pair of latex gloves and went inside. Closing the front door behind him, he stopped in the hallway and sniffed. Just the usual musty smell of old carpet and boiled vegetables that was typical of a thousand tired buildings like this, he'd been into in his career. No stench of a decaying cadaver, which meant the victim hadn't been dead long. It wouldn't take many days of a summer heat wave for the stench of a putrefying corpse to start becoming noticeable. A small relief, he thought, noticing the strip of tape that had been laid all the way up the stairs, marking the entry and exit route, which he was pleased to see. At least the police team that had arrived here knew what they were doing, avoiding contamination at the scene which was what he needed to do himself. It would not be smart for him to go upstairs, because of the risk of giving the defence team a cross-contamination situation they could crawl all over. Instead, he pulled out his mobile phone and called Kim Murphy, telling her he was downstairs. Up on the first floor above him, he suddenly saw a white-suited and hooded Socko officer called Eddie Gribble come into view. He was kneeling on the floor, taking a scraping. He nodded in acknowledgement. A second, identically clad Socko, Tony Monnington, also came into view, dusting the wall for fingerprints. Evening, Roy, he called down cheerily. Grace raised her hand. Having a nice Sunday. Gets me out of the house, and Belinda's able to watch what she wants on the telly. There's always a silver lining, Grace replied grimly. Moments later, two further suited and hooded figures appeared and came down the stairs towards him. One was Kim Murphy, holding a video camera. The other was Detective Chief Inspector Brendan Digan, a tall, large-framed, genial officer with a gentle, ruddy face and prematurely white hair that was cropped into a buzz cut. Digan was the duty SIO called to this scene earlier, Grace had learned on his way here. Digan had subsequently called Kim Murphy over, 
because of similarities with the Katie Bishop murder. After exchanging brief pleasantries, Murphy played Grace the video that had been taken of the scene. He watched it on the small screen on the back of the camera. After you had done this job for a number of years, you started thinking that you were immune to horrors, that you had seen it all, that nothing could surprise or shock you any more. But the footage that confronted him now sent a black chill worming deep through him. Staring at the slightly jerky footage of the white-suited and hooded figures of two more Soko officers on their hands and knees, and another standing, and Nadyushka de Sancha on her knees at the end of the bed, he saw the alabaster-coloured naked body of a young woman with long brown hair lying on the bed with a gas mask over her face. It was as near as possible a carbon copy of the way Katie Bishop had been found. Except that Katie did not appear to have put up a fight. The camera now started to show that this young woman certainly had. There was a smashed plate on the floor with a mark gouged out of the wall above it. A shattered dressing table mirror, bottles of perfume and jars of makeup lying all over the place, along with a smear of blood on the wall just above the white headboard. Then a lingering shot of a framed abstract print of a row of deck chairs lying on the floor, the glass shattered. Brighton had had its share of murders over the years, but one thing, mercifully, it had never been clouded by before was the spectre of a serial killer. It wasn't even an area Grace had needed to know much about, before now. Nearby, a car alarm beep, beep, beeped loudly. He blanked it out as he stared at the freeze frame of the dead young woman. He had regularly attended lectures given by SIOs on serial killer cases at the International Homicide Investigators Association Annual Symposium, which was mostly held in the USA. He was trying to recall the common features. So far, Spinella had kept his word and there had been no mention in the press about the gas mask, so a copycat killing was unlikely. One thing he did remember clearly from a lecture was a discussion of the fear that could be created in the community when it was announced that a serial killer was out there. But equally, the community had a right to know, a need to know. Grace then turned to DCI Digan. What do we have so far? he asked. Nadiushka's best guess is the young woman had been dead for about two days, give or take. Any idea of how she died? Yes. Kim Murphy started the camera running and zoomed in, pointing to the young woman's throat. A dark red ligature mark was visible, then even more clearly for an instant as the burst of flash from a police photographer's camera strobed across it. And Grace's own leaden innards sank before Kim confirmed it. Identical to Katie Bishop, she said. We're looking at a serial killer, whatever that description actually means, Grace queried. And what I've seen so far, Roy, it's too early to be able to say anything, Dagen replied. And I'm not exactly an expert on serial killers. Luckily, I've never experienced one. That makes two of us. Grace was thinking hard. Two attractive women killed, apparently in the same manner, twenty-four hours apart. What do we know about her? We believe her name is Sophie Harrington, Murphy said. She's twenty-seven and employed by a film production company in London. I answered a phone call a little earlier from a young woman called Holly Richardson, who claims to be her best friend. She'd been trying to contact her all yesterday. They were meant to be going to a party together last night. Holly last spoke to her about five on Friday afternoon. Oh, that helps us, Grace said. At least we know she was alive then. Has anyone interviewed Holly Richardson? Nick's gone to find her now. And Miss Harrington clearly put up one hell of a fight, Diagon added. The place looks smashed up, Grace said. Nadiushka's found something under the nail of one of her big toes, a tiny bit of flesh. Grace felt a sudden surge of adrenaline. Human flesh. That's what she thinks. Could it have been gouged out of her assailant in the struggle? Possibly. And suddenly, his memory pinned sharp now, Roy Grace remembered the injury on Brian Bishop's hand, and that he had gone AWOL for several hours on Friday evening. I want a DNA test on that, he said. Fast-tracked. As he spoke, he was already using his mobile phone. Linda Buckley, the family liaison officer, answered on the second ring. Where's Bishop? he asked. Having supper with his in-laws. They're back from Alicante, she replied. He asked for the address, then he called Branson's mobile. Yo, old-timer, what's up? 
What are you doing right now? I'm eating some unpleasantly healthy vegetarian cannelloni from your freezer, listening to your rubbish music and watching your antique television. Man, how come you don't have widescreen like the rest of the planet? Put all your problems behind you. You're going out to work. Grace gave him the address. Chapter 66 The silence was fleetingly broken by the tinkle of the teaspoon as Moira Denton stirred the tea in her delicate bone china teacup. Brian Bishop had never found his indoors easy to get along with. Part of the reason he knew was that the couple didn't really get along with each other. He remembered a quote he had once come across, which talked about people leading lives of quiet desperation. Nothing, it seemed to him, sadly, could be a truer description of the relationship between Frank and Moira Denton. Frank was a serial entrepreneur and a serial failure. Brian had made a small investment in his last venture, a factory in Poland converting wheat into biodiesel fuel, more as a token of family solidarity than from any real expectation of returns, which was just as well as it had gone bust like everything else Frank had touched before it. A tall man just shy of seventy, who had only just recently started looking his age, Frank Denton was also a serial shagger. He wore his hair stylishly long, although it was now tinged a rather dirty-looking orange, from the use of some dyeing product, and his left eye had a lazy lid, making it look permanently half-closed. In the past, it reminded Brian of an amiable, raffish pirate, although at this moment, sitting silent, hunched forward in his armchair in the tiny, boiling-hot flat, unshaven, his hair unbrushed, dressed in a creased white shirt, he just looked like a sad, shabby, broken old man. His brandy snifter stood untouched with a stubby bottle of Torres' ten grand reserver beside it. Moira sat opposite him on the other side of a carved wood coffee table, on the top of which was yesterday's Argus with its grim headline. In contrast to her husband, she had made an effort with her appearance. In her mid-sixties, she was a handsome-looking woman, and would have looked even better if she had not allowed bitterness to so line her face. Her dyed black hair, coiled abundantly above her head, was neatly quaffed. She was wearing a plain, loose grey top a pleated navy blue skirt and flat black shoes, and she had put makeup on. On the television, with the sound turned down low, a moose was running across open grassland. Because the Dentons now lived most of their time in their flat in Spain, they found England, even at the height of summer, unbearably cold. So they kept the central heating in their flat, close to Hove Seafront, several degrees north of 80, and the windows shut. Sealed in a green velour armchair, Brian was perspiring. He sipped his third San Miguel beer, his stomach rumbling, even though Moira had just served them a meal. He barely touched his cold chicken and salad, nor the tinned peach slices afterwards. He just had no appetite at all, and was not up to much conversation either. The three of them had been sitting in silence for much of the time since he'd come round a couple of hours earlier. They discussed whether Katie should be buried or cremated. It was not a conversation Brian had ever had with his wife, but Moira was adamant that Katie would have wanted to be cremated. Then they discussed the funeral arrangements, all on hold until the coroner released the body, which both Frank and Moira had viewed yesterday at the mortuary. The talk had reduced both of them to tears. Understandably, his in-laws were taking Katie's death hard. She had been more than just their only child. She had been the only thing of real value in their lives and the glue that had kept them together. One particularly uncomfortable Christmas, when Moira had drunk too much sherry, champagne, and then Bailey's, she confined sourly to Brian that she'd only taken Frank back after his affairs for Katie's sake. Like that beer, do you, Brian? Frank asked. His voice was posh English, something he'd cultivated to mask his working-class roots. Moira had an affected voice also, except when she drank too much and then lapsed back into her native Lancastrian. Yes, good flavour, thank you. That's Spain for you, you see. Quality. Suddenly, becoming animated for a moment, Frank Denton raised a hand. A very underrated country. Their food, wines, beers, and the prices, of course. Some of it is developed out, but there are still great opportunities if you know what you're doing. Despite the man's grief, 
Brian could sense that Casey's father was about to launch into a sales pitch. He was right. Property prices are doubling every five years there, Brian. A smart thing is to pick the next hot spots. Building costs are cheap, and they're jolly efficient workers, those Spaniards. I've identified an absolutely fantastic opportunity just the other side of Alicante. I tell you, Brian, it's a real no-brainer. The last thing Brian wanted or needed at this moment was to hear the details of yet another of Frank's plausible-sounding but ultimately fatally flawed schemes. The miserable silence had been preferable. At least that had left him to his thoughts. He took another sip of his beer and realised he had almost drained the glass. He needed to be careful, he knew, as he was driving, and he didn't know how the family liaison officer, waiting in her car downstairs like a sentinel, would react to the smell of alcohol on his breath. "'What have you done to your hand?' Moira asked suddenly, looking at the fresh plaster on it. "'I, I just bashed it getting out of a car,' he said dismissively. The doorbell rang. The Dentons exchanged glances. Then Frank hauled himself up and shuffled out into the hallway. "'We're not expecting anyone,' Moira said to Brian. Moments later, Frank came back into the room. "'The police,' he said, giving his son-in-law a strange look. "'They're on their way up.' He continued staring at Brian, as if some dark thought had entered his head during those moments he'd been out of the room. Brian wondered if there was something else the police had said that the old man was not relaying. Chapter 67 In the witness interview suite, Glenn Branson switched on the audio and video recorders, announcing clearly as he sat down, It is 2112, Sunday 6th of August. Detective Superintendent Grace and Detective Sergeant Branson interviewing Mr. Brian Bishop. The CID headquarters were becoming depressingly familiar to Bishop. The walk up the entrance stairs, past the displays of police truncheons on blue felt boards, then through the open plan offices and the cream-walled corridors lined with diagrams, and into this tiny room with its three red chairs. This is starting to feel like Groundhog Day, he said. Great movie, Branson commented. Best thing Bill Murray did. I preferred it to Lost in Translation. Bishop had seen Lost in Translation, and was starting to empathise with the character Murray played in that movie, wandering sleep-deprived through an unfamiliar world. But he wasn't in any mood to start discussing films. Are you people finished in my house yet? When can I move back in? I'm afraid it will take a few days yet, Grace said. Thank you for coming up here tonight. I apologise for disrupting your Sunday evening. That's almost funny, Bishop said acidly. He nearly added, but didn't, that it hadn't been any great hardship to escape from the grim misery of his in-laws and Frank's sales pitch for his new business venture. What news do you have for me? I'm afraid we have nothing further to report at this stage, but we are expecting results from DNA analysis back during tomorrow, and that may give us something. But we have some questions that our investigations have thrown up, if that's all right with you. Go ahead. Grace noted Bishop's apparent tetchiness. It was a considerable change from his sad, lost-looking state at their last interview. But he was experienced enough not to read anything into it. Anger was one of the natural stages of grief, and a bereaved person was capable of lashing out at anyone. Could you start, Mr. Bishop, by explaining the nature of your business? My company provides logistical systems. We design the software, install it and run it. Our core business is rostering. Rostering? Grace saw that Branson was frowning also. I'll give you an example. An aeroplane that should be taking off from Gatwick, for instance, gets delayed for some reason, mechanical, bad weather, whatever, and cannot take off until the following day. Uh, suddenly the airline is faced with finding overnight accommodation for 350 passengers. It also has a knock-on series of problems. Uh, other planes in the wrong places, the crew schedules all mucked up, with some crew going over their permitted working hours, meals, compensations, passengers having to be put on different flights to make connections, all that kind of stuff. So you're a computer man? I'm a businessman. But yes, I have a pretty good grasp of computing. I have a degree in cognitive sciences from Sussex University. It's successful, I presume? 
We made the Sunday Times list of the hundred fastest growing companies in Britain last year, Bishop said. There was a trace of pride beneath his gloom. I hope all this won't have a negative impact on you. It really doesn't matter anymore, does it? he said bleakly. Everything I did was for Katie. I... His voice faltered. He pulled out a handkerchief and buried his face in it. Then suddenly, in a burst of rage, he shouted out, Please catch the bastard! This creep! This absolutely fucking... He broke down in tears. Grace waited some moments, then asked, Would you like a drink of anything? Bishop shook his head, sobbing. Grace continued to wait until he'd calmed down. I'm sorry, Bishop said, wiping his eyes. You don't need to apologize, sir. Grace gave him a little more time, then asked, How would you describe your relationship with your wife? We loved each other. It was good. I think we compliment... He stopped, then said heavily, Complimented each other. Had you had any arguments recently? No, I can honestly say we hadn't. Was there anything bothering your wife, uh, troubling her? Apart from maxing out her credit card? Both Grace and Branson gave thin smiles, uncertain whether this was a lame stab at humour. Could you tell us what you did today, sir? Grace said, changing tack. He lowered the handkerchief. What I did today? Yes. I spent the morning trying to deal with my emails, phoned my secretary, going through a list of meetings that I needed her to cancel. I was meant to be flying to the States on Wednesday to see a possible new client in Houston, and I got her to cancel that. Then I had lunch with a friend of mine and his wife. I went round to their house. They could vouch for that. Jesus, yes. You've had a dressing put on your hand. My friend's wife is a nurse. She thought it ought to be covered. Bishop shook his head. What is this? Are we back to the Spanish Inquisition again? Branson raised both hands. We're just concerned for your welfare, sir. People in state of bereavement can overlook things, that's all. Grace would have laughed to have told Bishop at this point that the taxi driver, in whose taxi he claimed to have injured his hand, remembered Bishop clearly, but had absolutely no recollection of his hurting himself. But he wanted to keep his powder dry on this one for later. Only a couple more questions, Mr. Bishop, then we can call it a day. He smiled, but received a blank stare back. Does the name Sophie Harrington mean anything to you? Sophie Harrington? A young lady who lives in Brighton and works in London for a film production company. Sophie Harrington? No, he said decisively. No, it doesn't. You've never heard of this young lady, Grace persisted. Both Grace and Branson clocked his hesitation. I haven't, no. The man was lying, Grace knew. The swing of his eyes towards constructs had been unmistakable. Twice. Should I know her? He asked clumsily, fishing. No, Grace responded. Just a question on the off chance. The last thing I'd like you to talk about tonight is a life insurance policy you took out for Mrs. Bishop. Bishop shook his head looking genuinely astonished, or making a good act of it. Six months ago, sir, Grace said. You took out a life insurance policy with HSBC Bank in your wife's name for the amount of three million pounds. Bishop grinned inanely, shaking his head vigorously. <laughs> no way! I'm sorry, I don't believe in life insurance. I've never taken out a policy in my life. Grace studied him for some moments. Can I get this straight, sir? You are telling me that you didn't take out any life insurance policy on Mrs. Bishop? Absolutely not. There's one in place. I suggest you take a look at your bank statements. You're paying for it in monthly instalments. Bishop shook his head, looking stunned. And this time, from the movement of his eyes, Grace saw that he was not lying. I don't think I should say any more, Bishop said. Not without my solicitor present. That's probably a good idea, sir. Chapter 68 A few minutes later, Roy Grace stood with Glen Branson outside the front of Sussex House, watching the taillights of Bishop's dark red Bentley disappear around the right-hand bend below them, past the massive warehouse of British bookstores. So what do you think, old-timer? 
Branson asked him. I think I need a drink. They drove down to the Black Lion pub at Patcham, went in and stood at the bar. Grace bought Glenn a pint of Guinness and ordered a large Glenfiddich on the rocks for himself. Then they installed themselves in a booth. I can't figure this guy out, Grace said. He's smart. There's something very cold about him. And I have a feeling that he does know Sophie Harrington. His eyes. He saw that, Grace said, pleased at the way his protégé learned from him. He knows her. Grace drank a little whiskey and suddenly craved a cigarette. Hell, one more year and smoking in pubs was going to be banned. Might as well take advantage. He went over to the machine and bought himself some silk cut. Ripping off the cellophane, he took out a cigarette and then went to get a light from the young female bartender. He inhaled deeply, loving every sweet second of the sensation as he drew the smoke in. You should quit. Those things don't do you any good. Living doesn't do any good, he replied. It kills us all. Branson's face descended into gloom. Tell me about it. That bullet, yeah? One inch to the right and it would have taken out my spine. I'd have been in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. He shook his head, then drank a long gulp of his beer. I'll go through all that goddamn recovery. Go home. Instead of finding a loving, nurturing wife, what do I get? Fucking shit. He leaned forward, cradling his face in his hands. I thought you just had to get a horse, Grace probed gently. His friend did not respond. I don't know how much a horse costs to buy or keep, but you'll get compensation for your injury. Quite a lot of money. More than enough, I would have thought, to buy a horse. The young barmaid who had given him the light was suddenly standing over them. Can't get you anything else. We're going to be closing up soon. Grace smiled at her. We're done, thanks. He put an arm around Branson, feeling the soft suede of his bomber jacket. You know the irony, the detective sergeant said. I told you, didn't I? I joined the force so my kids could be proud of me. Now I'm not even allowed to kiss them goodnight. Grace drank some whiskey and took another drag of his cigarette. It still tasted good, but not as good as before. Matey, you know the law. She can't stop you. He stared at the long wooden counter of the bar, at the upturned bottles and the optics beyond, at the empty bar stools and the empty tables around them. It had been a long day. Hard to believe he'd had lunch beside a lake in Munich. You, Glen Branson said suddenly. I didn't even ask you how it went. What happened? Nothing, he replied. Nothing. Don't do what I did, Roy. Don't screw it all up. You've got a good thing going with Cleo. Cherish her. She's well lovely. Cleo was smashed when he got to the wrought iron gates of her townhouse, shortly after half past eleven. Need your help, she said through the intercom. God, I'm pissed. The electronic lock opened with a sharp click, like a pistol being cocked. Grace went in walking across stone slabs that were lit by a faint neon glow towards Cleo's house. As he neared the front door, it opened. Cleo was standing there, beside what looked like the upturned shell of a giant mutant blue crab. She turned her cheek towards him as he attempted to kiss her on the lips, signalling through her inebriated state that she was still angry with him. The hard top for my MG, some bastard slashed my roof open today. Can you help me put the hard top on? He could not remember ever lifting anything so heavy in his life. You okay? he asked, grunting repeatedly as they staggered out into the street with it. He was disappointed by her frostiness. Much lighter than body, she replied breezily, then nearly fell over sideways. They walked down the dark, silent street, past his Alfa Romeo, until they reached her MG. Then they put it down. Grace looked at the clean slit in her roof. Bastards, he said. Where was it done? At the mortuary this afternoon. No point getting it repaired. Will just happen again. With an unsteady hand, she fumbled with the key fob, then unlocked the car, climbed inside and lowered the soft roof. Struggling, sweating, cursing, they proceeded to manoeuvre the hard top into place. All their concentration was taken up by the task in hand. Neither Roy Grace nor Cleo Mori noticed the figure standing in the shadow of an alley a short distance away, watching them with a smile of satisfaction. 
Chapter 69 Roy Grace began his Monday morning with a 7.30 meeting in his office with D.I. Kim Murphy, D.C. Brendan Digan, crime scene manager Joe Tindall and Glenn Branson. He was heaping as much responsibility on his friend as possible to take his mind off his domestic problems. Eleanor, his management support assistant, was also there. Diagon agreed to schedule his morning and evening briefing meetings half an hour apart from Murphy's, so that Grace could preside over both, but for this morning they would combine them, to give both teams a complete overview of events to date. Shortly before eight, Grace went to get his second coffee of the morning. Returning to his office, he downloaded from his mobile phone the three photographs he'd taken yesterday of the blonde German woman in the English Garden, then typed an email to Dick Pope, who would be back at work today. Dick, is this the woman you and Leslie saw in the English Garden last week, Roy? Then he checked the photographs, a full-on shot of her face and one of each profile, all in reasonable close-up. He sent them. Next he fired off a quick email with the same photographs to Marcel Cullen. He'd already shown them to him on the tiny screen of his mobile, but they would be clearer on his computer screen. Then he opened the incident serials and ran his eye down the overnight incidents log. Sunday nights tended to be quiet, apart from the roads in summer, with day-trippers tired and some boozed up, heading home. There were a number of minor RTAs, some street crimes, car crimes, a domestic in Patcham, a hit-and-run involving an elderly pedestrian, a break-in at an angling club, and a fight in a restaurant among the dozens of incidents he scanned. Nothing immediately apparent that was relevant to Katie Bishop's death or Sophie Harrington's. He sent another couple of emails, then collected the agenda for the 8.30 briefing from Eleanor and headed along the corridors to the conference room where the combined team numbered over 40. He began by welcoming everybody and explaining, particularly for the benefit of the new team, the structure of the investigation. He told them he would be the officer in overall command of both investigations, with D.I. Kim Murphy, the SIO for the investigation into the murder of Katie Bishop, and D.C.I. Digan, the SIO for the investigation into the murder of Sophie Harrington. Next he informed them that he would be showing the video taken at the Sophie Harrington murder scene and then run through both investigations to bring everybody up to date. When the video finished, there was a brief silence, broken by Norman Potting, sitting with his elbows on the table, hunched up in his crumpled, food-stained, cream-linen suit. Seems like we're hunting a killer with smelly feet, if you ask me, he growled, then looked around with a broad smirk on his face. The only person to smile back was Alfonso Zaffaroni, but there was no humour in the young detective's expression. It was more a smile of pity. Thank you, Norman, Grace said coldly, annoyed with Potting for being so crass and insensitive. He did not want to digress from the typed agenda in front of him, which he had carefully prepared with Kim Murphy and his MSA earlier that morning. But he decided to seize the moment to put Norman back in his box. Perhaps you'd like to start this morning off with us with your evidence to back up this assertion. Potting straightened the clumsy knot of his Sussex County Cricket Club tie, which was frayed as his hair, looking rather pleased with himself. Well, I think I've got a bit of a result in another direction, he continued working on his knot. We're all ears, Grace said. Katie Bishop was having an affair, the veteran DS announced triumphantly. And now forty pairs of eyes were on him in sharp focus. As some of you may recall, Potting continued, glancing down at his notepad for reference, I had ascertained that a BMW convertible registered to Mrs. Bishop was recorded by CCTV camera. It was at a BP petrol station on the A27, two miles east of Lewis, just before midnight last Thursday, the night she was killed. He reminded them all needlessly and I subsequently identified Mrs. Bishop on the video footage at the petrol station. Then, in an examination of said vehicle at the Bishop residence on Friday afternoon, I found a pay-and-display parking ticket with the time of... He checked his notes again. 5.11 on Thursday afternoon, issued from a machine in Southover Road, Lewis. He paused and fiddled with his knot again. Grace glanced at the window. Outside the sky was blue and clear. Summer was back again. As if yesterday afternoon had been a small glitch in the weather, a wrong lever pulled by someone. 
I called in a favour owed to me by John Smith in the telecoms unit here at the CIDHQ, Botting continued. Got him to come in yesterday to examine the mobile phone belonging to Mrs. Bishop. As a result of a Lewis number found stored in the mobile phone's speed dial memory, I was able to identify a Mr. Barty Chancellor, a portrait painter of some international standing, I understand, at an address in Southover Street, Lewis. Potting now looked even more pleased with himself. I went to question Mr. Chancellor at four yesterday afternoon at his premises, where he admitted that he and Mrs. Bishop had been seeing each other for about a year. He was in a state of considerable distress, having read the news of Mrs. Bishop's death, and seemed quite pleased, if that's the right way to say it, to have someone to pour his heart out to. What did you learn from him? Grace asked. Seems like the bishops weren't quite the happy golden couple that the little local world thought they were. According to Chancellor, Bishop was obsessed with work and was never around. He didn't seem to understand that his wife was lonely. Excuse me, Bella Moy interrupted angrily. Norman, that's just so typical of a man trying to justify an affair. Oh, her husband doesn't bloody understand her. That's why she fell into my arms. That's the truth, Gov. The young DS looked around at the team, her face flushed. Honestly, how many times has everyone heard that? It's not always the husband who's at fault. There are plenty of women who are real slappers out there. Tell me about it, Potting said. I married three of them. Did Bishop know? Glen Branson interrupted. Chancellor doesn't think so, the DS replied. Grace wrote the name down on his pad thoughtfully. So now we have another potential suspect. He's quite a good painter, mind you, he should be, Botting said. Charges between five to twenty grand for a painting. Could buy a bloody car for that, or a house, where my new missus comes from. Is that significant, Norman? Grace queried. These arty types, some of them can be a bit kinky, that's what I'm thinking. Read about Picasso still shagging women in his nineties. Oh, he's a painter, so he must be a pervert. Is that what you're saying? Bella Moy was in a seriously bad mood with potting today. So, he must have stuck a gas mask on Katie Bishop's head and strangled her, right? So why don't we stop wasting time? Let's go along to the Crown Prosecution Service with our evidence, get an arrest warrant for Chancellor and have done with it. Bella, Grace said firmly. Thank you, that's enough. She glared at potting, her face flushed. Grace wondered for a moment whether her hostility towards the detective sergeant had something deep-rooted behind it. Had they ever been an item? He doubted it, looking at them now, contrasting the plug-ugly old warhorse with the fresh-faced, attractive, thirty-five-year-old brunette divorcee. No way. So did you discover anything in his premises to indicate he might be kinky? Tim Murphy asked. Any gas masks hanging on the wall or in any of his paintings? He had a few raunchy news on the walls, I'm telling you. Not the kind of paintings you want your elderly mum to see. And there's something very interesting I got out of him. He was with Mrs. Bishop on Thursday night until nearly midnight. We need to bring him in for questioning, ASAP, Grace said. He's coming in at ten. Good. Who will be with you? D.C. Nickel. Grace looked at Nick Nickel. The young, fledgling father was stifling a yawn, barely keeping his eyes open. Clearly, he'd had another bad night with his baby. He didn't want a sleep-deprived zombie interviewing such an important witness. He looked at Zaffaroni. Much though he disliked the cocky youngster, Zaffaroni would be perfect, he thought. His arrogance would rub anyone up the wrong way, and particularly a sensitive artist. And often the best way to get something out of a witness was to wind them up, so they lost their rag. No, Grace said. D.C. Zaffaroni will interview him with you. He looked down at his typed agenda, then up at a shaven-headed 37-year-old Joe Tindall with his narrow strip of beard and blue-tinted glasses. OK, he said formally. We will now have a report from the crime scene manager. First off, Joe Tindall informed them, I'm expecting DNA results back this afternoon from Huntingdon, from semen found in the vagina of Mrs. Bishop. He looked down at his notes. We're sending several exhibits from Mrs. Harrington's flat off to the lab this morning. 
These include a small piece of flesh removed from her right big toenail and a gas mask found on the victim's face, which appears similar in type and manufactured to the one present at Mrs. Bishop's house. He took a swig of bottled water. We're also sending clothing fibres recovered from Mrs. Harrington's flat and blood samples. We believe the blood samples may be significant. We found blood smeared on the wall just above the bed where the victim was found, which is not consistent with the injuries found on the victim. So maybe the perp's blood. He looked down at his notes. All fingerprints found at both scenes to date have been eliminated from our inquiries, which would indicate that the killer of both women was either wearing gloves, the most likely scenario, or wiped them. However, using chemical enhancement, we've found footprints on the tiled bathroom floor that are clearly not the victim's. We will be analysing these for shoe type. Next, tough, sharp-eyed DC Pamela Buckley reported on a check she'd run on all accident and emergency departments in hospitals in the area, for Sussex County, Eastbourne, Worthing and Haywards Heath, for people coming in with hand injuries. We're up against patient confidentiality, she said, with more than a hint of sarcasm in her voice. Then she read out the list of hand injury types that have been seen at each hospital, with no names attached, and treated. None were consistent with those Grace had seen on Brian Bishop's hand, and none of the staff she had interviewed identified Bishop from his photograph. Then DS Guy Batchelor gave his report. A tall, burly officer spoke in his usual business-like way. Well, he said, I think I have something rather interesting. He gave Norman Potting an appreciative nod. Norman did a good job getting his mate John Smith in the telecoms unit to give up his Sunday. John stayed on to look at the mobile phone taken from Sophie Harrington's flat. He paused to take a sip of coffee from a large Starbucks styrofoam cup, then looked up with a smile. The last number that Mrs. Harrington dialed, according to information retrieved from her phone, was, he paused to read from his notes, 07985541298. So I checked that number out. He looked Grace squarely and triumphantly in the eye. It's Brian Bishop's mobile phone. Chapter 70 They say the recipe for success in life is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. The bit they don't tell you when you start a new business is the cash you need to find. You need the lawyer and the accountants to set up the company, the patent agent to file for your copyright on your software, the design company to create your logo and your corporate image, and the packaging for your product, which you need to have if you intend to be a global player, and of course your website. You need an office, furniture, phones, fax, and a secretary. None of this stuff comes cheap. Twelve months on from my big idea, I was over £100,000 out of pocket and not yet ready to rock and roll, but close. I had taken out a second mortgage on my flat, sold everything I could sell, and on top of that, a bank manager who believed in me had given me a bigger loan than he really should have. I had, as the Americans say, bet the ranch. I was reading all the financial pages of the newspapers and subscribed to the trade magazines of every business I intended to target. So I imagine my dismay one day when I opened a supplement of the Financial Times to see an article written by a journalist called Gautam Malkani on my business. It was a complete carbon copy of everything I thought of doing, and it was already up and running. And my photograph was staring out at me from the pink page, except the name of the company was different from the name I had chosen. And the name beneath my photograph was the name of someone else, a man I had never heard of. Chapter 71 Maria Jarpik pressed the entry code and let herself in through the wrought iron gates. It was just gone 9 a.m., and she was a little later than usual, thanks to her daughter. She noticed the man immediately, standing outside the front door of number five, looking as if he'd been waiting for a while. She strode across the cobbled courtyard, puffing from the exertion of her long walk here, made harder by the weight of the bag which she lugged everywhere, containing her work clothes, shoes, lunch and a drink and she was perspiring heavily from the heat. She was also in a foul mood after yet another row with Danica. Who was this man? What did he want from her? Was he from another out-of-the-collection agency she owed money to on a credit card? 
The 35-year-old Serbian woman walked everywhere to save money on bus fares. She could reach all of her employees on foot in less than an hour from the council flat in Whitehawk she shared with her bolshy 14-year-old prima donna. Almost every hard, sweated penny that she earned went on buying Danica the best she could afford in their new life here in England. She tried to buy decent food, made sure Danica had the clothes she wanted, well, some of them at any rate, as well as all the stuff she needed to keep up with her friends, a computer, a mobile phone, and for her birthday two weeks ago, an iPod. And her reward was for the girl to arrive home at ten past four this morning, makeup all smeared, pupils dilated. And now this smarmy-looking man was standing by the doorstep, doubtless waiting to snatch the cash that would have been left for her on the kitchen table out of her hand. She looked at him warily as she rummaged in her bag for the keys to Cleo Mori's house. He was tall, with slicked back brown hair, handsome in a way that reminded her of a movie actor whose name she couldn't place, and dressed respectably enough in a white shirt and plain tie, blue trousers, black shoes and a dark blue cotton jacket that looked as if it was a uniform of some sort, with a badge sewn on the breast pocket. Maria glanced warily around for signs of life elsewhere in the courtyard, and to her relief saw a young woman in lycra shorts and top pulling a mountain bike out of a front door a couple of houses down. Emboldened, she put the key in the lock and turned it. The man stepped forward, holding out an identity card bearing his photograph. It was laminated and hung from his neck on two thin white cords. Excuse me, he said very politely. Gasport, would it be convenient to read the meter? Then she noticed the small metal machine with a keypad on it which he was holding. You made the point once with Miss Mori, she said sharply and a tad aggressively. No, I'm doing this area today. It won't take me more than a couple of minutes if you could show me where the meters are. She hesitated. He looked normal enough to her and he had the identification. Several times in her work in different houses, people had turned up to read meters. It was normal, so long as they had the identification. But she was on strict instructions to let no one into the house. Maybe she should phone Miss Maury and ask. But to bother her at her important work because a man had come to read the meter. I see identification again, please. He showed her the card again. Her English wasn't that good, but she could see his face and the word seaboard. It looked important. Official. OK, she said. Even so, she was wary of him, stepping in ahead of him, leaving the front door open. Then she marched straight through the open downstairs living area, up a couple of steps into the kitchen, not letting him out of her sight for a moment. Her money was sitting on the square pine table, weighted down by a ceramic bowl of fruit. Next to it was a handwritten note from Cleo, with her instructions on what housework to do this morning. Maria beadily picked up the two twenty-pound notes and pushed them into her purse. Then she pointed up at a wall panel to the left of the huge silver fridge. I think meet us there, she said, noticing for the first time the bandage on his hand. Sharp edges, the man said, seeing her eyes widen a fraction. You wouldn't believe the places some people have their meters. Makes my life quite hazardous, he smiled. Do you have something I can stand on to reach? She pulled a wooden kitchen chair over for him, and he thanked her, kneeling down to remove his shoes, his eyes not on the meter at all, but on the cleaning lady's set of keys lying on the table. He was thinking hard about how to distract her and get her out the room, when her mobile phone suddenly rang. He watched as the woman pulled a little green Nokia out of her bag, glanced at the display, then, visibly shaking, said, Yes, Danica? followed by furious gabbling in a language she did not recognise. After some moments, the row this woman was having with this person, Danica, seemed to intensify. She paced up and down the kitchen, talking increasingly loudly, then stomped out and stood at the top of the stairs to the living area, where the conversation turned into what sounded like a full-scale yelling match. She had her eyes off him for less than sixty seconds, but that was more than enough for his hand to shoot out, grab the key, press it into the soft wax in the tin concealed in the palm of his hand, and return it to the table. Chapter 72 Malling House, the headquarters of Sussex Police, was a fifteen-minute drive from Grace's office. 
was a ragbag complex of buildings situated on the outskirts of Lewis, the county town of East Sussex, from where the administration and key management for the 5,000 officers and employees of the force were handled. Two buildings dominated. One, a three-story futuristic glass and brick structure, contained the control center, the crime recording and investigation bureau, the call handling center and the force command center, as well as most of the computing hardware for the force. The other was an imposing red-brick Queen Anne mansion, once a stately home and now a Grade 1 listed building, kept in fine condition, which had given its name to the HQ. Although next to the ramshackle sprawl of car parks, single-storey prefabs, modern low-rise structures and one dark, windowless building, complete with a tall smokestack that always reminded Grace of a Yorkshire textile mill, it stood proudly aloof. Inside were housed the offices of the Chief Constable, the Deputy Chief Constable and the Assistant Chief Constables, of which Alice and Vosper was one, together with their support staff, as well as a number of other senior officers working either temporarily or permanently out of here. Vosper's office was on the ground floor at the front of the building. It had a view through a large sash window out onto a gravel driveway and a circular lawn beyond. As he strode towards her desk, Grace caught a glimpse of a thrush standing on the grass, washing itself under the throw of a sprinkler. All the reception rooms contained handsome woodwork, fine stucco and imposing ceilings, which had been carefully restored after a fire nearly destroyed the building some years back. The house had originally been built both to provide gracious living and to impress upon visitors the wealth of its owner. It must be nice to work in a room like this, he thought in this calm oasis, away from the cramped, grotty spaces of Sussex House. Sometimes he thought he might enjoy the responsibility and the power trip that came with it, but then he would wonder whether he could cope with the politics, especially that damn insidious political correctness that the brass had to kowtow to a lot more than the ranks. However, at this moment it wasn't so much promotion that was on his mind as avoiding demotion. Some years ago, because of her mood swings, a wit had nicknamed Alison Vosper Number 27 after a sweet and sour dish on the local Chinese takeaway menu, and it had stuck. The ACC could be your new best friend one day and your worst enemy the next. It seemed a long time since she had been anything but the latter to Grace, as he stood in front of her desk, used to the fact that she rarely invited visitors to sit down in order to keep meetings short and to the point. So it surprised him in a way that created a rather ominous sensation in the pit of his stomach, that without looking up from a document bound with green string, she waved him to one of the two upright armchairs by the large expanse of her glossy rosewood desk. In her early forties, with blonde hair cut in a short, severe style that framed a hard but not unattractive face, she was power-dressed in a crisp white blouse buttoned up at the neck, despite the heat, and a tailored navy blue two-piece, with a small diamante brooch pinned to one lapel. As always, the morning's national newspapers were fanned out on her desk. Grace could smell her usual slightly acidic perfume. It was tinged with the much sweeter smell of freshly mown grass wafting in on a welcome breeze through the open window. He couldn't help it. Every time he came into this office, his confidence ebbed away, as he used to when, as a child, he was summoned to the headmaster's study and the fact that she continued to ignore him, still reading, made him more nervous with each passing second. He listened to the swish, swish, swish of the sprinkler outside, then two rings of a mobile phone, faint in another room. Munich was going to be the first point of Alice and Vosper's attack, and he had his, admittedly somewhat lame, defence ready. But when she finally looked up at him, while not exactly beaming with joy, she gave him a pleasant smile. Apologies, Roy, she said. Been reading this bloody EU directive on standardisation of the treatment of asylum seekers who commit crimes. Didn't want to lose my thread. What bloody rubbish this is, she went on. I can't believe how much taxpayers' money, yours and mine, is wasted on stuff like this. Absolutely, Grace said, agreeing perhaps a little too earnestly, waiting warily for her expression to change and whatever nuke she had ready to land on him. She raised a fist in the air. You wouldn't believe how much of my time I have to waste reading things like this when I should be getting on with my job of helping to police Sussex. I'm starting to really hate the EU. 
Here's an interesting statistic. You know the Gettysburg Address? Yes. What's more, I can probably quote it completely. I learned it at school for a project. She barely took that in. Instead, she splayed her hands out on her desk as if to anchor herself. When Abraham Lincoln gave that speech, it led to the most sacrosanct principles in the world, freedom and democracy becoming enshrined in the American Constitution. She paused and drank some water. That speech was less than three hundred words long. Do you know how long the European Directive on the Size of Cabbages is? I don't. Sixty-five thousand words long. Grace grinned, shaking his head. She smiled back, more warmly than he could remember her ever smiling before. He wondered if she was on some kind of happy pill. Then, abruptly changing the subject, but still good-humoured, she asked, So, how was Munich? Wary suddenly, his guard up again, Roy said, Well, actually, it was a bit of a Norwegian lobster. She frowned. I beg your pardon? Did you say Norwegian lobster? It's an expression I use for when something is less than you've been expecting. She cocked her head, still frowning. I'm lost. A couple of years ago I was in a restaurant in a pub at Lansing. There was something on the menu described as Norwegian lobster. I ordered it, looking forward to a nice bit of lobster. But what I in fact got were three small prawns, about the size of my little finger. You complained? Yes. And then I was confronted by Sussex's own Basil Fawlty, who produced an ancient cookbook which said these particular prawns were sometimes called Norwegian lobsters. Sounds like a good restaurant to avoid, unless you feel a particular need of going out for a disappointment. Quite. She smiled again, a little less warmly, as if realising that she and this particular man would always be on different planets. So, I take it you didn't find your wife in Munich? Wondering how she knew that this had been his mission, he shook his head. How long has it been now? Just over nine years. She seemed to be about to say something further, but instead she refilled her glass. Do you want any water, tea, coffee? I'm okay, thanks. How was your weekend? he said, anxious to move the subject on from Sandy, and still wondering why he'd been summoned there. I was at an ACC's conference in Basingstoke on the subject of improving police performance, or rather public perceptions of police performance. Another of Tony Blair's cosmetic tinkerings, a bunch of slick marketing gurus telling us how to leverage our results and how to strategize and drive that process. She shrugged. What's the secret? Grace asked. To go after the low-hanging fruit first. Her mobile phone rang. She glanced at the display and abruptly terminated the call. Anyhow, for the moment, murders are still a priority. What progress? And by the way, I'm going to come to this morning's press conference. You are? Grace was pleasantly surprised, and relieved that he wasn't going to be carrying it all on his shoulders. He had a feeling that with the news of the second murder, the conference, which was scheduled for eleven, was going to be a tough one. Can you bring me up to speed on where we're at? she asked. Any bones we can throw to them? Do we have any suspects? And what about the body found yesterday? Do you have enough staff on your team, Roy? Are there any extra resources you need? The relief he felt now that she appeared to be letting Munich drop was almost palpable. In brief summary, he brought the assistant chief constable up to speed. After telling her that Brian Bishop's Bentley had been picked up by a camera heading to Brighton at 11.47 on Thursday night, and then giving her details about the life insurance policy, she raised a hand, stopping him. You've got enough right there, Roy. Two people have provided him with pretty strong alibis. His financial adviser, with whom he had dinner, was interviewed and can distinctly remember the time frame, which is not helpful to us. If he is telling the truth, Bishop could not have reached that camera at 11.47. And the second person is the concierge at his London flat, a Mr Oliver Dowler, who has been interviewed and confirms that he was up early that morning and helped Bishop load his golfing equipment into his car at around half past six. Vosper was silent for some moments, thinking, absorbing this. Then she said, That's the elephant in the room. Grace smiled grimly. Suddenly her phone rang. Raising an apologetic finger, she answered it. Moments later, his mobile phone rang. The words private number on the display 
indicated it was probably work. He stood up and stepped away from the desk to answer it. Roy Grace? It was D.S. Guy Batchelor. I think we have something significant, Roy. I've just had a call from a Sandra Taylor, an analyst at the Force Intelligence Unit who's been allocated to this case. Did you know that Brian Bishop has a criminal record? Chapter 73 Paul Packer sat at a table outside the Ha Ha Bar in Pavilion Parade, in front of the entrance gates to Brighton's Royal Pavilion, sipping a latte and watching the world go by. He had a smile on his face. At 10.30 on a hot, sunny August Monday morning, there were a lot worse places to be in the world than here, he reckoned, and this sure as hell beat working, which was a private joke to himself because, of course, he was working. Not that it looked that way to the waitress or to the people passing by. All they saw was a figure in his twenties, short and burly, with a shaven head and a goatee beard, scruffily dressed in a shapeless grey T-shirt with an exercise book open in front of him, in which he appeared to be jotting down notes, just one of the scores of students hanging out in cafes all over the city. He missed nothing. He clocked every face that passed by in either direction. People in business clothes, some carrying bags or briefcases, rushing around to meetings or in some instances just very late for work. He observed the tourists. One elderly couple were walking around in circles, both trying to read a map, the man pointing in one direction, the woman shaking her head and pointing in the other. He saw a middle-aged couple, Dutch, he guessed, striding determinedly in ridiculous clothes and heavy backpacks, as if they were on some kind of safari and needed to carry their own supplies. Then he watched two kids in baggy clothes practising a parkour jump over a freestanding information sign. Several homeless down and outs, all of whom he knew by sight, had passed by in the last half hour. Probably going to spend the day on the pavilion lawns before moving to their next doorstep or archway, lugging their worldly goods in shopping bags or plastic sheeting or in supermarket trolleys, leaving behind the sour reek of damp sacks in their wake. And steadily, Brighton's lowlife, the dealers, the pushers, the runners and the users, were all starting to surface. The junkies, their last fixes all but worn off, were starting out on their relentless daily grind to find the money, by whatever means they could, for their next hits. In the lulls between passers-by, Detective Constable Packer did make real notes in his exercise book. He had ambitions to be a writer and at this moment he was working on a film script about a group of aliens whose navigation system had broken down and they landed on Earth just outside Brighton in search of help. After just a few days, they were desperate to leave. Two of them had been mugged. Their spacecraft had been vandalised and then impounded because they had no money to pay for the charge of towing it off the main road where they parked it, and they didn't like the food. Furthermore, they couldn't get the help they wanted without filling in an online form which required a postcode and a credit card number, and they had neither. Sometimes Packer wondered whether his job made him too cynical. Then he was jolted back to reality. Out of the corner of his eye he saw a familiar, round-shouldered figure slouching along, and his already pleasant morning suddenly became even more pleasant when the figure walked straight past without clocking him. Paul stared at the emaciated, gaunt-faced young man in a ragged hoodie, tracksuit bottoms and filthy trainers with an even measure of loathing, disgust and sympathy. The young man's ginger hair was shaven like his own in a number one, and he, as usual, had a thin vertical strip of beard running from the centre of his lower lip to his chin. Paul watched him walk slowly through a photograph being taken by a young man of his girlfriend or wife, oblivious to just about everything around him. He weaved through a gaggle of tourists being shepherded by a tour guide, and now the detective constable knew exactly where he was heading, to the wall across the square from them, where there were cash point machines side by side. And sure enough, the young man sat down between them. It was a popular spot for begging, and already he had a target, a young woman who was entering her bank card. Paul Packer seized the moment, strode across and stood squarely in front of the man just as he heard him croak feebly, can you spare any change, love? By way of a greeting, Packer held out the shortened stump of his right-hand index finger. Hi, skunk, he said. Remember me? Skunk looked up at him warily. The woman was digging in her purse. Packer turned to her. 
I'm a police officer. Begging is illegal. Anyhow, this fellow knows better ways to get a pound of flesh, don't you? He said, turning back to Skunk, waggling his bitten-off index stump, making a series of rapid bites, clacking his teeth noisily, mocking his former assailant. Don't know what you mean, Skunk said. Memory needs a jog, does it? Would a day in a custody cell help? Be difficult to get your drugs there, wouldn't it? Fuck off. Leave me alone. Packer looked at the young woman, who did not seem to know where to put herself. She grabbed her cash and her card and fled. I'm clean, Skunk suddenly added, sullenly. I know that, mate. I don't want to bust you. Just wondered if you'd like to give me some information. What's in it for me? What do you know about Barry Spiker? Never heard of him. A fire engine screamed down North Street, siren louder than a ship's foghorn, and Packer waited for it to pass by. Yes, you have. You did jobs for him. Never heard of him. So that Audi convertible you were swanning round the seafront in on Friday night, that was your car, was it? Don't know what you mean. I think you do. There was a car following you, an unmarked police car. I was in it. You drive pretty well, he said with grudging admiration. Nah, don't know what you mean. Packer put his stump of an index finger right up close to Skunk's face. I've got a long memory, Skunk. Understand? I did time for that. And then you came out, but my finger didn't come back, and I'm still pretty pissed off. So I'm going to make a deal with you. Either I'm going to be in your face for the rest of your shitty little life, or you help me. After some moments' silence, Skunk said, What kind of help? Information. Just a phone call, that's all. Just a phone call from you next time Sparker gives you a job. And then? Packer explained what he wanted Skunk to do. When he finished, he said, Then we call it quits. And I get arrested, right? No, we won't touch you. And I'm out of your face. Do we have a deal? Is there any cash in it for me? Packer looked down at him. He was such a pathetic figure. The D.C. suddenly felt sorry for him. We'll bung you something afterwards as a reward. Deal? Skunk gave a limp, indifferent shrug. I'll take that as a yes. Chapter 74 Saturday's press conference had been bad enough but this one now was even worse. Around fifty people were crammed into the briefing room, and a lot more than on Saturday were packed along the corridor. A capacity house, Grace thought grimly. The only good thing was that he had heavyweight support here this morning. Flanking him on either side, so they formed a line of three in front of the concave board carrying the Sussex Police website address and the Crime Stoppers legend, were Assistant Chief Constable Alison Vosper, who had changed clothes since he had left her office and was now wearing her spotless, freshly pressed uniform, and the Brighton Police Divisional Commander, Chief Superintendent Ken Brickhill, a blunt, plain-speaking policeman of the old school, in his equally immaculate uniform. A tough individual, Brickhill had no time for the politically correct lobby, and would happily hang most of the villains in Brighton and Hove, given half a chance. Unsurprisingly, he was respected by just about everyone who had ever served under him. Some of the windows in here actually opened, but even so, with sunlight beating through the blinds, it was stiflingly hot. Someone made a quip about the black hole of Calcutta, while the press officer, flamboyantly but slightly shabbily dressed Dennis Pons, squeezed his way around the table to join the trio, muttering an excuse for being late. Pons started by leaning too closely to the microphone, so that his first words were almost lost in squawkback. Good morning, he said, starting again, his rather unctuous, ingratiating voice clearer this time. This press conference will start with Detective Superintendent Grace running through the investigations into the deaths of Mrs. Catherine Bishop and Miss Sophie Harrington, then Assistant Chief Constable Vosper and Chief Superintendent Brickhill, Divisional Commander of Brighton Police, We'll talk about the community and the public at large. He handed over to Grace with a theatrical sweep of his arm and stepped away. Flashbulbs strobed for some moments, 
as Roy Grace outlined the details of the investigation so far. He, of course, didn't tell them everything, but kept to the facts on times and events, confirming a lot of information that they already knew. He appealed in respect of both investigations for witnesses to come forward, particularly anyone who knew either woman and had seen her in the last few days. He stated also that he was keen to talk to anyone who had seen anything suspicious near either murder scene. Having concluded all he wanted to say about the murders at this stage, Grace then asked those present if they had any questions. A female voice, someone at the back whom Grace could not see, shouted out, We understand there's a serial killer at large. Can you reassure us that the people of Brighton and Hove are safe, Detective Superintendent? Grace had the usual problem of what to do with his hands, well aware that his body language was as important as what he said. Resisting the temptation to clasp his hands in front of him, he dropped them firmly to his sides and leaned into the microphone. At present there's nothing to indicate that this is a serial killer, but people should take care and be a little more vigilant than usual. How can you say this isn't a serial killer when two women have been murdered within 24 hours of each other? demanded a squeaky-voiced old stringer for a bunch of provincial papers. Detective Superintendent Grace, can you give an assurance to young women living in Brighton that they are safe? A bead of perspiration dropped, stinging into Grace's right eye. I think at best now that my colleagues who are here to talk about community issues respond to that, he said, looking first at Alison Vosper and then at Ken Brickhill. They nodded and the chief superintendent then said, in his no-nonsense voice, No one can ever give a 100% guarantee like that in a modern city, but police and local community leaders are doing everything they can with additional resources to catch the killer or killers. So it might be one person responsible for both killings, the reporter persisted. Evasively, Brickhill replied, If anyone has concerns, they should contact the police. Police patrols are going to be increased. Anyone who sees anything suspicious should contact us. We don't want the public to panic. A lot of resources have been allocated to the investigation, and we're doing everything to ensure the citizens of Brighton and Hove are safe. Then Kevin Spinella who was standing a short distance away at the front of the pack, said, Are you not going to admit, Detective Superintendent, that there's a crazed serial killer at large in Brighton somewhere? Grace responded calmly by reiterating the overview from both murder scenes. Then he continued by adding, We are still in the early stages of our investigation, but there would appear to be some similarities between the two cases, yes. Detective Superintendent, uh, do you have a prime suspect? asked a young reporter from the Mid-Sussex Times. We are following a number of lines of inquiry and every day we are getting more information in. We would like to thank the public for all the information they've supplied so far. At this moment our teams are sifting through a large volume of phone calls and we're waiting for forensic results back from the labs. We have detectives working around the clock to identify who is responsible and bring them to justice. So, what you're saying, Kevin Spinella said in a loud, important voice, is that people in Brighton and Hove should lock themselves in their houses and not go out until the killer's been caught. No, Grace retorted, that's not what we're saying. The police have no idea who or where the killer of either woman is, and all women must be at risk, but that does not mean anyone needs to panic. He turned to his chief. I'll let Assistant Chief Constable Vosper respond to that in more detail. If looks could kill... Vosper's smile would have sliced Grace open and then disemboweled him. A solidly built earth mother standing near the back called out loudly, Assistant Chief Constable, will you be allowing Detective Superintendent Grace to consult a medium? There was a titter of laughter. The woman had touched a raw nerve. Maintaining a poker face, Grace smiled inwardly, watching Alison Vosper's sudden discomfort and really quite enjoying it. He had been pilloried over a previous case a few months back when it had come out in court that he had taken a shoe, a key piece of evidence in a murder trial, to a medium. The press had had a field day, and so had Vosper, with him. It is not normal practice for the police to follow such a line of inquiry, she replied sharply. That said, we listen to anyone who can provide us with information and then assess how it may progress the investigation. So you don't rule it out? The reporter persisted. I think I've already given you my answer. Then she looked around the room. 
Any more questions? At the end of the conference, as Grace was leaving, Alice and Vosper collared him and they stepped into a vacant office. We've got the whole eyes of the city on us, Roy. If you're planning to go and see any of your psychics, please discuss it with me first. I don't have any plans, not at this stage. Good, she said, with the gusto of someone praising a puppy for urinating in the right place. For a moment, he thought she was going to pat him on the head and give him a biscuit. Chapter 75 Half an hour later, Grace stood in the cramped changing room at the mortuary, fumbling with the tapes on the green gown, then stepping into a pair of white gumboots. As he did so, a very hungover, gowned-up Cleo popped her head around the door and gave him a look he could not read. Sorry about last night, she said. Didn't mean to pass out on you. Honest. He smiled back. Do you always get that wrecked when you go out with your sister? She's just been dumped by a dickhead boyfriend and wanted to get smashed. It seemed rude not to join her. Quite. How are you feeling? Only marginally better than Sophie Harrington looks. I had the roundabouts earlier. Coca-Cola, full strength, the best thing, he said. I've already drunk two cans. She again gave him a look he could not read. I don't think I asked you how Germany went. Did you find your wife? Have a cosy reunion? You did ask, about five times. She looked astonished. And you told me. How about we have a meal tonight and I'll give you the full lowdown? She looked hard at him again and for a sudden panicky moment he thought she was going to tell him to get lost. Then she gave him a thin smile, but with no warmth. Come over to me. I'll cook something very simple and non-alcoholic. Comfort food. I think we need to talk. I'll come over as soon as I can after the evening briefing. He took a step towards her and gave her a quick kiss. At first she pulled away sharply. I'm very hurt and I'm very angry with you, Roy. I like it when you're angry, he said. Suddenly she melted a little. Bastard, she said, and grinned. He gave her another quick kiss, which turned into a longer kiss. Their gowns rustled as they held each other tighter, Grace keeping one eye on the door in case anyone came in. Then Cleo broke away and looked down at herself, grinning again. We're not meant to be doing this. I'm still angry with you. Turns you on, this gear, does it? Even more than black silk underwear. Better get back in and do some work, Detective Superintendent. A centre spread in the Argus that you got caught shagging in the mortuary changing room wouldn't be the best thing for your image. He followed her down the tiled corridor, his mind a maelstrom of thoughts about Cleo, about Sandy, and about work. The press had given them a rough ride this morning, and he could understand where they were coming from. One murder of an attractive young woman could be an isolated incident, something personal. Two could put a city or an entire county into a state of panic. If the press got hold of the information on the gas mask, there would be a feeding frenzy. He hadn't released the information that Sophie Harrington had made a call to Brian Bishop, the prime suspect in Katie Bishop's murder, and that Brian Bishop behind his veneer of respectability as a successful businessman, respected citizen of Brighton and Hove, golf club committee member and charity benefactor, whose equally outwardly respectable Rotarian wife had been having an affair, had a deeply unpleasant criminal record. At the age of 15, according to the information on the PNC, the Police National Computer Database, Bishop had been sentenced to two years in a young offenders institute for raping a 14-year-old girl at his school. Then, at the age of 21, he was given two years probation for violently assaulting a woman, causing her grievous bodily harm. It seemed that the deeper his team dug into Bishop's life, the stronger the evidence against the man was becoming. Earlier today, Alison Vosper had talked about his alibi in London being the elephant in the room. But there was another elephant in the same room at this moment, and that was Bishop's vehement denial of any knowledge of the insurance policy taken out on his wife's life because he appeared to be telling the truth about that, and that was bothering Grace. Still, it was equally clear that Brian Bishop was a sharp operator. Not many people achieved his level of financial success by being a nice guy, in Grace's view, something now borne out by the man's ugly, violent past. And he knew he shouldn't read too much into Bishop's ignorance, 
or feigned ignorance of the life insurance policy. The complexities were starting to hurt his brain. He wanted to go somewhere and sit in a quiet, dark corner and run through every element of the Bishop and Harrington cases. The Socko team would be in the Bishop's house for a good few days yet, and Grace was glad about that. He wanted the man to be uncomfortable, out of his natural habitat. In a hotel room like a caged animal, he would be insecure and therefore would respond better to questioning. They were definitely stacking up material against Bishop, but it was too early to arrest the man. If they did that, they could only keep him inside for twenty-four hours, with an extension of a further twelve hours without charging him. There wasn't enough hard evidence yet, and although the man's alibi wasn't watertight, there was enough room for doubt. Two independent witnesses to say he had been in London either side of the time of the murder against one automatic number plate recognition camera which said he hadn't. There have been far too many cases of villains using copied number plates, particularly these days, to avoid speeding fines from cameras. A clever brief could easily sow doubt in a jury's mind about whether this number plate was real or a fake. He was also very interested in the artist that Katie Bishop had been seeing. At this point the man was a potential suspect for sure. Deep in thought, he entered the stark, bright glare of the post-mortem room. Sophie Harrington's body was obscured from his view, crowded by green-gowned figures peering intently like students in a classroom, as Nadiushka de Sancha pointed out something. In the room, in addition to the pathologists, Cleo and Darren, were DCI Digan and the lean figure of the coroner's officer, Ronnie Pearson, a retired police officer in his early fifties. Grace walked over to the pathologist's side and experienced the same uncomfortable surprise he got every time he saw a cadaver in here or anywhere else. They always looked almost ethereal, the skin of Caucasians, except for burnt or badly decomposed victims, a ghostly alabaster colour. It was as if the process of death made them appear in black and white, while everything around them remained in colour. Sophie Harrington had been turned over onto her stomach. Nadiushka was pointing her latex-gloved finger at dozens of tiny dark crimson holes on the dead woman's back. It was like a tattoo all the way down her torso, covering much of the skin. Can you all read what it spells out? she asked. As he looked closer, all Grace could see at first was an indecipherable pattern. I would say from the neatness and consistency of the holes that it has been done with something like a power drill, the pathologist continued. While the victim was alive, D.I. Murphy asked, or after she was dead? I would say post-mortem, Nadiushka responded, leaning over and peering closely at a section of the dead woman's back. These are deep holes and there's very little bleeding. Her heart wasn't pumping when they were made. Some small mercy for the poor woman, Grace thought. Then, like suddenly being able to read the hidden writing inside a visual puzzle, he could see the words clearly now. Because you love her. Chapter 76 The grumpy cleaning woman left Cleo Mori's house just after 12.30. The time billionaire made a note of this, from behind the wheel of his Toyota Prius. It was good timing, just minutes before his parking voucher expired. As she stomped off up the hill, talking angrily into her mobile phone, he wondered if she'd spent the whole of the last three and a half hours on the phone. He was sure Cleo Mori would be interested to know what she was getting for the money she paid this woman, although, of course, that wasn't really his business. He put the car in gear and running silently on the electric motor, glided up past her, then threaded his way through the complex network of streets up to Queen's Road, then down past the clock tower, and turned right along the seafront. He drove across the Hove border, along past the King Alfred development, stopped at the lights at the bottom of Hove Street, then made a right turn a couple of streets further along, into Westbourne Villas, a wide terrace of large semi-detached Victorian houses. Then he made another right turn into a mews where there was a row of lock-ups. The ones he rented were at the end, numbers 11 and 12. He parked outside number 11 and got out of his car. He then unlocked the garage door and hauled it up, went inside, switched on the light, then pulled the door back down hard. It closed with a loud, echoing clang. Then silence. 
just the faintest whir from the two humidifiers. Peace. He breathed in the warm smells he loved in here. Engine oil, old leather, old bodywork. This was his home, his temple. In this garage, and sometimes in the one next door, where he kept the covered trailer, he used up so many of those hours he had stashed away in the bank, dozens of them at a time, hundreds of them every month, thousands of them every year. He stared lovingly at the fitted dust cover, at the flowing contours of the car it was protecting, the gleaming moonstone white 1962 3.8 Jaguar Mark II saloon, which took up so much of the floor space that he had to edge past it sideways. The walls were hung with his tools, arranged in patterns, each item so spotless it might have been fresh out of its box, all in their correct places. His hammers formed one display, his ring spanners, his wrenches, his feeler gauges, his screwdrivers, each formed a separate artwork. On the shelves were laid out his tins and bottles of polish, wheel cleaner, chrome cleaner, window cleaner, leather polish, his sponges, chamois leathers, bottle brushes, pipe cleaners, all looking brand new. Hello, baby, he whispered, caressing the top of the dust cover, running his hand over the curved hard roof he could feel beneath. You are beautiful, so, so beautiful. He edged along the side of the car, running his hand along the cover, feeling the windows, then the bonnet. He knew every wire, every panel, every nut and bolt, every inch of her steel, chromium, leather, glass, walnut and bakelite. She was his baby. Seven years of painstaking reassembly from a wreck inhabited by rats and mice in a derelict farmyard barn. She was in better condition now than the day, well over forty years ago, she had left the factory. Ten concours of d'Elegance rosettes for first place pinned to the garage wall attested to that. They had come from all over the country. He had won dozens of second, third and even fourth place rosettes as well. But they always went straight into the bin. Later today, he reminded himself, he needed to work on the insides of the bumpers, which were invisible to the normal observer. Judges looked behind them sometimes and caught you out, and there was an important Jaguar Drivers Club concourse coming up at the end of this month. But at this moment, he had something more important on his mind. It was a key-cutting machine, complete with a wide set of blanks, for any lock, the advertisement on the internet had said that had been sitting in the brown packaging marked fragile on the floor beside his workbench since his arrival a couple of months ago. That was the big advantage of being a time billionaire. He was able to plan ahead, to think ahead. He had read a quotation in a newspaper from someone called Victor Hugo who had said, There is one thing stronger than all the armies in the world, and that is an idea whose time has come. He patted the tin full of wax with the indentation of Cleo Mori's front door key that sat heavily in his jacket pocket. Then he began to open the package with a smile on his face. Ordering this had definitely been a very good idea. Its time had come. Chapter 77 Grace pulled his Alfa Romeo into the front car park of the Royal Sussex County Hospital, where he had come to visit an injured officer, and cruised slowly along, looking for a space. Then he patiently waited for an elderly lady to unlock the door of her little Nissan Micra, climb in, do up her seatbelt, get her ignition key in the slot, fiddle with the interior mirror, start the engine, figure out what the round wheel in front of her did, remember where the gear stick was, and finally find reverse. Then she backed out with the speed of a torpedo propelled from a tube, missing the front of his car by an inch. He drove into the space she had vacated and switched off the engine. It was shortly before half-past two and his stomach rumbled, reminding him he needed some food, although he had no appetite. Visits to the mortuary seldom left him feeling like eating, and the image of the grim tattoo on Sophie Harrington's back was still vividly with him, puzzling and disturbing. Because you love her. What the hell did that mean? Presumably her referred to the victim, Sophie Harrington. But who was you? Her boyfriend? His phone rang. 
It was Kim Murphy to update him on the day's progress so far. The most important news was that the Huntingdon Laboratory had confirmed they would have the DNA test results by late afternoon. As he was finishing the call, the phone beeped with a caller waiting signal. It was DCI Digan, also calling in with a progress report on Sophie Harrington, and he was sounding pleased. An elderly neighbour living opposite went over and spoke to the scene guard officer about an hour ago. She said she'd noticed a man acting strangely in the street outside Sophie Harrington's building at about eight on Friday night. He was holding a red carrier bag and wearing a hoodie. Even so, sounds like she had a good look at him. Was she able to give a description of his face? We've someone on our way to interview her now. But what she had said so far fits Bishop in terms of height and build. And am I right in understanding from the timeline report he has no alibi for his whereabouts around that time? Correct. Could she pick him out in an identity parade? That's right at the top of the list. Grace asked Digan if they'd managed to find out if Sophie had had a boyfriend. The SIO responded that there was no information on that yet. They would shortly be interviewing the friend who had reported her missing. When his colleague had finished, Grace checked his emails on his BlackBerry, but there was nothing relevant to either of the two investigations. He slotted the gadget back in its holster in his belt and thought for some moments. Digan's news was potentially very good indeed. If this woman could positively identify Bishop, then that was another significant piece of evidence stacked up against the man. His stomach rumbled again. Fierce sunlight burned through his open sunroof, and he pulled it shut, grateful for the momentary shade. Then he picked up the bacon and egg sandwich he'd bought in a petrol station on the way here, tore off the cellophane wrapper and levered the sandwich out. The first bite tasted vaguely of bacon-flavoured cardboard. Chewing slowly and unenthusiastically, he picked up the copy of the latest edition of the Argus newspaper he had bought at the same time, and stared at the front-page splash, amazed how fast, as so often, they managed to get a story out. At some point, he was going to have to get to the bottom of Spinella's insider sources, but right now this was the bottom of his list of priorities. Brighton's serial killer claims second victim. There was a particularly attractive head and shoulders photograph of Sophie Harrington, wearing a T-shirt and simple beaded necklace, the long brown hair billowing in sunlight. She was smiling brightly at the camera, or the person behind it. Then he read the article, bylined Kevin Spinella, which spilled over into the second and third pages. It was well dressed up with a series of lifestyle photographs of Katie Bishop, as well as all the usual grief-stricken sound bites from Sophie Harrington's parents and her best friend, he would have expected to see, and a small photograph of himself that the paper always wheeled out. It was typical Spinella, sensational reporting intended to create maximum possible panic in the city and boost the circulation of the paper over the coming days, as well as to enhance Spinella's CV and the oily creep's undoubted ambitions for a position with a national paper. Grace supposed he could not blame the man or his editor. He would probably have done the same in their positions. But all the same, deliberate misquotes such as Brighton Police Divisional Commander Chief Superintendent Ken Brickhill advised all women in the city of Brighton and Hove to lock their doors were not helpful. Part of the purpose of carefully managed press conferences, such as the one earlier today, was to inform the public of the crimes that had been committed with the hope of getting leads. But all scaremongering like this did was to jam the police switchboards with hundreds of calls from frightened women. He ate as much of the sandwich as he could manage, washed it down with a tepid Diet Coke, then climbed out and dumped the remnants of his meal and its packaging into a bin. He dutifully bought a pay-and-display ticket and stuck it on the windscreen. Then he walked over to the prefab hospitality flowers booth and chose a small bouquet from the stall. He walked along in front of the sprawling front facade of the hospital, some of it painted white, some cream and some grey, and entered under the large perspex awning, past an ambulance with the wording on its bonnet in large green letters in mirror image. Roy hated this place. It angered and embarrassed him that a city of Brighton and Hove's stature had such a disgusting, run-down dump of a hospital. It might have a grand name and an impressive, sprawling complex of buildings, and sure, some departments, such as the cardiac unit, were world-class, but in general the average makeshift shack of a medical centre in a third-world nation put this place to shame. 
He had read once that the Second World War was the first time in history that more soldiers died from their actual wounds than from infections they picked up in hospitals while being treated for their wounds. Half of the citizens of Brighton and Hove were terrified to come into this place because rumour was rife you were more likely to die from something you picked up inside than from whatever brought you here in the first place. It wasn't the fault of the medical staff, who were mostly quality people who worked their tired butts off. He had seen that with his own eyes enough times. He blamed the management, and he blamed the government whose policies had allowed healthcare standards to fall so low. He went past the gift shop and the chintzy Nuovo Cafe snack bar, which looked like it belonged in a motorway service station, and sidestepped an elderly, vacant-faced patient in a hospital gown who was wandering down the sloping floor straight towards him. And then his anger at the place rose further as he walked over to the curved wooden counter of the unmanned reception desk and saw the sign lying beside a spray of plastic flowers. Apologies, the reception desk is closed. Fortunately, Eleanor had managed to locate his young officer for him. She had been moved out of the orthopaedic ward a few days ago, into one called Chichester. A list on the wall informed him that it was on the third floor of this wing. He climbed up a spiral staircase, on the walls of which a cheery mural had been painted, walked along a blue linoleum-covered corridor, up two further flights of wooden banistered stairs, and stopped in a shabby, grimy corridor. A young female Asian nurse in a blue top and black trousers walked towards him. There was a faint mashed potatoes and cabbage smell of school dinners. I'm looking for a Chichester ward, he said. She pointed. Go straight ahead. He walked past a row of gas cylinders through a door with a glass window covered in warning notices and entered a ward of about sixteen beds. The smell of school dinners was even stronger in here, tinged by a faint sour smell of urine and disinfectant. There was an old linoleum floor and the walls were filthy. The windows were wide open, giving a view out onto another wing of the hospital, with a vent from which steam was rising. Horrible curtains were partially drawn around some beds. It was a mixed ward of what looked mostly like geriatrics and mental patients. Grace stared for a moment at a little old lady with tufts of hair the colour of cotton wool, matching the complexion of her sunken cheeks, fast asleep, her toothless mouth open wide. Several televisions were on. A young man in bed was babbling loudly to himself. Another old woman in a bed at the far end, kept shouting out something loud and unintelligible to no one in particular. In the bed immediately to his right was a shriveled little old man, fast asleep, unshaven, his bedclothes pushed aside, two empty bottles of coke on the table that straddled him. He was wearing striped pyjamas, the bottoms untied, his limp penis clearly visible, nestling against his testicles. And in the next door bed, to his horror, Surrounded by dusty-looking apparatus, he saw the person he'd come to visit, and now, as he slipped his hand into his pocket and removed his mobile phone, storming past the busy nursing station, his blood was really boiling. One of his favourite young officers, D.C. Emma Jane Boutwood, had been badly injured trying to stop a van in the same operation in which Glenn Branson had been shot. She had been crushed between the van and a parked car and suffered massive internal damage including losing her spleen, as well as multiple bone fractures. The twenty-five-year-old had been in a coma on life support for over a week, and when she came round, doctors had been worried she might never walk again. But in recent weeks she had made a dramatic improvement, was able to stand unaided, and had already been talking eagerly about when she could get back to work. Grace really liked her. She was a terrific detective, and he reckoned she had a great future ahead of her in the force. But at this moment... Seeing her lying there, smiling palely at him, she looked like a lost, bewildered child. Always thin, she now looked emaciated inside her loose hospital gown, and the orange tag was almost hanging off her wrist. Her blonde hair, which had lost its luster and looked like dried straw, was clipped up untidily, with a few stray wisps falling down. On the table next to her bed lay a crowded riot of cards, flowers and fruit. Her eyes said it all before they even spoke, and something snapped inside him. How are you? he asked, holding on to the flowers for the moment. Never better, she said, making an effort to perk up for him. 
I told my dad yesterday that I was going to beat him at tennis before the end of the summer. Mind you, that should be easy. He's a crap player. Grace grinned, then asked gently, What the hell are you doing in this ward? She shrugged. They moved me about three days ago. Said they needed the bed in the other ward. Did they hell? You want to stay here? Not really. Grace stepped back and scanned the ward, looking for a free nurse, then walked over to a young Asian girl in nursing uniform who was removing a bedpan. Excuse me, he said. I'm looking for whoever's in charge here. The nurse turned round, then pointed to a Harris-looking nurse of about forty, with pinned-up hair and a bookish face behind large glasses, who was entering the ward holding a clipboard. In a few quick, determined paces, Grace cut her off, blocking her path. The badge hanging from her blue top read, Angela Morris, ward manager. Excuse me, he said, can I have a word with you? I'm sorry, she replied in a brittle, distinctly hostile and haughty voice. I'm dealing with a problem. Well, you have another one right now, he said, almost shaking with anger, pulling out his warrant card and holding it up to her face. She looked alarmed. What? What is this about? Her voice had suddenly dropped several decibels. Grace pointed at Emma Jane. You have exactly five minutes to get that young woman out of this stinking hellhole and into either a private ward or a women-only one. Do you understand? Haughty again, the ward manager said. Perhaps you should try to understand some of the problems we have in this hospital, Detective Superintendent. Raising his voice almost to a shout, Grace said, this young woman is a heroine. She was injured performing an act of supreme bravery in the line of duty. She helped save this city from a monster who is now behind bars awaiting trial and to save the lives of two innocent people. She nearly damn well sacrificed her life, and her reward is to get put in a mixed geriatric ward in a bed next to a man with his dick hanging out. She's not spending one more hour in this ward. Do you understand me? Looking around edgily, the nurse said, I'll... we'll see what I can do later. Raising his voice even more, Grace said, I don't think you heard me properly. There's no later about this. You're going to do this now, because I'm going to stay here in your face until she's moved into a bed in a ward that I'm happy about. Then he held up the phone and showed it to the woman. Unless you'd like me to email the photos I've just taken of Brighton, heroine D.C. Boutwood, being stripped of all dignity by your cruel incompetence to the Argus and every damn newspaper in the land, you're going to do this right now. You are not allowed to use mobile phones in here, and you've no right to take photographs. You've no right to treat my officer like this. Get me the hospital manager, now. Chapter 78 Thirty minutes later, Emma Jane Boutwood was wheeled along a network of corridors into a much more modern section of the hospital. Grace waited until the young DC was installed in her sunny, private room, with a view out across the rooftops to the English Channel, then gave her the flowers and left, after receiving a promise from the hospital's Mr. Big, down a phone line from his ivory tower, that she would remain in this room until she was discharged. Following the directions he'd been given back to the front entrance, he stopped at an elevator and hit the button. After a lengthy wait, he was about to give up and walk down when suddenly the doors slid open. He stepped in and nodded at a tired-looking young Indian man who was taking a bite on an energy snack bar. Dressed in green medical pyjamas with a stethoscope hanging from his neck, the man was wearing a name tag which read, Dr. Raj Singh A&E. As the doors closed, Grace suddenly felt stifling heat. It was like being in an oven. He noticed the doctor was staring at him curiously. Hot day, Grace said politely. Yes, a little too hot, the man explained in a cultured English accent. Then he frowned. Excuse me asking, but you look familiar. Have we met? Grace had always had a good memory for faces, almost photographic at times, but this man's did not ring any bells. I don't think so, he replied. The lift stopped and Grace stepped out. The doctor followed him. In the Argus today, is it your photograph? Grace nodded. That explains it. I was just reading it a few minutes ago. Actually, I had been thinking of contacting your inquiry team. Grace, distractedly anxious to get on and back to the office, was only giving Dr. Singh half an ear now. Really? Look, it's probably nothing. 
But the paper says you've asked people to be vigilant and report anything suspicious. Yes. Well, I have to be careful about patient confidentiality, but I saw a man in here yesterday and he really made me feel uncomfortable. In what way? The doctor glanced around the empty corridor, looking sternly at a fire hydrant, then turned back to check the lift doors were closed. Well, his behavior was very erratic. He shouted at the receptionist, for instance. Nothing erratic about that, Grace thought privately. He was sure plenty of people got shouted at in here regularly, with good reason. When I saw him, the doctor continued, he seemed extremely agitated. Don't get me wrong, I see plenty of people with psychiatric problems, but this man just seemed to be in a state of high anxiety about something. What was his injury? Here's the thing, there was an infected wound in his hand. Suddenly Grace was paying a lot more attention. From what? Well, he said he had shut it in a door, but it didn't look like that to me. Shut in a door? Grace queried, thinking hard about Bishop's explanation for his injury, that he bashed it getting into a taxi. Yes. So what did it look like to you? A bite. I would say a human bite, quite possibly. You see, there were marks on both sides of the hand, on the wrist, then on the underside, just below the thumb. If he'd shut a car door or a boot lid on it, there would have been marks both sides. Yes, but not curved ones, the doctor replied. They were semi-lunar upper and lower, consistent with a mouth, and there were puncture marks of varying depths, consistent with teeth. What makes you think they were human? Could they have been from an animal, large dog? The doctor blushed. I'm a bit of a crime fiction addict. I love reading forensic crime novels when I get the time, and watching programs like CSI on television. His bleeper went. He paused a moment, then carried on. But you see, there's another thing I deduced. He paused again, looking stressed, to read the message on the machine's display. The thing I deduced is that if it was a dog bite, then why should he have denied it? If it was a human bite that he received during an attack, I can, of course, see why he denied it. Then, when I saw the horrible news about this murdered young woman, I sort of put two and two together. Grace smiled. I think you'd make a good detective. But it's a big two and two, he replied. Can you describe this man to me? Yes, he was about six foot, very lean, with quite long brown hair, dark glasses and a heavy beard. It was quite hard to see his face clearly. He was wearing a blue linen jacket, a cream shirt, jeans and trainers. He looked a bit of a scruff. Grace's heart sank. This did not sound like Bishop at all, unless he'd gone to the trouble of disguising himself, which was always a possibility. Would you recognize him if you saw him again? Well, absolutely. Would this man have been picked up on some of the hospital's CCTV cameras? We have one in A&E. He'd be on that for sure. Grace thanked him wrote down his name and phone numbers, then went off in search of the hospital's CCTV monitoring suite, unclipping his Blackberry and checking his emails as he walked. There was one from Dick Pope, in response to the email he had sent him earlier this morning with the photographs he'd taken in Munich. It stopped him in his tracks. Roy, this is not the woman Leslie and I saw last week. We really are convinced we saw Sandy. Best, Dick. Chapter 79 It was nearly 3.30 by the time that Nadyushka de Sancha had completed her post-mortem and left the mortuary, along with DCI Digan and the coroner's officer. From the ligature marks on Sophie Harrington's neck and the petechial hemorrhaging in her eyes, the Home Office pathologist was drawn towards the conclusion that the poor young woman had been strangled, but she would need to wait for blood toxiology reports and test results on the contents of her stomach and the samples of fluid she had taken from the woman's bladder to eliminate other possible causes of death. The presence of semen in her vagina indicated the likelihood that she'd been raped either before or after her death. Cleo and Darren still had several hours of work ahead of them. There was the post-mortem to be carried out on the unknown female washed up from the sea. In addition, they had the grim task of the post-mortem on the six-year-old girl who had been killed on Saturday by a car, and they had four other cadavers to deal with including that of a 47-year-old HIV-positive man whom they'd earlier placed in the sealed isolation room for his post-mortem. 
The parents of the little girl had wanted to come up to visit late yesterday afternoon, and Darren had let them in. They'd come for a further visit a couple of hours ago, and Cleo had seen them. She was still feeling upset now. Dr. Nigel Churchman, the local consultant pathologist, who would carry out these much less intensive post-mortems, was due here in half an hour. Christopher Ghent, the forensic odontologist, who had come to assist in the identification of the unknown female, was currently in the office having a cup of tea, tetchy at being kept waiting. Cleo and Darren removed the woman from her fridge and unwrapped her. The smell of her rotten body instantly permeated the place again. Then they left Ghent to get on with his work. Ghent, a tall, intense, bespectacled man in his mid-forties, with thinning hair, had an international reputation on two counts. He had written a well-respected book on forensic dentistry in an attempt to rival Montreal odontologist Robert Dorian's definitive bite-mark evidence, which had long been the profession's standard reference work. He was also an accomplished bird-watcher, or twitcher, and a world authority on seagulls. Fully gowned up in his hospital greens, Ghent worked swiftly but thoroughly, against the background sounds of Darren crunching the ribs and grinding away at the skulls of the other cadavers with the bandsaw. The mood was particularly sombre in here, with none of the banter between the team that usually went on. The presence of a small child's body subdued them all far more than that of a murder victim. Ghent took a series of photographs, both normal and with a portable X-ray camera, then noted details of each tooth on a chart, finishing by taking a soft clay impression of the upper and lower sets. Acting on instructions from the coroner, he would later send his detailed records to every dentist within a 15-mile radius of the city of Brighton and Hove. If that failed to produce results, he would gradually broaden the circulation list until, if necessary, every registered dentist in the UK was covered. There was as yet no international system of coordinated dental records. If no dentist in the UK could make an identification, and fingerprints and DNA failed to produce results, the woman would eventually end up in a grave paid for by the city of Brighton and Hove, recorded for posterity as one tiny fraction of a tragic statistic. Nigel Churchman had calculated recently that he performed over 7,000 post-mortems in this mortuary during the past 15 years, yet he approached each cadaver with the same, almost boyish enthusiasm, as if it were his first. He was a man who genuinely loved his work, and believed that each person who came under his scrutiny deserved the very best from him. A handsome, fit man, with a passion for racing cars, he had a youthful face, much of it concealed at the moment behind his green mask as he peered down at the unknown female, making him seem much younger than his forty-nine years. He flapped away some blue bottles from around her brain, which was lying on the metal examining tray above her open chest cavity, and began work. He sliced the brain carefully with a long-bladed carving knife, checking for foreign bodies such as a bullet or damage from a knife or evidence of hemorrhaging which could indicate death by a heavy blow. But the brain seemed healthy, undamaged. Her eyes, which had been eaten almost entirely away, yielded no information. Her heart seemed robust, typical of a fit person, with no scaling in the arteries. He was not able to gauge her age very accurately at this stage, judging from the condition and colour of her teeth, her general physique, the condition of her breasts, which were partly gone also. He was guessing mid-twenties to early forties. Darren carried the heart to the weigh scales and marked it up on the wall chart. Churchman nodded. It was within the correct range. He moved on to the lungs, cutting them free, then lifting them with both gloved hands onto the examining tray, dark fluid dripping from them as he set them down. Within a couple of minutes of starting to examine them, he stopped and turned to Cleo. Interesting, he said. She hasn't drowned. There's no water in the lungs. Meaning? Cleo asked. It was a stupid question, blurted out without thinking, the result of her distress after being with the dead girl's parents, her hangover, her stress at the workload, and her worries about the spectre of Sandy clouding her relationship with Roy Grace. Of course, she knew the answer. She knew exactly what it meant. She was already dead when she went into the water. I'm going to have to stop this PM, I'm afraid. You'll need to inform the coroner. A home office pathologist, probably Nadyushka de Sancho again, would have to take over the post-mortem. 
unknown female was now elevated to the status of a suspicious death. Chapter 80 Roy Grace made a mental note to never again find himself closeted with Norman Potting in a small room on a hot day. They were seated next to each other in front of a video monitor in the cubicle-sized viewing room that adjoined the witness interview suite. The late afternoon sun was beating mercilessly against the closed Venetian blinds of the one window, and the air conditioning was useless. Grace was dripping with perspiration. Potting, in a white short-sleeved shirt, with wide, damp patches in the armpits, smelled like the inside of an old hat. Further, the detective sergeant had eaten something heavily laced with garlic and his breath reeked of the stuff. Grace fished a pack of peppermint gum out of his jacket on the back of his chair and offered a piece to Potting in the hope he would chew it and spare him his death breath. Never touch it, Roy, thanks, he said. Pulls my fillings out. He was fiddling with the controls, fast rewinding a recording. Grace watched the screen as Potting, Zaffaroni and a third man all walked backward out of the room in speeded up motion, disappearing through the door one at a time. Potting stopped the tape, then started it and each of the three men reappeared, walking in through the door this time. Got yourself a MySpace profile yet, Roy? he asked suddenly. MySpace? I thought I was a bit old for a MySpace profile. Potting shook his head. Ooh, all ages. Anyhow, Lee's only twenty-four. She and I got a joint profile. Norma Lee. Get it? <laughs> she already has three Thai friends in England, one in Brighton. Good, don't you think? Genius, Grace replied, his mind more on avoiding Potting's breath than the conversation. Find you, Potting chuckled. There's some fancy-looking totty on there. <laughs> Thought you were a happily married man now, with your new bride. For a moment, Potting looked genuinely happy. His pug-like face creased into a look of contentment. Oh, she's something, I tell you. Roy, taught me some new tricks. Blimey! You ever had an oriental woman? Grace shook his head. I'll take your word for it. He was trying to concentrate on the screen, trying to put Sandy to the back of his mind and focus on his work. He had a massive responsibility on his shoulders, and how he handled events over the coming days could have a major impact on his career. He was aware, with the high profile of this case, that it wasn't only Alison Vosper's critical eyes that were focused on him. On the screen, a lean, angular man was lowering himself into one of the three red chairs in the witness interview suite. He had a striking face, interesting rather than handsome, with untidy, tangled hair and a Dutch settler's beard. He wore a baggy Hawaiian shirt hanging loose, blue jeans and leather sandals. His complexion was pale, as if he'd spent too much of the summer indoors. That's Katie Bishop's lover? Grace asked. Yes, Potting replied. Barty Chancellor. Ponsey name, Grace said. Ponsey Git, Potting replied, turning up the sound. Grace watched the interview progress with both detectives making frequent jottings in their notebooks. Despite his odd appearance, Chancellor spoke in an assured, faintly superior public school accent, his body language relaxed and confident, the only hint of any nerves showing when he occasionally twisted a fabric bracelet on his wrist. Uh, did uh, Mrs. Bishop ever talk to you about her husband, Mr. Chancellor? Norman Potting asked him. Yes, of course she did. Did that give you a kick? Zaffaroni asked. Grace smiled. The young, arrogant DC was doing exactly what he'd hoped, winding Chancellor up. What exactly do you mean by that? Chancellor asked. Zaffaroni held his gaze. Did you enjoy the knowledge that you were sleeping with a woman who was cheating on her husband? I'm here to help you with your inquiries in finding the killer of my darling Katie. I don't think that question's relevant. We'll be the judge of what's relevant, sir. Zaffaroni replied coolly. I came here voluntarily, Chancellor said, visibly riled now, his voice rising. I don't like your tone. I appreciate you must be very distressed, Mr. Chancellor, Norman Potting cut in, speaking courteously, playing classic good cop to Zaffaroni's bad. I can understand something of what you must be going through. 
It would be very helpful if you could tell us a little bit about the nature of the relationship between Mr. and Mrs. Bishop. Chancellor toyed with his bracelet for some moments. The man was a brute, he said suddenly. In what way? Potting asked. Did he beat Mrs. Bishop up? Zaffaroni asked. Was he violent? Not physically, but mentally. He was very critical of her. The way she looked, or the way she kept the house, he's a bit of an obsessive. And he was extremely jealous, which was why she was extra careful, and... He fell silent for a moment, as if hesitating whether to add something. Well, I, I don't know if this is significant, but... He's quite kinky, she told me. In what way? Bossing asked. Sexually, he's into bondage, fetish stuff. What kind of stuff? Bossing asked again. Leather, rubber, that sort of thing. She told you all this? Zaffaroni asked. Yes. Did that turn you on? What the hell kind of a question is that? Chancellor flared at him. Did he excite you when Katie told you about these things? I'm not some kind of sick pervert, if that's what you think, he retorted. Mr. Chancellor, Norman Potting said, playing good cop again. I don't suppose Mrs. Bishop ever mentioned a gas mask to you? Of what? Did Mrs. Bishop's fetishes ever include a gas mask, to the best of your knowledge? The artist thought for a moment. I don't... I... No, I don't recall her mentioning a gas mask. Are you sure? Zaffaroni said. It's not the kind of thing you forget easily. You seem to forget that she was a married woman easily enough. Zaffaroni pushed his barb in. I think it's time I had my solicitor present, Chancellor said. You are out of order. Did you kill Mrs. Bishop? Zaffaroni asked coolly. Chancellor looked fit to explode. What? I asked you if you killed Mrs. Bishop. I loved her. We were going to spend the rest of our lives together. Why on earth would I have killed her? You just said you wanted your solicitor present, Zaffaroni continued like a Rottweiler. In my experience, when people want their lawyer in the room, it's because they're guilty. I loved her very much. I... His voice began to crack. Suddenly he hunched forward, cradling his face in his hands, and began to sob. Potting and Zaffaroni glanced at each other, waiting. Finally, Barty Chancellor sat up, composing himself. I, I'm sorry. Van Zaffaroni lobbed the question Grace had been desperate for one of them to ask. Did Mr. Bishop know about your relationship? Absolutely not. Norman Potting cut in again. Uh, Mr. Bishop is by all accounts a very bright man. Uh, you and Mrs. Bishop had an affair that had been going on for over twelve months. Do you really think he had no inkling? We were very careful, and besides, he, he was away in London most weekdays. Perhaps he knew and never said anything, Zaffaroni suggested. Possibly, Chancellor conceded grudgingly. But I don't think so. I mean, Katie was sure he didn't know. Zaffaroni flicked back some pages in his notebook. You said earlier that you have no alibi for the time when Mrs. Bishop left your house and the estimated time perhaps less than an hour later, when she was killed. Correct. You fell asleep. It was nearly midnight. We'd been making love. Perhaps you've never tried making love. You'll find out, if you do, that it can make you sleepy. He glared at Zaffaroni. Grace was making some mental notes himself. The affair had been going on for twelve months. Six months ago, Brian Bishop had taken out a three million pound insurance policy on his wife's life. He had a history of violence. What if he had found out about the affair? Chancellor had said that he and Katie were planning to spend the rest of their lives together. This was more than just a fling. Perhaps Bishop couldn't bear the thought of losing his wife. All the right boxes were getting ticked. The man had a motive. Maybe he had planned this carefully for many months. The perfect alibi in London, except for one small slip-up that he wasn't even aware of the photograph of his car from the hidden camera near Gatwick Airport. Grace watched the interview continue, Zaffaroni winding Chancellor up more and more. Sure, this artist was a possible suspect. He'd clearly been desperately in love with the woman, enough to kill her if she dumped him? Perhaps. 
Smart enough to murder her and set it up so it looked like her husband had done it? It could not be discounted. But at this moment the weight of the evidence seemed to be stacking up solidly against Brian Bishop. He looked at his watch. It was 5.15. He had brought the video of the man in the accident and emergency waiting room from the Royal Sussex County Hospital CCTV straight to the film unit here at Sussex House for enhancement. He had just had time now to go down and see how they were getting on before his team meeting with Kim Murphy and Brendan Digan to prepare for the 6.30 joint briefing. On the hospital's low-grade recording, it was hard to make out the man's features because his face was so extensively obscured by long hair, dark glasses, moustache and beard. With the technology they had there, they would be able to sharpen the image considerably. As he stepped out into the corridor, his phone rang. It was D.S. Bella Moy, talking excitedly through what sounded like a mouthful of Maltesers. The DNA test results on Katie Bishop were back. When she told him what they showed, he punched the air for joy. Chapter 81 There was no air conditioning in Robert Vernon's office, on the second floor of a fine Queen Anne house in Brighton's Lanes, with a view straight down a narrow street of flint-walled houses to the seafront. The din from a road drilling machine outside came straight in through the open windows, worsening the headache that Brian Bishop had woken with this morning after yet another virtually sleepless night. It was a pleasant, airy office, with much of the wall space taken up by shelves crammed full of legal tomes and by filing cabinets. Two fine old Brighton prints hung on the pastel blue walls, one showing the chain pier, the other a view of the old steam. Piles of correspondence were stacked on the desk and some on the floor. Oh, forgive the mess, please, Brian, Vernon said, ever courteous. Just back from holiday this morning. Not quite sure where to begin. I often wonder if it's even worth going on holiday, Bishop said, because of all the bloody paperwork you have to clear before you go and the stuff that's waiting when you come back. He stirred his delicate china cup of tea seven times, staring at a framed colour photograph of Vernon's wife, Trish, on the window ledge behind the desk. An attractive, fair-haired woman, she was in golfing attire, posing by a tee. Next to it was another silver frame, with three oval holes, each containing the smiling face of one of the Vernon's young children. Taken many years ago, Bishop realised, because they were all in their teens now. It was all right for Vernon, he suddenly thought bitterly. All his family were fine. His whole world was fine. It didn't matter what problems any client dragged in here. He would study the facts, dispense his advice, watch them drag it all back out of the door again behind them, then jump into his Lexus and head off to the golf course with a sunny smile on his face. The man, who was approaching his mid-sixties, had an elegant, courtly charm. His silver hair was always neat, his clothes conservative and immaculate, and his whole manner exuded an air of wisdom and confidence. He had been Bishop's family solicitor forever, it seemed. He had handled all the formalities following the death of Bishop's father, then his mother. It was Vernon whom Brian Bishop had turned to when, on going through the papers in his mother's bureau in her bedroom soon after her death, nearly five years ago, he had discovered something that had been kept from him throughout his life, that he was adopted. It was Vernon who had dissuaded him from embarking on the journey to discover his birth parents. Bishop had had a charmed childhood, Vernon had told him. Doting, adoptive parents, who had married too late to have children of their own, had totally indulged him and his sister, who had followed two years later, but died tragically of meningitis when she was thirteen. They had been comfortably off, and they brought him up in a pleasant, detached house overlooking Hove Recreation Ground, stretching their finances to educate him at a private school, taking him abroad on holidays, and buying him a small car the moment he passed his driving test. Bishop had loved them both very much, as well as most of their relatives. He had been deeply upset when his father died, but it was worse after his mother died. Despite the fact that he had been married to Katie for only a few months, he suddenly felt desperately lonely, very lost. Then he had found that document in his mother's bureau. But Vernon had calmed him down. He pointed out that Bishop's parents had kept it from him because they thought it was in his best interests. They'd wanted only to give him love and security, for him to enjoy the present and be strong for the future. They'd been worried that by telling him, they might pitch him into a life of turmoil, 
searching for a past that might no longer exist, or worse, be very different from how he would have wanted it. Vernon had agreed with him that this was an old-fashioned view, but that it had validity nonetheless. Brian was doing well in life, he was confident, outwardly at least, successful and reasonably content. Sure, there could be big emotional rewards in finding one or both of his birth parents, but equally it could be a profoundly unsettling experience. What if he was really dismayed by the kind of people they were, or if they just rejected him? Yet the nagging desire to find out about his background got stronger all the time, and it was fueled by the knowledge that with each passing year, the chance of one or both of his birth parents still being alive diminished. I'm just so sorry about the news, Brian, and that I couldn't see you earlier today. I had to be in court. Of course, Robert, no problem. I'd had a lot of business stuff to deal with. It kept my mind occupied. That's unbelievable, isn't it? Yes. Bishop did not know whether to say anything about Sophie Harrington. He desperately wanted to open up to someone. But at the same time, it didn't feel right. Not now. Not at this moment. And how are you? Are you coping? Just about. Bishop smiled thinly. I'm sort of grounded here in Brighton. I can't get into the house for several more days. The police don't want me going up to London, so I'm having to stay down here and carry on with the business as best I can. If you need a bed, you're welcome to stay with Trish and me. Thanks, but I'm okay. And do they have any idea what happened? Who did this terrible thing? The way they're treating me, I think they are convinced I did it. The two men locked eyes briefly. I'm not a criminal lawyer, Brian, but I do know that the immediate family are always suspects in most murder inquiries until eliminated. I'm sure. So don't be too worried by that. The faster they can eliminate you, the faster they can get on with finding who did do it. Out of interest, uh, where are the kids at the moment? Then the solicitor raised a pacifying hand. I'm sorry, not that I mean to infer. No, of course not. Understood. Max is with a friend in the south of France. Carly's staying with cousins in Canada. I've spoken to them both, told them to stay on. There's nothing they can do by coming back. I understand from the police it will be about a month before I can... before the coroner will... He stumbled over his words, emotion taking over. I'm afraid there are a lot of formalities. Bureaucracy, red tape. Not helpful when I'm sure all you want to do is be alone with your thoughts. Bishop nodded pulling out a handkerchief and dabbing his eyes. Uh, talking of which, we have a few things we need to deal with. Uh, okay to make a start? Yes. First, um, what about Katie's assets? Uh, do you know if she made a will? There's something very odd. The police asked me about a life insurance policy for three million pounds, which they said I'd taken out for Katie. The solicitor ignored an incoming call and looked at him. And you hadn't. Mercifully, the drilling suddenly stopped outside. No, absolutely not. But I can remember. And I bloody well would remember that. Vernon was pensive for some moments. Didn't you remortgage your Dyke Road Avenue house quite recently to raise cash for your rights issue? Bishop nodded. Yes, I did. His company was doing well at the moment but almost too well, ironically, and it had suffered from the cash flow problems that many fast-expanding businesses experienced. When he had started up, it had been funded by himself and a small group of wealthy friends on a relatively small amount of cash. Recently, to take it to the next level, they had needed to invest substantially in new technology, larger premises and more skilled computer staff. Bishop and his friends had decided to find the money themselves, rather than try to float, or raise it by other means, and he had provided his own portion from remortgaging his house. The mortgage companies normally require some life insurance cover on a large loan. Perhaps that's what you did. The solicitor might be right, he thought. Life insurance cover was ringing a faint bell. But the amount seemed wrong, and he couldn't check his files because they were in the bloody house. Perhaps, he said dubiously. And, yes, she did make a will. It was a very short one. I'm one of the executors, along with David Crouch, my accountant. It's in the house. Of course, I'd forgotten. 
She had some assets, didn't she? She got a reasonable settlement in her previous marriage. Can you remember what the will contained? I can't remember. She bequeathed a few quid to her parents, but she's an only child, and the bulk of it she left to me. An alarm bell rang suddenly inside Robert Vernon's head. He frowned, just very slightly. Too slightly for Bishop to notice. Chapter 82 The time is 6.30pm, Monday the 7th of August, Roy Grace read out briskly from his notes, feeling in a distinctly upbeat mood for a change. This is our second joint briefing of Operation Chameleon and Operation Mistral. Mistral was the name the police computer had chosen, at random, for the Sophie Harrington inquiry. The conference room at Sussex House was filled to capacity, with police officers and support staff packed around the table in tight rows of chairs. There was an almost electric sense of expectation in the room, and for once the air conditioning was working properly. Grace sped through the summaries, then concluded by saying, There have been a number of significant developments during the course of today, I am pleased to report. He looked at the beanpole of a young father, D.C. Nick Nicol. Would you like to start? Nicol, with his jacket off, his top button undone and his tie slack, read formally from the notes on his pad. I interviewed Miss Holly Richardson at her place of work, the Regent Public Relations Agency, 71 Trafalgar Road, Brighton, at 11 o'clock this morning. She stated that she and Miss Harrington have been at Secretarial College together and have remained best friends since then. Uh, Miss Richardson informed me that Sophie had confided in her that she'd been carrying on a secret relationship with Brian Bishop for approximately six months. Sophie had related to her that on occasions recently Bishop behaved in a violent manner towards her, which frightened her, and he made a number of increasingly sadistic and perverted sexual demands on her. He mopped his brow and continued, turning the page of his notepad. A technician in the telecoms unit here, John Smith, who has been examining both Miss Harrington's mobile phone records and Brian Bishop's, has informed me that each party made a large number of phone calls daily to each other during this six-month period. The most recent was a call from Miss Harrington to Mr. Bishop at 4.51 on Friday afternoon, a few hours before her estimated time of death. Grace thanked him, then turned to the burly figure of Guy Batchelor. The detective sergeant told the assembled teams about the cash call Brian Bishop had made on the investors in his company. International Rostering Solutions, PLC. He concluded by saying, Although his business team seemed to be expanding and is well regarded, Bishop is hocked up to his eyeballs in debt. The significance was not lost on anyone in the room. Then he delivered his nuke. He told the two teams about Bishop's criminal record. Grace watched all their faces. There was a sense of progress in the room that was palpable. Next, he had arranged for an abbreviated cut of Norman Potting and Alfonso Zaffaroni's interview with Barty Chancellor to be played on the video screen. When it finished, Potting informed the team that he had made inquiries about the particular make and model of gas mask that had been found on both victims. The manufacturer had been identified, and they were awaiting information on the number that had been produced in a full list of UK stockists. Next was DCI Digan who related what the neighbour who lived opposite the house where Sophie Harrington had her flat claimed to have seen. She had positively identified Bishop from the photograph that had been seen in the Argus and would be very happy to attend a formal identity procedure. Theatrically saving the best to last, Roy Grace turned to Bella Moy. The DS produced a photograph of the number plate of Brian Bishop's Bentley, relating that it had been taken by an ANPR camera on the southbound carriageway of the M23, near to Gatwick Airport at 11.47 on Thursday night. She pointed out that despite Bishop's alibi that he was in London, his car was seen heading in the direction of Brighton, no more than 30 minutes away, well within the frame of the estimated time of his wife's murder. But Grace privately had concerns about this, as the photograph had been taken at night. The number plate was clearly visible, but it was impossible to determine the make of the car. It was helpful secondary evidence, but no slam dunk. A half-competent barrister would kick it into touch in seconds, but it was worth keeping in the mix. One more fact for jurors to debate. Bella added that Bishop's home computer contents were currently being analysed by Ray Packham, 
in the high-tech crime division, and she was awaiting his report. And then she delivered the killer blow. We received the lab reports back on the DNA analysis of semen found present in Mrs. Bishop's vagina, she said, reading from her notes in a matter-of-fact voice. There were two different spermatozoa ejaculates present in the samples taken by the Home Office pathologist at the post-mortem, she announced. In the opinion of the pathologist, based on the mobility of the spermatozoa present in Mrs. Bishop's vagina, both ejaculates occurred on the night of Thursday, 3rd of August, within a few hours of each other. One is as yet unidentified, but we believe DNA tests will show it to be that of Mrs. Bishop's lover, who has admitted that they had sexual intercourse on Thursday evening. The other contains a 100% match with DNA taken from Brian Bishop. She paused for a moment. This means, of course, that contrary to his alibi that he was in London, Bishop was in Brighton and had sexual intercourse with his wife at some point close to the time of her death. Grace waited patiently, letting the information sink in. He could feel the tension in the room. You've all done a great job. We'll arrest Brian Bishop tonight on suspicion of the murder of his wife but I'm not yet confident that he killed Sophie Harrington, so I don't want to read in tomorrow's Argus that we've solved these murders. Is that clear? The silence that greeted him told him it was abundantly clear. Chapter 83 Brian Bishop stepped out of the hotel bathroom shower, dried himself, then rummaged in the overnight bag that Maggie Campbell had brought up to his room an hour ago containing fresh clothes she'd collected from his house. He pulled on a dark blue polo shirt and navy slacks. The smell of a barbecue wafted in on the light breeze through the open window. It was tantalising, even though, with his churned-up stomach, he had little appetite. He was regretting accepting an invitation to dinner with Glenn and Barbara Mission, who were his and Katie's closest friends. Normally he loved their company, and when Barbara had rung earlier today, she had persuaded him to come over. At the time, it had seemed a more attractive proposition than spending another evening alone in this room with his thoughts and a room service trolley. But his meeting this afternoon with Robert Vernon had brought home to him the full reality of what had happened and left him feeling deeply depressed. It was as if, up until then, it had all been just a bad dream, but now the enormity weighed down on him. There was so much to think about, too much. He really just wanted to sit alone and gather his thoughts. His brown suede loafers were on the floor. It was too warm, really, to put on socks, but it would look too relaxed, too disrespectful to Katie, if he was overly casual. So he sat down on the bed and tugged on a pale blue pair, then pushed his feet into his shoes. Outside, in one of the back gardens his window overlooked, he heard people chattering, a child shouting, music playing, a tinkle of laughter. Then there was a knock on his door. Probably room service wanting to turn down the beds, he thought, opening it. Instead, he saw the two police officers who had first broken the news of Katie's death to him. The black one held up his warrant card. Detective Sergeant Branson and Detective Constable Nicol, may we come in, sir? Bishop did not like the expression on their faces. Yes, of course, he said, stepping back into the room and holding the door open for them. Do you have some news for me? Brian Desmond Bishop, Branson said. Evidence has come to light, as a result of which I'm arresting you on suspicion of the murder of Mrs. Catherine Bishop. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something which you later rely on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Is that clear? Bishop did not respond for a moment. Then he said, You can't be serious. My colleague D.C. Nicol is going to give you a quick body search. Almost mechanically, Bishop raised his arms to allow Nicol to frisk him. I'm... I'm sorry, Bishop then said. I need to call my solicitor. I'm afraid not at the moment, sir. You will be given that opportunity when we're at the custody centre. My rights are... Branson raised his broad hands. Sir, we know what your rights are. Then he dropped his hands and unclipped a pair of handcuffs from his belt. Please put your hands behind your back. What little colour there was in Bishop's face now drained away completely. You're not going to handcuff me, please. I'm not going to do a runner. There's a misunderstanding here. This is all wrong. I can sort this out with you. 
Behind your back, please, sir. In a total panic, Bishop stared wildly around the room. I, I need some things. My jacket, wallet, I... Uh, please let me put, put a jacket on. Which is it, sir? Nickel asked. Bishop pointed to the wardrobe. The camel cut of one. Then he pointed to his mobile phone in his Blackberry on the bedside table. Nicol patted down his jacket, then Branson allowed him to put it on and cram his wallet, mobile phone, Blackberry and a pair of reading glasses into the pockets. Then he asked him to put his hand behind his back again. Look, do we really have to do this? Bishop pleaded. It's going to be so embarrassing for me. We're going to walk through the hotel. We've arranged with the manager to go via a fire exit at the side. Is your hand all right, sir? Branson asked, clicking shut the first cuff. It wouldn't have a bloody plaster on if it was all right, Bishop snapped back. Still looking around the room, he said, panicking suddenly, My laptop! I'm afraid that's going to be impounded, sir. Nick Nicole picked up Bishop's car keys. Do you have a vehicle in the car park, Mr. Bishop? Yes, yes, I do. I, I could drive it. You could come with me. I'm afraid that's going to be impounded too for forensic testing, Branson said. This is unbelievable. Bishop said. This is unfucking believable But he got no sympathy from either man. Their demeanour from when they had first broken the bad news to him last Friday morning had changed completely. I need to make a quick call to the friends I'm having dinner with to tell them I'm not coming. Someone will call them for you from the custody centre. Yes, but they're cooking dinner for me. He pointed at the hotel phone. Please, let me call them. It'll take thirty seconds. I'm sorry, sir. Branson said, repeating himself like an automaton. Someone will call them for you, from the custody centre. Suddenly, Brian Bishop was scared. Chapter 84 Bishop sat next to DC Nicole on the back seat of the grey, unmarked police vectra. It was just past 8pm, and the daylight beyond the car's windows was still bright. The city that was sliding by, playing like a silent movie projected onto the car's windows, seemed different from the one he knew and had known all his life. It was as if he was seeing the passing streets, houses, shops, trees, parks, for the first time. Neither officer spoke. The silence was broken only by the occasional crackle of static and a garbled burst from a controller's voice on the two-way radio. He felt as if he was a stranger here looking out at some parallel universe in which he did not belong. They were slowing suddenly and turning in towards a green, reinforced steel gate that had started to slide open. There was a high, spiked fence to the right and a tall, drab brick structure beyond. They stopped beside a blue sign with white lettering displaying the words Brighton Custody Centre until a wide enough gap had opened. Then they drove on up a steep ramp along past what looked like factory loading bays in the rear of the brick building, and made a left turn into one of them. Instantly, the interior of the car darkened. Bishop saw a closed green door directly in front of them, with a small viewing window. D.S. Branson switched off the engine and climbed out, the weak roof light barely changing the gloom inside the vehicle. Then he opened the rear door and motioned Bishop to step out. Bishop, his hands cuffed behind his back, worked his way awkwardly sideways, then swung his feet out of the car and down onto the concrete screed. Branson put a steadying hand on his arm to help him up. Moments later the green door slid open and Bishop was ushered through into a narrow, completely bare holding room, fifteen feet long by eight wide, with another green door with a viewing window at the far end. There was no furniture in here at all, just a hard bench seat running its full length. Take a seat, Glenn Branson said. I'm happy to stand, Bishop said defiantly. We may be a while. Bishop's mobile phone began ringing. He struggled for a moment, as if forgetting his hands were cuffed. Could one of you answer that for me? It's not permitted, I'm afraid, sir, D.C. Nichols said, fishing it out of his pocket and terminating the call. The young detective studied the phone for some moments, then switched it off and returned it to Bishop's pocket. Brian Bishop stared at a laminated plastic notice that was fixed to the wall by four strips of sellotape. It was headed, in blue letters, Criminal Justice Department. Beneath was written, 
All detained persons will be thoroughly searched by the custody officer. If you have any prohibited items on your person or in your property, tell the custody and arresting officers now. Then he read another sign above the second green door. No mobile phones to be used in the custody area. A third notice said, You have been arrested. You will have your fingerprints, photograph, DNA taken right away. The two detectives sat down. Bishop remained standing. Anger was raging inside him. But, he reasoned, he was dealing with two robots. There was nothing to be gained by losing his rag. He just had to ride this out for the moment. Can you tell me what all this is about? He was addressing both of them. But the door was sliding open as he spoke. Branson walked through. DC Nicol gestured with his hand for Bishop to follow. This way, please, sir. Bishop entered a large circular room, dominated by an elevated central pod, like a command centre that could have been a set for Star Trek, he thought, surprised by how futuristic it looked. It was constructed from a shiny speckled grey composite that reminded him of the granite work surfaces Katie had chosen for their insanely expensive kitchen. Several men and women, some police officers and some Reliance security staff, dressed in uniform white shirts with black epaulettes, manned individual workstations around the pod. Around the outside of the intensely brightly lit room were heavy-duty green doors with some internal windows looking onto waiting rooms. There was an air of quiet, orderly calm. Bishop noticed the pod had been designed with extended arms in front of each workstation to create an area affording some privacy. A tattooed, shaven-headed youth in baggy clothes stood dejectedly between two uniformed police officers, in one of them now. It all felt totally surreal. Then he was escorted across to the central console, into a marbled portion space with a counter that was neck high. Behind it sat a plump, crew-cut man in shirt sleeves. His black tie was clipped with a gold English rugby team pin that Bishop, who was a debenture holder at Twickenham, recognised. On a blue video monitor screen, set into the face of the counter, just below his eye level, Bishop read, Brighton Detainee Handling Centre. Don't let past offences come back to haunt you. A police officer will speak to you about admitting other crimes you have committed. Branson outlined to the custody officer the circumstances of Bishop's arrest. Then the shirt sleeve man was speaking directly, from his elevated seating position, down at him, in a flat voice devoid of emotion. Mr. Bishop, I am the custody officer. You have heard what has been said. I am satisfied that your arrest is lawful and necessary. I am authorising your detention for the purpose of securing and preserving evidence, and so you can be interviewed regarding the allegation. Bishop nodded, lost for the moment, for a reply. The custody officer handed him a folded yellow A4 sheet, headed, Sussex Police, Notice of Rights and Entitlements. You may find this helpful, sir. You have the right to have someone informed of your arrest and to see a solicitor. Would you like us to provide you with a duty solicitor, or do you have your own? Can you please phone Mr. Glenn Mission and tell him that I won't be able to come to dinner tonight? May I have his number? Bishop gave it to him. Then he said, I would like to speak to my own solicitor, Robert Vernon, at Ellis, Cheryl and Ansel. I will make those calls, the custody officer said. In the meantime, I am authorising your arresting officer, Detective Sergeant Branson, to search you. The custody officer then produced two green plastic trays. To his horror, Bishop saw D.S. Branson pulling on a pair of latex surgical gloves. Branson began patting him down, starting with his head. From Bishop's breast pocket, the D.S. removed his reading glasses and placed them in one tray. Hey, I need those. I can't read without them, Bishop said. I'm sorry, sir, Branson replied. I have to remove these for your own safety. Don't be ridiculous. It may be at a later stage that the custody officer will allow you to keep them with you, but for now they need to go into your property bag, Branson replied. Don't be fucking stupid. I'm not about to kill myself, and how the hell am I supposed to read this document without them, he said, flapping the A4 sheet at him. If you have reading difficulties, I'll arrange for someone to read it aloud to you, sir. Look, come on, let's be reasonable about this. Ignoring Bishop's repeated pleas to have his glasses returned, Branson removed the man's hotel key, wallet, mobile phone and Blackberry, placing each object in turn in a tray. 
The custody officer noted each item, counting the amount of cash in the wallet and writing that down separately. Branson removed Bishop's wedding band, his Mark Jacobs wristwatch and a copper bracelet from his right wrist and placed those in a tray also. Then the custody officer handed Bishop a form, listing his possessions and a biro to sign with. Look, Bishop said, signing with clear reluctance. I'm happy to come in here and help you with your inquiries, but this is ridiculous. You've got to leave me with the tools of my trade. I must have email and my phone and my glasses, for God's sake. Ignoring him, Glenn Branson said to the custody officer, In view of the gravity of the offence and the suspect's potential involvement, we are asking to seize this person's clothing. Yes, I authorise that, the custody officer said. What the fuck? Bishop shouted. What do you... With each of them holding one of his arms, Branson and Nicole escorted him away from the console and out through yet another dark green door. They walked up a sloping floor with dark cream walls on either side and a red panic strip running the whole length on the left, past a yellow bollard printed with a warning triangle showing a figure falling over and in large letters the words, Cleaning in Progress. Then they rounded a corner into the corridor containing the custody cells. And now, as he saw the row of cell doors, Bishop began to panic. I, I'm, I'm claustrophobic. I, I... There'll be someone to keep an eye on you round the clock, sir, Nick Nichols said gently. They stepped to one side to allow a woman pushing a trolley laden with dog-eared paperbacks to pass, then stopped outside a cell door that was partially open. Glenn Branson pushed it wider open and went through. Nickel, holding Bishop's arm firmly, followed. The first thing that struck Bishop as he entered was the overpowering, sickly smell of disinfectant. He stared around the small, oblong room, bewildered. Stared at the cream walls, the brown floor, the same hard bench as in the holding room, topped in the same fake granite surface as in the pod outside, and a thin blue mattress on top of that. He stared at the barred, borrowed light window with no view at all, at the observation mirror, out of reach on the ceiling, that was angled towards the door, and at the CCTV camera, also out of reach, pointing down at him as if he was a participant in Big Brother. There was a modern-looking lavatory, with more fake granite for the seat and a flush button on the wall, and a surprisingly modern-looking wash basin, finished in the same speckled material. He noticed an intercom speaker grill with two control knobs, an air vent covered in mesh, the glass panel in the door. Christ! He felt a lump in his throat. T.C. Nickel was holding a bundle in his arm, which he began to unfold. Bishop saw it was a blue paper jumpsuit. A young man in his twenties, dressed in a white shirt bearing the Reliance security emblem and black trousers, came to the doorway holding a clutch of brown evidence bags, which he handed to D.S. Branson. Then Branson closed the cell door. Mr. Bishop, he said, please remove all your clothes, including your socks and underwear. I want my solicitor. He is being contacted. He pointed at the intercom grill. As soon as the custody officer reaches him, he'll be patched through to you here. Bishop began stripping. D.C. Nickel placed each item inside a separate evidence bag. Even each sock had its own bag. When he was stark naked, Branson handed him the paper jumpsuit and a pair of black slip-on plimsolls. Just as he got the jumpsuit on and buttoned up, the intercom crackled sharply into life and he heard the calm, assured, but concerned voice of Robert Vernon. With a mixture of relief and embarrassment, Bishop padded over in his bare feet. Robert, he said, thanks for calling me. Thank you so much. Are you all right? his solicitor asked. No, I'm not. Uh, look, Brian, I... Imagine this is very distressing for you. I've had a little bit of a briefing from the custody officer, but obviously I don't have all the facts. Can you get me out of here? I'll do everything I can for you as your friend, but I'm not an expert in this area of law, and you must have an expert. We don't really have anyone in my firm. Uh, the best chap down here is someone I know. His name's Leighton Lloyd. A very good reputation. How quickly can you get hold of him, Robert? Bishop was suddenly aware that he was alone in the cell, and the door had been closed. I'm going to try right away, and I hope he's not on holiday. The police want to start interviewing you tonight. So far, they've just brought you in for questioning, so they can only hold you for 24 hours, I think it is. 
with another possible 12-hour extension. Don't speak to anyone or do or say anything until Leighton gets to you. What happens if he's away? he asked, panicky. There are some other good people, don't worry. I want the best, Robert, the very best. Money's no object. It's ridiculous. I shouldn't be here. It's absolutely insane. I don't know what the hell's going on. I'd better jump off the line, Brian, the solicitor said, a little tersely. I need to get cracking for you. Of course, Bishop thanked him. Then the intercom fell silent. He realized he was alone now, and the door had been shut. The cell was completely silent, as if he were in a soundproof box. He sat down on the blue mattress and pushed his feet into the plimsolls. They were too tight and pinched his toes. Something was bothering him about Robert Vernon. Why wasn't the man sounding more sympathetic? From his tone just now, it was almost as if he'd been expecting this to happen. Why? The door opened and he was led into a room where he was photographed. His fingerprints were taken on an electronic pad and a DNA swab was taken from the inside of his mouth. Then he was returned to his cell and his bewildered thoughts. Chapter 85 For some officers, a career in the police force meant a constant, not always predictable, series of changes. You could be moved from a uniform beat patrol one day to the local support unit the next, executing arrest warrants and dealing with riots, then into plain clothes as a covert drug squad officer, then out at Gatwick Airport, seconded to baggage crimes. Others found their niche the way a snake finds its hole or a squid finds its crevice in a sea wall and stayed put in it all the way through their thirty years to retirement, and, the bait on the hook, a very decent pension, thank you. Detective Sergeant Jane Paxton was one of those who had found their niche and stayed in it. She was a large, plain-faced woman of forty, with lank brown hair and a brusque, no-nonsense attitude, who worked as an interview coordinator. She had endeared herself to the entire female staff of Sussex House some years ago, legend had it, when she slapped Norman Potting on the face. Depending on who you talked to, there were half a dozen versions of what had happened. The one that Grace had heard was that Potting had put his hand on her thigh under the table during a meeting with the previous chief constable. D.S. Paxton was now sitting opposite Grace at the round table in his office, wearing a loose-fitting blouse so voluminous it gave the appearance that her head was sticking out the top of a tent. On either side of her sat Nick Nicol and Glenn Branson, D.S. Paxton was drinking water. The three men were drinking coffee. It was 8.30 on Monday evening, and all four of them knew they would be lucky to get out of the CID headquarters before midnight. While Brian Bishop was alone, contemplating his navel in his custody block cell, awaiting the arrival of his solicitor, the team were creating their interview policy for Bishop's interrogation. Branson and Nicol, who had both received specialist training and in interviewing techniques, would carry out the series of interviews. Roy Grace and Jane Paxton would watch from an observation room. The textbook procedure was to put suspects through three consecutive, strategized interviews within the 24-hour period they could hold the person in custody. The first, which would take place tonight after the suspect's solicitor had arrived, would be mostly Bishop talking, setting down his facts. He would be encouraged to establish his story, his family background, and give an account of his movements during the 24 hours immediately before his wife's death. In the second interview, which would take place in the morning, there would be specific questions on all that Bishop had said in the first interview. The tone would be kept courteous and constructive, while all the time the officers would be making notes of any inconsistencies. It was not until the third interview, which would follow later in the day, after Bishop and the team had had a break, and the team had had a chance to assess everything, that the gloves would come off. In that third interview, any inconsistencies or suspected lies would be challenged. The hope was that by the end of that third interview, information extracted from the suspect, combined with whatever evidence they already had, such as the DNA in this instance, would give them enough for one of the Crown Prosecution solicitors, who operated from an office in the CPS headquarters in Dyke Road, to agree there was sufficient evidence to potentially secure a conviction and to sanction the suspect being formally charged. Key to any successful interrogation were the questions that needed to be asked 
and very importantly, what information would be held back. They were all agreed that the sighting of Bishop's Bentley heading towards Brighton shortly before Mrs. Bishop's murder should be held back to the third interview. Then they debated for some time when to raise the question of the life insurance policy. Grace pointed out that since Bishop had already been questioned about this and had denied all knowledge of the policy, it should be revisited as part of the first interview to see if he changed his story at all. It was agreed to spring the gas mask on him during the second interview. Jane Paxton suggested it be raised as part of a series of specific questions about Bishop's sex life with his wife. The others agreed. Grace asked Branson and Nicol for a detailed account of how Bishop had behaved under arrest and his attitude generally. Well, he's a bit of a cold fish, Branson said. I couldn't believe it when me and Nick went to break the news about his wife being found dead. He looked for confirmation to Nicol, who nodded. Branson continued. Yeah, OK, he did the grief bit to start with. But you know what he said next? He looked at Grace, then Paxton. He said, this is really not a good time. I'm halfway through a golf tournament. Can you believe it? If anything, I think that comment works the other way, Grace replied. All of them looked at the detective superintendent with interest. What other way? Branson asked. From what I've seen of him, Bishop's too smart to have made such a callous, potentially incriminating remark, Grace replied. It's more the kind of remark of someone who is totally bewildered, which would indicate the shock was genuine. You're saying you think he's innocent? Jane Paxton asked. No. What I'm saying is we have some strong evidence against this man. Let's stick to the hard facts for the moment. A comment like that could be useful during the trial. The prosecuting counsel could use it to help sway the jury against Bishop. We should keep it back, not bring it up at any of the interviews, because he'll probably say you've misunderstood him, and then you've blown his surprise value. Good point, Nick Nicholl said, and yawned, apologising immediately. Grace knew it was harsh, keeping Nicholl here until late, with his young baby at home, but that wasn't his problem. Nicholl was exactly the right soft man foil to Branson's hard man for this series of interviews. The next item on my list, Jane Paxton said, is Bishop's relationship with Sophie Harrington? Definitely the third interview, Grace said. No, I think we should bring it up in a second, Branson replied. We could ask him again whether he knew her, and if so, what their relationship was. It will give us a good steer on how truthful he is, whether or not he still denies knowing her, right? It's a good point, Grace said. But he'll know that we're analysing all his phone calls, so he'd have to be pretty stupid to deny knowing her. Yeah, but I think it's worth asking him in the second interview, Branson persisted. My reasoning is this. We got that witness opposite Sophie Harrington's house, who was positively identified him at around the time of her murder. Depending on how he answers the phone question in the second interview, we can spring that on him in the third. Grace looked at Jane Paxton. She was nodding in agreement. OK, he said. Good plan. His internal phone rang. He stepped away from the table and over to his desk to answer it. Roy Grace? He listened for some moments, then said, Fine, OK, thanks. We'll be ready. He replaced the phone and joined them back at the round table. Bishop Solicitor will be here at half past nine. He glanced at his watch. Forty-five minutes. Who is it? Jane Paxton asked. Leighton Lloyd. Yeah, well, Branson shrugged. Who else? They turned their focus on exactly what Lloyd would be told, and what at this stage would be held back from him. Then the four of them left the building and walked briskly to the Asda supermarket, taking a short cut through the bushes at the back to grab a quick sandwich for their evening meal. Ten minutes later they crossed back over the road. Branson and Nicol walked through the side gate and up towards the custody block. Inside, they were taken to an interview room, where they would outline to Bishop's solicitor the background and why Bishop had been arrested without Bishop present. Then he would be brought into the room, too, for an interview. Jane Paxton and Grace went back to their respective offices, Grace intending to use the next half hour to catch up on some emails. He sat at his desk and rang Cleo, and discovered she was still at work at the mortuary. Hi, you, she said, sounding pleased to hear from him. How are you, he said. Oh, I'm shattered, but it's nice that you rang. I like your voice when you're tired. It goes sort of croaky. 
It's sweet. You wouldn't think that if you saw me. I feel about a hundred. And you? What's happening? He filled her in briefly, telling her he wouldn't be finished until around midnight, and asked if she'd like him to come over then. I would love to see you, my darling, but as soon as I'm out of here I'm going to fall into a bath and then crash. Why don't you come over tomorrow? Sounds like a plan. Are you eating properly? she asked, motherly suddenly. Have you had some dinner? Sort of, he said evasively. An Asda pop noodle? A sandwich, he confessed. That's not healthy. And what kind of sandwich? Beef. God, Roy, fatty meat and carbohydrate. It had a lettuce leaf in it. Oh, well, that's all right then, she said sarcastically. Then her voice changed. Can you hang on a sec? There's someone outside the building. She sounded worried. Who's there with you? No one. I'm on my own. Poor Darren and Walter came in at four this morning. I sent them home a little while ago. I'm just going to check this out, OK? Call you back in a sec. The phone went dead. Chapter 86 I received a letter this morning from someone called Lawrence Abramson at a firm of solicitors in London called Harbottle and Lewis. It is a really unpleasant letter. I recently wrote to the man who looks just like me, who started this company, suggesting that, as it was my idea, and I have all the paperwork from my patent agent, Mr. Christopher Pett at Frank B. Dane's sons, to prove it, he should be paying me a royalty on his revenues. Mr. Abramson is threatening to obtain an injunction against me if I ever approach his client again. I'm really very angry. Chapter 87 Leighton Lloyd looked as if he'd had a hard day. Exuding a faint smell of tobacco smoke, he was sitting in this windowless, airless, enclosed interview room, dressed in an expensive-looking but crumpled grey suit, cream shirt and a sharp silk tie. A well-travelled leather attaché case was on the floor beside him, from which he extracted a black, lined A4 notebook. Lloyd was a lean, wiry man, with close-cropped hair and an alert, predatory face that reminded Branson a little of the actor Robert Carlyle when he was playing a Bond villain in The World Is Not Enough. Branson got a kick out of matching a movie villain's face to all lawyers, and he found it helped him to avoid feeling intimidated by them, particularly when being cross-examined by defence barristers in court. Plenty of officers got on fine with solicitors. They took it in their stride, saying that it was all a game that sometimes they won, sometimes they lost. But for Branson, it was more personal than that. He knew that criminal solicitors and barristers were only doing their job and formed an important part of the freedoms of the British nation. But for nearly a decade before joining the police, he'd worked several nights a week as a nightclub bouncer in this city. He'd seen and tangled with just about every bit of scum imaginable, from drunk braggarts to ugly gangsters to some very smart criminals. He felt an intense obligation to try to make this city a better place for his own children to grow up in than it had been for him as a kid. That was his beef with the man sitting opposite him right now, in his handmade suit and his black, tasseled loafers, with his big, swinging dick of a BMW parked out front, and no doubt a flash, secluded house somewhere in one of Hove's swankier streets, all paid for out of the rich pickings from keeping scumbags out of jail and on the streets. Branson's mood had not been improved by a blazing row with his wife, Ari, on his mobile phone as he walked over to the custody block. He called to say goodnight to the children, and she had pointed out acidly that they had been asleep in bed for some time, to which his response, that it was not much fun still being at work at nine o'clock, received a torrent of sarcasm, which had then degenerated into a shouting match, ending with Ari hanging up on him. Nick Nicole closed the door, pulled up a chair opposite Branson and sat down. Lloyd had positioned himself at the head of the table, as if arranging the stage to assert himself from the get-go. The solicitor made a note in his black book with a rollerball pen. So, gentlemen, what information do you have for me? He spoke in a brisk, clipped voice, his tone polite but firm. Above them, an air-conditioning unit was starting, noisily, to pump out cool air. 
Lloyd made Branson nervous. The detective could deal with brute force, no problem, but cunning intellects always unnerved him, and Lloyd was observing everyone with an inscrutable, unreadable expression. He spoke slowly, articulating each word as if he were addressing a child, thinking very carefully about what he was going to say next. We have uh, spoken to Mr. Bishop over the last four days, as you would appreciate is normal in these circumstances, in order to get background information regarding himself and his wife. There is some information that we've been given, which we'll be covering during the interview, concerning his movements and location around the time of the murder. OK, Leighton Lloyd said, a tad impatiently, as if flagging that he wasn't here to listen to Waffle. Can you bring me up to speed on why my client has been arrested? Branson then handed him the pre-interview disclosure document that had been prepared. If you would like to read this, we can go through any questions you may have. Lloyd reached across the desk and took the short document, a single A4 sheet, and read it in silence. Then he read parts of it out aloud. Possible strangulation by ligature, subject to further pathology tests. We have certain DNA evidence which will form part of the interview. He looked up at the two officers for a moment, then continued reading out loud, his voice now sounding quizzical. We have reason to believe that Mr. Bishop has not been telling the complete truth. Accordingly, we wish to put certain questions to him under caution. The solicitor dropped the sheet back down on the table. Can you put any flesh on this document? he asked Branson. How much information do you have? Branson asked. Very little. Obviously, I've been following the report on the murder of Mrs. Bishop in the papers and on the news, but I haven't spoken to my client yet. For the next twenty minutes, Lloyd quizzed the police officers. He started by asking about the cleaning lady and the details of the crime scene. Glenn Branson gave him the very minimum information he felt he needed to. He outlined the circumstances surrounding the discovery of Katie Bishop's body and the pathologist's estimate of the approximate time of death, but held back the information about the gas mask, and he firmly refused to reveal any information on their DNA evidence. The solicitor finished by trying to trip up Branson into revealing why they believed that Brian Bishop had not been telling the truth, but Branson would not be drawn. Has my client given you an alibi? he asked. Yes, he has, Branson replied, and presumably you're not satisfied with it. The detective sergeant hesitated, then said, That is something we will be dealing with during the interview process. Lloyd made another note with a rollerball pen in his book. Then he smiled at Branson. Is there anything else you can tell me at this stage? Branson glanced at Nicole and shook his head. Right, I'd like to see my client now. Chapter 88 It was now almost completely dark outside. Distractedly, Roy Grace ran his eye down the pages and pages on his screen of today's incident reports log, looking for anything that might be relevant to the two cases. He found nothing. He scanned through his email inbox, deleted several where he'd just been copied in, and fired off a few quick responses. Then he looked at his watch. It was fifteen minutes since Cleo had said she would call him right back. He felt a sudden knot of anxiety in his stomach, thinking how much he cared for her, how he could not bear the thought of anything happening to her. As Sandy had been for so many years, Cleo was starting to feel like the rock to which his life was moored. A good, solid, beautiful, funny, loving, caring and wise rock. But sometimes in shadow, not sunlight. Roy. This is not the woman Leslie and I saw last week. We really are convinced we saw Sandy. Best, Dick. God, he thought. It would have been so much simpler if Dick had replied to him that yes, this was the woman they had seen. It still wouldn't have given him the closure he sought, but at least it would have put Munich back in its box. Now it was drawing him towards another journey there. But at this moment, he wasn't able to think about that. He was remembering only too vividly that some creep had slashed the roof of Cleo's MG yesterday, in broad daylight, outside the mortuary. The place attracted every imaginable kind of weirdo and sicko, 
of which Brighton had more than its fair share. He still found it hard to understand how she could enjoy working there as much as she claimed she did. Sure, you could get used to just about anything, but that didn't mean you could like anything. Car roofs mostly got slashed in urban streets, either by people breaking in to steal something or by swaggering yobs late at night, high or drunk, who were passing by. People didn't pass by the mortuary car park, especially not on a hot Sunday afternoon. Nothing had been stolen from the car. It was just a nasty, malicious piece of vandalism. Probably some lowlife jealous of the car. But was that person outside the mortuary now? Call me. Please call me. He opened an attachment and tried to read through the agenda for this year's International Homicide Investigators Association Annual Symposium in New Orleans, now just a few weeks away. It was impossible to concentrate. Then his phone rang. Grabbing it, he blurted in relief. Hi. But it was Jane Paxton, telling him that Bishop was about to see his solicitor, and she was heading over to the observation room at the custody block. She suggested that he come over in about ten minutes. Chapter 89 Brian Bishop sat alone in his silent cell, hunched forward on the edge of the bench that was also the bed. He could not remember ever feeling so low in his entire life. It seemed that half his world had been ripped away from him, and the other half was turning against him. Even gentle, non-judgmental Robert Vernon had sounded less friendly than usual on the phone earlier. Why? Had word got round that he was damaged goods, to be left alone, poisonous to touch? Would it be Glenn and Barbara next, and the other couple he and Katie saw a lot of, Ian and Tarina, and the rest of the people he had once considered his friends? His blue paper suit felt tight under the armpits, and his toes could barely move inside the plimsolls, but he didn't care. This was all a bad dream, and sometime soon he was going to wake up, and Katie would be all big smiles, sitting up in bed next to him, reading the Daily Mail gossip column, the page she always turned to first, a cup of tea beside her. In his hands he held the yellow sheet he'd been given, squinting at the blurred words, struggling to read them without his glasses. Sussex Police, Notice of Rights and Entitlement, Remember Your Rights. His cell door was opened suddenly by a pasty-faced man of about thirty, with no neck and the physique of a jelly baby who looked as if he used to pump iron but had recently let his muscles run to fat. He was wearing the Reliance security uniform of monogrammed white shirt with black epaulets, black tie and black trousers, and was perspiring heavily. He spoke in a courteous, slightly squeaky voice, avoiding eye contact, as if this was standard practice for addressing the scum behind the barred doors of this place. Mr. Bishop, your solicitor is here. I'll take you through to him. Walk in front of me, please. Bishop walked as directed from behind, navigating a network of blank, cream corridors, the only relief on the walls being the continuous red panic strip set in a metal rim. Then he entered the interview room, which Branson and Nickel had temporarily vacated to allow him privacy with his lawyer. Leighton Lloyd shook his hand and ushered him to a seat. He then checked that all the recording and monitoring equipment was switched off before sitting back down himself. Thank you for coming over, Bishop said. The solicitor gave him a sympathetic smile, and Bishop found himself instantly warming to the man, although he knew at this moment he would have probably warmed to Attila the Hun if he'd said he was here to help. That's my job, Lloyd said. So, have you been treated all right? I don't have much to compare with, Bishop said, attempting a stab of humour that bypassed the lawyer. Actually, there's one thing I'm really angry about. They took my reading glasses. Normal, I'm afraid. Oh, great. So if I had contact lenses, I could keep those, but because I choose to have reading glasses, I'm now not able to read anything. I'll do my best to get them back for you quickly. He noted this down in his book. So, Mr. Bishop, I'm conscious that it's late and you're tired. Uh, the police want to conduct one interview tonight. We'll keep it as brief as we can. Then they'll continue again tomorrow morning. How long am I going to be here? Can you get me out on bail? I can only apply for bail if you're charged, 
The police are entitled to keep you here for 24 hours without charging you, and they can get a further 12 hours extension. After that, they have to release you, charge you, or go to court to apply for further time. So I could be in here until Wednesday morning. Yes, I'm afraid so. Bishop fell silent. Lloyd held up a sheet of paper. Uh, this is what's called the pre-interview disclosure document. It is a summary of the information the police are prepared to let us have at this stage. If you're having problems reading, would you like me to read it aloud to you? Bishop nodded. He felt sick and so drained that he did not even have the will to speak. The lawyer read out the contents, then expanded, filling him in on the little extra that had been able to glean from D.S. Branson. Is that all clear? he asked Bishop when he had finished. Bishop nodded again. Hearing the words were making everything worse. They sank like dark stones deep into his soul, and his gloom deepened even more. He felt as if he was sitting at the bottom of the deepest mine shaft in the world. For the next few minutes, Bishop was briefed on the questions he would probably be asked at his first interview, and how he would reply. The solicitor told him to speak economically, be helpful, but to give short answers. If there were any questions that either of them felt were inappropriate, the solicitor would step in. He also asked Bishop about his health, whether he was up to the ordeal ahead, or whether he needed to see a doctor or to have any medication. Bishop told him he was fine. There's one final question I have to ask, Leighton Lloyd said. Did you murder your wife? No, absolutely not. That's ridiculous. I loved her. Why would I kill her? No, I didn't. I really didn't. You have to believe me. I just don't know what's going on. The solicitor smiled. Okay, that's good enough for me. Chapter 90 As Grace walked across the tarmac separating the back entrance of Sussex House from the custody centre, passing a row of wheelie bins, shadows jumped inside his mind. His mobile phone was clamped to his ear, and the knot of anxiety inside his gullet was tightening more and more. His mouth was dry with worry. It was now over twenty minutes. Why hadn't Cleo called back? He listened as her mobile phone went yet again straight to voicemail without ringing, then dialed the mortuary phone. As before, it was picked up on the fourth ring by the answering machine. He toyed with just jumping in a car and driving over there, but that would be irresponsible. He had to be here, scrutinising the interview all the way through. So he phoned the resourcing centre and explained to the controller who he was and what his concerns were. To his relief, the man replied that there was a unit in that part of the city at the moment, so he would send it straight up to the mortuary. Grace asked if he could call him back, or have one of the officers in the patrol car call him when they were on site to let him know the situation. He had a bad feeling about this. Really bad. Even though he knew Cleo always kept the mortuary doors locked, and there were security cameras, he did not like the idea of her being there alone at night, particularly not after what had happened yesterday. Then, holding his security card up to the grey Interflex eye beside the door, he entered the custody centre, walked across past the central pod, where, as usual, some sad bit of lowlife, this one a skinny, rusty youth in a grubby vest, camouflaged trousers and sandals, was being booked in, and headed through an internal security door up the stairs to the first floor. Jane Paxton was already seated in the small observation room in front of the colour monitor, which was switched on but blank. Both the video and audio would be off to give Brian Bishop privacy with his lawyer until the interview formally started. She had thoughtfully brought over two bottles of water for them. Grace put his notepad on the work surface in front of his empty chair, then went down to the small kitchenette at the end of the corridor and made himself a mug of strong coffee. It was a cheap brand in a big tin that looked like it had been there a while and smelled stale. Some prat had left the milk out and it had gone off so he left his coffee black. As he carried it back into the room, he said, You didn't want any tea or coffee, did you? Never use them, she said primly, with a faint reprimand in her voice, as if he'd just offered some Class A drugs. As he set his mug down, the speaker crackled and the monitor flickered into life. Now he could see the four men in the interview room, Branson, Nickel, Bishop and Lloyd. 
three of them had removed their jackets. The two detectives had their ties on, but their shirt sleeves rolled up. In the observation room, they had a choice of two cameras, and Grace switched to the one that gave him the best view of Bishop's face. Addressing Bishop, with the occasional deferential glance at the man's solicitor, Glenn Branson started with the standard opening of all interview sessions with suspects. This interview is being recorded on tape and video, and this can be monitored remotely. Grace caught his fleeting, cheeky, upward glance. Branson again cautioned Bishop, who nodded. It is 10.15pm, Monday 7th of August, he continued. I am Detective Sergeant Branson. Can each of you identify yourselves for the benefit of the tape? Brian Bishop, Leighton Lloyd and D.C. Nicol then introduced themselves. When they'd finished, Branson continued, Mr. Bishop, can you run us through, in as much detail as possible, your movements during the 24 hours leading up to the time when D.S. Nicol and myself came to see you at the North Brighton Golf Club on Friday morning? Grace watched intently as Brian Bishop gave his account. He prefaced it by stating that it was normal for him to take the train to London early on Monday mornings, spend the week alone at his flat in Notting Hill, working late, often with evening meetings, and return to Brighton on Friday evenings for the weekend. Last week, he said, because he had a golf tournament that began early on Friday morning as part of his club's centenary celebrations, he had driven to London late on Sunday evening in order to have his car up there so that he could drive straight down to the golf club on Friday morning. Grace noted this exception to Bishop's normal routine down on his pad. Bishop related his day at work at the Hanover Square offices of his company, International Rostering Solutions PLC, until the evening when he'd walked down to Piccadilly to meet his financial advisor, Phil Taylor, for dinner at a restaurant called the Wolseley. Phil Taylor, he explained, organised his personal annual tax planning. After dinner, he had left the restaurant and gone home to his flat, a little later than he'd planned, and having drunk rather more than he'd intended. He'd slept badly, he explained, partly as a result of two large espressos and a brandy, and partly because he was worried about oversleeping and arriving late at the golf club the next morning. Keeping rigidly to his script, Branson went back over the account, asking for specific details here and there, in particular regarding the people he'd spoken to during the day. He asked him if he could recall speaking to his wife, and Bishop replied that he had, at around 2 p.m., when Katie had rung him to discuss the purchase of some plants for the garden, as Bishop was planning a Sunday lunch garden party early in September for his executive. Bishop added that he'd phoned British Telecom for a wake-up call at 5.30 a.m. when he'd arrived home after his dinner with Phil Taylor. As Grace was in the middle of writing that down, his mobile phone rang. It was a young sounding officer who introduced himself as PC David Curtis, telling him they were outside the Brighton and Hove mortuary, that the lights of the premises were off, and everything looked quiet and in order. Grace stepped outside the room and asked him if he could see a blue MG sports car outside. PC Curtis told him that the parking area was empty. Grace thanked him and hung up. Immediately, he dialed Cleo's home number. She answered on the second ring. Hi, she said breezily. How's it going? You okay? he asked, relieved beyond belief at hearing her voice. Me? Fine. I've got a glass of wine in my hand and I'm about to dive into my bath she said sleepily. How are you? I've been worried out my wits. Why? Why? Jesus, you said there was someone outside the mortuary. You were going to call me straight back. I was... I thought... Just a couple of drunks, she said. They were looking for Woodvale Cemetery, mumbling about going to pay their respects to their mother. Don't do this to me, he said. Do what? she asked, all innocence. He shook his head, smiling in relief. Oh, I have to get back. Of course you do. You're an important detective on a big case. Now you're taking the piss. Already had one of those when I got home. Now I'm going to have my bath. Night-night. He walked back into the observation room, smiling, exasperated and relieved. Have I missed anything? he asked Jane Paxton. She shook her head. D.S. Branson's good, she said. Tell him that later. He needs a boost. His ego's on the floor. What is it with you men in ego? she asked him. Grace looked at her head, poking out of her tent of a blouse, 
her double chin and her flat-ironed hair, and then at the wedding band and solitaire ring on her podgy finger. Doesn't your husband have an ego? He wouldn't bloody dare. Chapter 91 The time billionaire knew all about happy pills, but he had never taken one. No need. Hey, who needed happy pills when you could come home on a Monday night to find the postman had delivered to your doormat the workshop manual for a 2005 MGTF sports car that you'd ordered on Saturday? It was the last year that this model was manufactured before MG ceased production and were brought up by a Chinese company. It was the model that Cleo Mori drove. Navy blue. Now fitted with its matching blue hardtop, despite the blistering hot weather, because some jerk had vandalised the soft-top roof with a knife. What a son of a bitch. What a creep. What a goddamn piece of low-life shit. And it was Tuesday morning. One of the days that the stupid, grumpy cleaning woman with the ungrateful daughter didn't come. She had told him that herself yesterday. Best of all, Brian Bishop had been arrested. It was the front-page splash of the morning edition of the Argus. It was on the local radio. It would be on the local television news for sure. Maybe even the national news. Joy. What goes around comes around. Like the wheels of a car. Cleo Mori's car. Cleo Mori had the top of the range, the TF-160, with its variable valve-controlled engine. He listened to it now. 1.8 litres revving up sweetly in the cool, early morning air. Eight o'clock. She worked long hours. Had to credit her that. Now she was pulling out of her parking space, driving up the street, holding first gear too long, but maybe she was enjoying the echoing blatter of the exhaust. Getting in through the front gates of the courtyard development where Cleo Mori lived was a no-brainer. Just four numbers on a touchpad. He'd picked those up easily enough by watching other residents returning home through his binoculars from the comfort of his car. The courtyard was empty. If any nosy neighbour was peeking from behind their blinds, they would have seen the same neatly dressed man with his clipboard, the seaboard crest on his jacket pocket, as yesterday, and assumed he had come to recheck the gas meter or something. His freshly cut key turned sweetly in the lock, thanks to God's help. He stepped inside into the large, open-plan downstairs area and shut the door behind him. The silence smelled of furniture polish and freshly ground coffee beans. He heard the faint hum of the fridge. He looked around, taking everything in, which he'd not had the time to do yesterday, not with the grumpy woman on his back. He saw cream walls hung with abstract paintings that he did not understand. Modern rugs scattered on a shiny oak floor, two red sofas, black lacquered furniture, a big television, an expensive stereo system, a copy of Sussex Life magazine on a side table, and unlit candles, dozens of them, dozens and bloody dozens, on silver sticks, in opaque glass pots, in vases. Was she a religious freak? Did she hold black masses? Another good reason why she had to go. God would be happy to be rid of her. Then he saw the square glass fish tank on a coffee table, with a goldfish swimming around what looked like the remains of a miniature Greek temple. You need releasing, the time billionaire said. It's wrong to keep animals imprisoned. He wandered across to a water-sealing row of crammed bookshelves. He saw Graham Greene's Brighton Rock, then a James Herbert novel, Nobody True, a Natasha Cooper crime novel, several Ian Rankin books, and an Edward Marston historical thriller. Wow, he said aloud. We have the same taste in literature. Too bad we'll never get a chance to discuss books. You know, in different circumstances, you and I might have been pretty good friends. Then he opened the drawer in a table. It contained elastic bands, a book of parking vouchers, a broken garage opener remote control, a solitary battery, envelopes. He rummaged through, but he did not find what he was looking for. He closed it. Then he looked around, opened two more drawers, closed them again, without luck. The drawers in the kitchen yielded nothing either. His hand was still hurting, stinging all the time, getting worse despite the pills. And he had a headache. 
His head throbbed constantly, and he was feeling a little feverish, but it was nothing he couldn't cope with. He wandered upstairs slowly, taking his time. Cleo Mori had only just gone to work. He had all the time in the world. Hours of the stuff, if he wanted. On the second floor, he found a small bathroom. Opposite was her den. He went in. It was a chaotically untidy room, lined again with crammed bookshelves. Almost all of the books seemed to be on philosophy. A desk piled with papers, with a laptop in the middle of them, sat in front of a window overlooking the rooftops of Brighton towards the sea. He opened each drawer of the desk, tidily inspecting the contents before closing them carefully. Then he opened and shut each of the four drawers of the metal filing cabinet. Her bedroom was on the next floor, on the other side of a spiral staircase that appeared to lead up to the roof. He went in and sniffed her bed. Then he pulled back the purple counterpane and pressed his nose into her pillows, inhaling deeply. The scents tightened his groin. Carefully, he peeled back the duvet, sniffing every inch of the sheet. More of her. More of her still. No sense of Detective Superintendent Grace. No semen stains from him on the sheet. Just her scents and smells. Hers alone. Left there for him to savour. He replaced the duvet, then the counterpane carefully. So carefully. No one would ever know he had been here. There was a modern black lacquered dressing table in the room. He opened its one drawer, and there, nestling in between her jewellery boxes, he saw it. The black leather fob with the letters M.G. embossed in gold. The two shiny unused keys, and the ring that was hooped through them. He closed his eyes and said a brief prayer of thanks to God, who had guided him to them. Then he held up the keys to his lips and kissed them. Beautiful! He closed the drawer, pocketed the keys and went back downstairs, then made his way straight over to the fish tank. He pushed up the cuff of his jacket, then the sleeve of his shirt, and sank his hand into the tepid water. It was like trying to grab hold of soap in the bathtub, but finally he managed to grip the wriggling, slippery goldfish, closing his fingers around the stupid creature. Then he tossed it onto the floor. He heard it flipping around as he let himself back out of the front door. Chapter 92 The joint morning briefing for Operations Chameleon and Mistral ended shortly after nine o'clock. There was a mood of optimism now that a suspect was in custody, and this was heightened by the fact that there was a witness, the elderly lady who lived opposite Sophie Harrington, and had identified Brian Bishop outside her house around the time of the murder. With luck, Grace hoped, that DNA analysis on semen present in Sophie Harrington's vagina would match Bishop's. Huntingdon was fast-tracking the analysis, and he should get the results later today. There was now little doubt in anyone's mind that the two murders were linked, but they were still keeping the exact details back from the press. Names of people and times given by Bishop in his first interview were being checked out, and Grace was particularly interested to see whether the British Telecom phone records would confirm that Bishop had requested an early morning alarm call after he'd returned to his flat on Thursday night. Although, of course, that call could have been made by an accomplice. With three million pounds to be gained from the life insurance policy on his wife, the possibility that Bishop had an accomplice, or indeed more than one, had to be carefully explored. He left the conference room, anxious to dictate a couple of letters to Eleanor, his MSA, one regarding preparations for the trial of the odious character Carl Venner, who had been arrested on the last murder case Grace had run. He walked hurriedly along the corridors and through into the large, green-carpeted, partially open plan area that housed all the senior officers of the CID and their support staff. To his surprise, as he went through the security door that separated this area from the major incident suite, he saw a large crowd of people gathered around a desk, including Gary Weston, who was the chief superintendent of Sussex CID and technically his immediate boss, although in reality... It was Alison Vosper to whom he answered mostly. He wondered for a moment if it was a raffle draw or someone's birthday. Then, as he got closer, 
he saw that no one seemed to be in a celebratory mood. Everyone looked as if they were in shock, including Eleanor, who tended to look that way most of the time. What's up? he asked her. You haven't heard? Heard what? About Janet McWhirter. Our Janet from the PNC. Eleanor nodded at him encouragingly through her large glasses, as if she was helping him to a solution in the game of charades. Janet McWhirter had, until four months ago, held a responsible position here in Sussex House as head of the Police National Computer Department, a sizable office of forty people. One of their main functions was information and intelligence gathering for the detectives here. A plain single girl in her mid-thirties, quiet and studious and slightly old-fashioned looking, she had been popular because of her willingness to help, working whatever hours were needed while always remaining polite. She had reminded Grace, both in appearance and in her quietly earnest demeanour, of a dormouse. Janet had surprised everyone back in April when she resigned, saying that she decided to spend a year travelling. Then, very secretively and coyly, she had told her two closest friends in the department that she had met and fallen in love with a man. They were already engaged, and she was emigrating with him to Australia and would get married there. It was Brian Cook, the scientific support branch manager and one of Grace's friends here, who turned to him. She's been found dead, Roy, he said in his blunt voice. Washed up on the beach on Saturday night. Been in the sea some considerable time. She'd just been identified from her dental records, and it looks like she was dead before she went in the water. Grace was silent for a moment, stunned. He'd had a lot of dealings with Janet over the years and really liked her. Shit, he said. For a moment, it was as if a dark cloud had covered the windows and he felt a sudden cold swirl deep inside him. Deaths happened, but something instinctively felt very wrong about this. Doesn't look like she made it to Australia, Cook added sardonically. Or the altar? Cook shrugged. Has the fiancé been contacted? We only heard the news a few minutes ago. He could be dead too, Danny added. You might want to pop along and say something to the team in her department. I imagine they're all going to be extremely upset. I'll do that when I get a gap. Who's going to head the inquiry? Don't know yet. Grace nodded, then led his shocked MSA away from the group and back to her office. He had barely ten minutes to give her his dictation, then get over to the custody centre for the second interview with Brian Bishop. But he couldn't clear the image of Janet McWhirter's plain little face from his mind. She was the most pleasant and helpful person. Why would someone kill her? A mugger? A rapist? Something to do with her work? Mulling on it, he thought to himself, she spends fifteen years working for Sussex Police, much of it in the PNC unit, falls in love with a man, then goes for a career change, a lifestyle change, leaves, then dies. He was a firm believer in always looking at the most obvious things first. He knew where he would start if he was the SIO in her investigation. But at this moment, Janet McWhirter's death, although deeply shocking and sad, was not his problem. Or so he thought. Chapter 93 Jesus, man, will you turn that feckin' bleeding satin thing off? It's been going all bloody morning. Can't you fucking answer it, or summit? Skunk opened one eye, which felt as if it had been hit recently with a hammer. So did his head. It also felt as if someone was sawing through his brain with a cheese wire, and the whole camper seemed to be pitch-poling like a small boat in a storm. Bree, bree, bzz, bzz, bree, bree, bzz. His phone, he realised, was slithering around on the floor, vibrating, flashing, ringing. Answer it yourself, you fuckwit, he mumbled back at his latest unwelcome lodger de jour, some scumbag he'd encountered in a Brighton back cave in the early hours of this morning, who'd bummed a bed off him for the night. This isn't a fucking Hilton. We don't have fucking twenty-four hour room service. If I answered, laddie, it's going straight up your rectum, so feckin' far you'll have to stick your fingers down your chancels to find it. Skunk opened his other eyes well, 
then shut it again as blinding morning sunlight lasered into it through his brain, through the back of his skull, and deep into the earth's core, pinning his head to his sodden, lumpy pillow like a pin through a fly. He closed his eye and made an effort to sit up, which was rewarded by a hard crack on his head from the Luton roof above him. Fuck shit! This was the gratitude he got for letting fucking useless tossers crash in his home. Wide awake now, on the verge of throwing up, he reached out an arm that felt totally disembodied from the rest of him, as if someone had attached it to his shoulder by a few threads during the night. Numb fingers fumbled around on the floor until they found the phone. He lifted it up, hands shaking, his whole body shaking, thumbed the green button and brought it to his ear. Huh? he said. Where the hell have you been, you piece of shit? It was Barry Spiker. And suddenly he was really wide awake, a whole bunch of confused thoughts colliding inside his brain. It's the middle of the fucking night, he said suddenly. Maybe on your planet, shit face. On mine it's eleven in the morning. Missed Holy Communion again, have ya? And then it came to Skunk. Paul Packer. Detective Constable Paul Packer. Suddenly, his morning was feeling a bit better. Recollections of a deal he had made with D.C. Packer were now surfacing through the foggy, drug-starved maelstrom of pain that was in his mind. He was on a promise to Packer to let him know the next time Barry Spiker gave him a job. He would be cutting his nose off despite his face to shop Spiker. But the pleasure the thought gave him overrode that. Spiker had stiffed him on their last deal. Packer had promised him a payment. Cash payments from the police were crap. But if he was really smart, he could do a deal, get paid by Spiker and the police. That would be cool. Ching, ching, ching. Al, his hamster, was busy on his treadmill, going round and round as usual, despite his paw in its splint. Al needed another visit to the vet. He owed money to Beth. Two birds with one stone. Spiker and D.C. Packer. Al and Beth. It was a done deal. Just got back from Mass, actually, he said. Good, I've got a job for you. I'm all ears. That's your fucking problem. All ears, no brains. So what you got for me? Spiker briefed him. I need it tonight, he said. Any time. I'll be there all night. One fifty if you get the spec right this time. You capable of it? I'm fit. Don't fuck up. The phone went dead. Skunk sat up in excitement and nearly split his skull open again on the roof. Fuck, he said. Feck you, Jimmy, came the voice from the far end of his van. Chapter 94 Glenn Branson terminated the second interview with Brian Bishop at 12.20pm. Then, leaving Bishop alone with his solicitor in the interview room for a lunch break, the interviewing team regrouped in Grace's office. Branson had kept to the script. They'd held back, as planned, the really big questions for the third interview this afternoon. As they sat down at the small round table in Grace's office, the detective superintendent gave Branson a pat on the back. Well done, Glenn. Good stuff. OK, now, as I see it, and he used the phrase of Alison Vospers, which he'd rather liked, here's the elephant in the room. All three of them looked at him expectantly. Bishop's alibi. His evening meal at the Wolseley restaurant in London with this Phil Taylor character. That's the elephant in the room. Surely the DNA results kicks his alibi into touch, Nicol said. I'm thinking about a jury, Grace replied. Depends how credible this Taylor man is. You can be sure Bishop's going to have a top brief. He'll milk the alibi for all it's worth. An honest citizen versus the vagaries of science? Probably with evidence from British Telecom showing the time Bishop booked his alarm call to back his time frame up. I think we should be able to nail Bishop in his third interview, Roy, Jane Paxton said. We've got a lot to hit him with. Grace nodded, thinking hard, not yet convinced they had everything they needed. They started again shortly after two. Roy Grace was conscious as he sat back down in the slightly unstable chair in the observation room, 
that they had just six hours left before they would have to release Brian Bishop, unless they applied for an extension or charged him. They could, of course, go to court for a warrant of further detention, but Grace did not want to do that unless it was absolutely necessary. Alison Vosper had already rung him to find out how close they were to charging Bishop. When he related the facts to date to her, she sounded pleased, still in sweet mode. The fact that a man had been arrested so quickly after Katie Bishop's murder was making the force look good in the eyes of the media, and it was reassuring for the citizens of Brighton and Hove. Now they needed to charge him. That, of course, would do Grace's career prospects no harm at all, and with the positive DNA results, they had sufficient evidence to secure consent from the Crown Prosecution Service to charge Bishop. But it wasn't just charging the man that Grace needed. He needed to ensure a conviction. He knew he should be elated at the way it was all going, but something was worrying him, and he couldn't put his finger on what it was. Suddenly, Glenn Branson's voice sounded loud and clear, followed an instant later by the image of four men in the interview room appearing back on the monitor. Brian Bishop was sipping a glass of water, looking sick as a parrot. It is three minutes past 2 p.m., Tuesday the 8th of August, Branson was saying. Present of this interview, interview number three, are Mr. Brian Bishop, Mr. Leighton Lloyd, D.C. Nicholl and myself, D.S. Branson. He then looked directly at Bishop. Mr. Bishop, he said, you told us that you and your wife were happily married and that you made a great team. Were you aware that Mrs. Bishop was having an affair, a sexual relationship with another man? Grace watched Bishop's eyes intently. They moved to the left. From his memory of last watching Bishop, this was to truth mode. Bishop shot a glance at his lawyer, as if wondering whether he should say anything, then looked back at Branson. You are not obliged to answer, Lloyd said. Bishop was pensive for some moments. Then he spoke, the words coming out heavily. I suspected she might have been. Was it this artist fellow in Lewis? Branson nodded giving Bishop a sympathetic smile, aware the man was hurting. Bishop sank his face to his hand and was silent. Do you want to take a break? his solicitor asked. Bishop shook his head, then removed his hands. He was crying. I'm okay, I'm okay. Let's just get on with all this bloody stuff. Jesus, he shrugged, staring miserably down at the table, dabbing his tears with the back of his hand. Katie was the loveliest person, but there was something inside driving her, like a demon that always made her dissatisfied with everything. I thought I could give her what she wanted. He started crying again. I think we should take a break, gentlemen, Leighton Lloyd said. They all stepped out, leaving Bishop alone, then resumed the interview after ten minutes. Nick Nicole, playing good cop, asked the first question. Mr. Bishop, could you tell us how you felt when you first suspected your wife was being unfaithful? Bishop looked at the D.C. sardonically. Do you mean, did I want to kill her? You said that, sir, not us, Branson slammed in. Grace was interested to see Bishop's display of emotion. Perhaps they were just crocodile tears for the benefit of the interviewing team. In a faltering voice, Bishop said, I loved her. I never wanted to kill her. People have affairs. It's the way of the world. When Katie and I first met, we were both married to other people. We had an affair. I think I knew in my heart then that if we did marry, she would probably end up doing the same to me. Is that why you were unfaithful to her? Bickle asked. Bishop took his time to respond. Are you referring to Sophie Harrington? I am. His eyes moved left again. We've been having a flirtation. Nice for my ego, but that's as far as it's gone. I never slept with her, although she seems... Seemed, he corrected, to enjoy fantasizing that it had happened. You have never slept with Miss Harrington, not once. Grace watched the man's eyes intently. They went left again. Absolutely, never. Bishop smiled nervously. I'm not saying I wouldn't have liked to. But I have a moral code. I was stupid. I was flattered by her interest in me, enjoyed her company. But you have to remember, I've been down that road before. 
You sleep with someone and if you're lucky, it's a crap experience. But if you're unlucky, it's a gosh wow experience and you're smitten. And then you're in big trouble. That's what happened to Katie and me. We were smitten with each other. So you never slept with Miss Harrington, Glen Branson pressed. Never. I wanted to try to make my marriage work. So you thought kinky sex might be a way to achieve that? Branson asked. Pardon? What do you mean? Branson looked at his notes. One of our team spoke yesterday to a Mrs. Diane Rand. We understand from her that she was one of your wife's best friends. Is that correct? They spoke to each other about four times a day. God knows what they had to say to each other. Plenty, I think. Branson responded humorously. Mrs. Rand told our officer, of WPC, that your wife had been expressing concerns recently over your increasingly kinky sexual demands on her. Would you like to elaborate on this? Leighton Lloyd interjected quickly and firmly. No, my client would not. I have one significant question on this issue, Branson said, addressing the lawyer. Lloyd gestured for him to ask it. Mr. Bishop, Branson said. Do you possess a replica Second World War gas mask? Uh, what is the relevance of that question? Lloyd asked the DS. It's extremely relevant, sir, Branson said. Grace watched Bishop's eyes intently. They shot to the right. Yes, he said. Is it something you and Mrs. Bishop used in your sex life? I am not allowing my client to answer. Bishop raised a pacifying hand at his solicitor. It's okay. Yes, I bought it. He shrugged, blushing. We were experimenting. I... I read a book about how to keep your love life going, you know? It sort of flags after a while between two people when the initial excitement, novelty of the relationship is over. I got stuff for us to try out. His face was the colour of beetroot. Branson turned his focus onto Bishop's dinner with his financial adviser, Phil Taylor. Mr. Bishop, it's correct, isn't it, that one of the cars you own is a Bentley Continental in a dark red colour? Umbrian red, yes. Registration number Lima Juliet 04 November Whiskey Sierra. Unused to the phonetic alphabet, Bishop had to think for a moment. Then he nodded. At 11.47 last Thursday night, this vehicle was photographed by an automatic number plate recognition camera on the southbound carriageway of the M23 motorway in the vicinity of Gatwick Airport. Can you explain why it was there and who was driving it? Bishop looked at his solicitor. Do you have the photograph? Leighton Lloyd asked. No, but I can let you have a copy, Branson said. Lloyd made a note in his book. There's a mistake, Bishop said. There must be. Did you lend your car to anyone that evening? Branson asked. I never lend it. I had it in London that night because I needed to drive down to the golf club in the morning. Could anyone have borrowed it without your permission or your knowledge? No. Well, I don't think so. It's extremely unlikely. Who else has the keys to the vehicle apart from you, sir? No one. We've had some problems in the underground car park beneath my flat. Some cars broken into. Could joyriders have taken it out for a spin? Leighton Lloyd interjected. It's possible, Bishop said. When joyriders take a car, they don't usually bring it back, Grace said. He watched Lloyd making a note in his book. The lawyer would have a field day with that. Next, Glenn Branson said, Mr. Bishop, we have already mentioned to you that during the course of the search of your house at 97 Dyke Road Avenue, a life insurance policy with the Southern Star Assurance Company was found. The policy is on your wife's life with a value of £3 million. You are named as the sole beneficiary. Grace swung his eyes from Bishop to the lawyer. Lloyd's expression barely changed, but his shoulders sank a little. Brian Bishop's eyes were all over the place and his composure seemed suddenly to have deserted him. Look, I told you, I... I... I already told you, I, I know nothing about this, absolutely nothing. Do you think your wife took this policy out herself, secretly, from the goodness of her heart? Branson pressed him. Grace smiled at this, 
proud of the way his colleague, to whom he had given so much guidance over the past few years, because he adored him and believed in him, was really growing in stature. Bishop raised his hands, then let them flop down onto the table. His eyes were all over the place still. Please believe me, I don't know anything about this. On three million pounds, I imagine there'd be a hefty premium, Branson said. Presumably we'd be able to see from your bank account, or indeed Mrs. Bishop's, how this was paid, or perhaps you have a mystery benefactor. Leighton Lloyd was now scribbling fast in his book, his expression continuing to give nothing away. He turned to Bishop. You don't have to answer that unless you want to. I don't know anything about it. Bishop's tone had become imploring, heartfelt. I really don't. We seem to be stacking up quite a few things you claim not to know anything about, Mr. Bishop, Glen Branson continued. You don't know anything about your car being driven towards Brighton shortly before your wife was murdered. You don't know anything about a three million pound life insurance policy taken out on your wife just six months before she was murdered. He paused, checked his own notes, then drank some water. In your account last night, you said that the last time you and your wife had sexual intercourse was on the morning of Sunday 30th of July. Have I got that correct? Bishop nodded, looking a little embarrassed. Then can you explain the presence of a quantity of your semen that was found in Mrs. Bishop's vagina during her post-mortem on the morning of Friday the 4th of August? There's no way, Bishop said. Absolutely not possible. Are you saying, sir, that you did not have sexual intercourse with Mrs. Bishop on the night of Thursday 3rd of August? Bishop's eyes swung resolutely left. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. I was in London, for God's sake. He turned to look at his solicitor. It isn't possible. It isn't bloody possible. Roy Grace had seen many solicitors' expressions over the years, as one client after another had clearly told yet another barefaced lie to them. Leighton Lloyd's face remained inscrutable. The man would make a good poker player, he thought. At ten past five, after Glenn Branson had gone doggedly back over Bishop's statement from last night's interview, the questions that had been put to him in the second interview this morning and challenged virtually every single word that Bishop had said, he judged that they had got as much from the man as they were going to get at this stage. Bishop was not budging on the three key elements, his London alibi, the life insurance policy, and the last time he had had sex with his wife. But Branson was satisfied, and more than a little drained. Bishop was led back to his cell, leaving the solicitor alone with the two police officers. Lloyd pointedly looked at his watch, then addressed the two men. I presume you're aware that you will have to release my client in just under three hours' time, unless you're planning to charge him? Where are you going to be? Branson asked him. I'm going to my office. We'll call you. Then the detectives went back over to Sussex House, up to Roy Grace's office, and sat at the round table. Well done, Glenn. You did well, Grace said again. Extremely well, Nick Nicholl added. Jane Paxton looked pensive. She wasn't one for handing out praise. So, we need to consider our next step. Then the door opened and Eleanor Hodgson came in, holding a thin wadge of papers clipped together. Addressing Grace, she said, Excuse me interrupting, Roy. I thought you would want to see this. It just came back from the Huntingdon lab. It was two DNA analysis reports. One was on the semen that had been found present in Sophie Harrington's vagina. The other was on the minute fleck of what had looked like human flesh that Nadyushka de Sancha had removed from under the dead woman's toenail. Both were a complete match with Brian Bishop's DNA. Chapter 95 Cleo Morey left the mortuary, together with Darren, just before 5.30. Closing the front door and standing in the brilliant warm sunlight, she said, What are you doing tonight? Was going to take her to the cinema, but it's too hot, he said squinting back at his boss with the sun in his eyes. We're going to go down the marina, have a few drinks. There's a cool new place I'm going to check out. Rehab. She looked at him dubiously. Twenty years old, spiky black hair, 
a cheery face sporting some designer stubble. He could have so easily, with just a brief turn in his life, have ended up like so many of the no-hoper youngsters draped along the pavements and doorways of this city every night, strung out, dossing, begging, mugging. But he'd clearly been born with a spirited streak in him. He worked hard. He was pleasant company. He was going to do okay in life. Rehab? Yeah, it's a bar and restaurant place. Classy. I'm splashing out. Bit of a special bird. I would say join us, but, you know, two's company and all that. She grinned. Cheeky sod. And hey, who's to say I don't have a date myself tonight? Oh, yeah. He looked pleased for her. Now, let me guess who. None of your business. Don't suppose he works for the CID, does he? I said it's none of your business. Then you shouldn't snog him in the front office, should you? He winked. What? She exclaimed. Forget about the CCTV camera in there, did you? With a broad grin, he gave her a cheery wave and walked over to his car. Peeping Tom, she called after him. Why, er, uh, perv. He turned as he opened the door of his small red Nissan. Actually, if you want my opinion, you make quite a nice-looking couple. She flipped him the bird, then added for good measure, And don't drink too much. Remember we're on call tonight. You're a fine one to talk. She was still grinning some minutes later as she drove around the gyratory system and into the covered car park of Sainsbury's. Her mind was now on what she was going to give the CID officer she snogged in the front office, as Darren had so crudely put it, to eat. As it was such a glorious evening, she decided to barbecue up on her roof terrace. Roy Grace liked seafood and fish. Ahead of her, she saw a parking space and manoeuvred into it. She would go to the wet fish counter first and buy some uncooked prawns in their shells, if they had them, and tuna steaks. A couple of corn on the cobs, some salad, and some sweet potatoes in their jackets, which were totally yummy on a barbecue, and a really nice bottle of rosé wine. Well, perhaps not just one bottle. She was looking forward to this evening and hoped Grace would be able to escape from his investigation at a reasonable hour tonight. It seemed a long while since they'd actually spent a proper evening together, and it would be good to have a catch-up. She missed him, she realised. Missed him all the time when he wasn't around. But there was still the spectre of Sandy and his visit to Munich. She wanted the full lowdown on that. She had learned from her last relationship that just when you thought everything was perfect... Life could turn around and bite you. Chapter 96 His alibi, Grace said, slapping the palm of his left hand against his bald right fist. We need to deal with it. I've said it before, it's the elephant in the room. Paxton, Branson and Nicole, still seated around the table in his office with him, were looking pensive. Jane topped up her beaker of water from a bottle. "'Don't you think we've got enough evidence now, Roy?' she said. "'You're going to be cutting it fine for keeping Bishop in tomorrow, unless we apply to the court this evening for an extension.' Grace considered this for some moments. The time that Bishop had been arrested yesterday, at 8 p.m., was working against them. It meant they had to release him at 8 tonight. They will be able to get a 12-hour extension easily enough, but that would only take them to 8 tomorrow morning.' If they wanted to keep him beyond that, they would have to go before a magistrate in court with a warrant of further detention application, and that would have to be arranged this evening if they wanted to avoid making phone calls at dawn and disturbing people who had every right to be left in peace to sleep. He looked at his watch. It was 5.35. He picked up the phone and rang Kim Murphy. Kim, you had one of the team interview Bishop's financial advisor chap, Phil Taylor. I need Taylor's number urgently. Can you get it for me? Or better still, get him on the phone and patch him through to me. While he was waiting, they discussed the ramifications of the latest evidence. Grace maintained his stance. But what about the DNA evidence on Sophie Harrington, Roy? Nick Nickel asked. Surely that's pretty conclusive. Roy was feeling impatient, but managed to hold his temper. Nick, do you not get it? If Bishop's alibi stands up, that he was in London at the time of his wife's murder, is going to nix that DNA evidence. The defence will argue that somehow it got planted there. If we're too hasty in linking the murders together, 
we could get that DNA evidence thrown out also on the same grounds. Justice, Grace had come to learn from bitter experience, was elusive, unpredictable, and only occasionally actually done. Far too many things could go wrong in a court. Juries, which often consisted of people who were totally out of their depth in a court of law, could be led, swayed, bamboozled, seduced and confused. Often they were prejudiced or just plain stupid. Some judges were way past their sell-by dates. Others seemed, at times, to have come from another planet. It wasn't enough to have a watertight case, backed up with damning evidence. You still needed a lot of luck to get a conviction. We have the witness who saw Bishop outside her home, Jane Paxton reassured him. Yes? He was getting more irritable now by the minute. Was it the heat, he wondered, or being so dog-tired? or having to put up with his bloody lodger, or Sandy pressing on a raw nerve. Well, I think that's strong, she said, sounding defensive. We need to go through a formal identification process with that witness and double-check the timelines there before we can really make it stand up. And there may be some other evidence that comes to light over the next few days. If we've got Bishop inside on a charge, then for the moment the time pressure's off on Miss Harrington. At least we'll have thrown the press a bone. The phone rang. It was Kim, telling Grace that she had Phil Taylor on the line and was putting him through. Grace stepped away from the table and took the call on the phone on his desk. When he finished, Grace stood up again. He's agreed to meet me tonight in London. Sounds a straightforward enough man. He looked at Branson. We'll apply for a twelve-hour extension for Bishop, then go up to London straight after the 6.30 briefing. I'll allow you to come with me. Next he rang Norman Potting and asked him to contact the on-call PACE superintendent to make an application for a 12-hour extension. Then he turned back to the trio in his office. OK, I'll see you all in the conference room at 6.30. Thank you very much, everyone. He sat back down at his desk. Now he had another task that was just as hard, in its own very different way. How to explain to Cleo that he was going to have to go to London this evening, and with the best will in the world was unlikely to be back down this side of midnight. To his surprise, probably because she understood the 24-7 nature of police work, she took it cheerfully. That's OK, she said. I'm standing at the checkout in Sainsbury's with a load of fresh prawns and scallops. Be ashamed to waste them, so I'll just have to eat them all myself. Shit, I'm so sorry. It's OK. These murders are a lot more important than a few prawns, but you'd better hurry round when you get back down. I'll probably have eaten. I'll grab something in the car. I'm not talking about food. He blew her a kiss. Times ten, she replied. As he hung up, he smiled, relieved that Cleo seemed, for the moment at any rate, to have put his visit to Munich behind her. But had he? That would depend, he knew, on whether Marcel Cullen's inquiries provided any leads. And suddenly, for the first time, he found himself, almost, hoping that he wouldn't. Chapter 97 Unusually, there was no empty spaces in the street outside the front gates of her home, so Cleo had to circle around looking for one. Keeping a safe distance back, the time billionaire watched the tail of the blue MG disappear around a corner, its right-hand indicator winking. Then he smiled, and he sent a small, quick message of thanks to God. This street was so much better. Tall, windowless walls on the right, a sheer cliff face of red brick. On the left, running the whole length of the street, was a blue construction site hoarding with padlocked gates. Rising above it was a ten-foot-tall artist's impression of the finished development, a complex of fancy flats and shops, boasting the wording, Lane West, more than just a development, an urban, eco-friendly lifestyle. She had found a space and was reversing into it. Joy. He fixated on her brake lights. They seemed to be getting brighter as he watched them. Glowing red for danger, red for luck, red for sex. He liked brake lights. He could watch them the way some people could watch a log fire. And he knew everything about the brake lights on Cleo Mori's car the size of bulb, the strength, how they could be replaced, how they were connected into the wiring loom of the vehicle, 
how they were activated. He knew everything about this car. He spent the whole night reading the workshop manual, as well as surfing the net. That was a good thing about the Internet. It didn't matter what time of the day or night, you could find some saddo enthusiast who could tell you more about the door-locking mechanism of a 2005 MG TF-160 than the manufacturer had ever known. She was out of the car, wearing jeans that stopped at her calves, pink plimsolls, a white T-shirt, hefting three Sainsbury carrier bags out of the boot and slinging the strap of her big canvas handbag over her shoulder. He drove past her and turned right at the end of the street, then right again, then right again, and now he was approaching the front of her building. He saw her standing outside the gates, doing an awkward balancing act of holding the grocery bags and tapping the number on the keypad. Then she went inside and the gate clanged shut behind her. Hopefully she wasn't going out again tonight. He would have to take a gamble on that one. But of course he had God's assistance. He made one more complete circuit, just to make sure she hadn't forgotten something in the car and gone running back for it. Women did that sort of thing, he knew. After ten minutes he decided it was safe. He double-parked his Prius alongside a dusty Volvo covered in bird droppings that didn't look like it had gone anywhere in a while, temporarily blocking the street, although there was nothing coming. Then he unlocked the MG, drove it out of its spot, double-parked that also for a moment, while he jumped back into the Prius, and glided into the now empty space between the Volvo and a small Renault. Job done. The first part. It was a shame the MG had its hardtop on, he thought, as he headed towards his lockup. It would have been a pleasant evening to drive with the roof down. Chapter 98 As soon as the 6.30 briefing was over, Grace grabbed the keys of the pool car that Tony Case had organised for him, and with Glenn Branson in tow, hurried down to the car park beneath the building. Let me drive, man. You know your driving scares me, Grace replied. Actually, let me rephrase that. Your driving terrifies the living daylights out of me. Oh, yeah, Branson said. That's rich coming from you. Your driving's rubbish. You drive like a girl. No, actually, you don't. You drive like an old git, which is what you are. And you recently failed your advanced police driving test. The examiner was an idiot. My instructor said I had natural aptitude for high-speed pursuit driving. My driving rocks. He should be sectioned under the Mental Health Act. Wanker. Grace tossed in the keys as they approached the unmarked Mondeo. Just don't try to impress me. Did you see the Fast and the Furious with Van Diesel? He's got the most stupid name for an actor. Yeah? Well, he doesn't think much of yours either. Grace wasn't sure what sudden mental aberration had prompted him to give his friend the keys. Maybe he was hoping that if Glenn was concentrating on driving, he'd be spared an endless discussion, or more likely monologue, about all that was wrong with his marriage yet again. He'd endured three hours of his friend's soul-searching last night, after they'd got back home following the interview with Bishop. The bottle of Glenfiddich, which they'd demolished between them, had only partially mitigated the pain. Then he'd had to listen to Glenn again this morning while getting shaved and dressed, and then over his breakfast cereal, with the added negative of a mild hangover. To his relief, Branson drove sensibly, apart from one downhill stretch near Handcross, where he wound the car up to 130 miles per hour, especially so he could give Grace the benefit of his cornering skills through two sharp uphill bends. It's all about positioning on the road and balancing the throttle, old-timer, he said. From where Grace was sitting, stomach in his mouth, it was more about not flying off into the seriously sturdy-looking trees that lined both bends. Then they reached the M23 motorway, and Grace's repeating of his warning about speed traps and traffic cops who loved nothing better than to book other offices had some effect. So Branson slowed down, and instead tried to phone home on his hands-free mobile. Bitch, he said. She's not picking up. I've got a right to speak to my kids, haven't I? You've got a right to be in your house, Grace reminded him. Maybe you could tell her that, like, you know, give her the official police point of view. Grace shook his head. I'll help you all I can. 
but I can't fight your battle for you. Yeah, you're right. It was wrong of me to ask. I'm sorry. What happened about the horse? Yeah, she was on about it again when we spoke. She decided she wants to try show jumping. That's serious money. Grace decided, privately, that she needed to see a psychologist. I think you guys should go to Relate, he said. You already said that. I did? About two o'clock this morning, and the day before. You're repeating yourself, old-timer. Alzheimer's kicking in. You know your problem, Grace said. Apart from being black, bald, from an underprivileged background? Yeah, apart from all that. No, tell me. Lack of respect for your peers. Branson took one of his hands from the wheel and raised it. Respect, he said, deferentially. That's better. Shortly after nine, Branson parked the Mondeo on the single yellow line in Arlington Street, just past the Ritz Hotel and opposite the Caprice Restaurant. Nice wheels, he said, as they walked up the hill, past a parked Ferrari. You ought to get yourself a set of those. It's better than that crappy Alpha you pooped around in. Be good for your image. There's a small matter of a hundred grand or so separating me from one, Grace said. And lumbered with you on my team, my chances of a pay rise of that magnitude are somewhat reduced. At the top of the street, they rounded the corner into Piccadilly. Immediately on their right, they saw a handsome, imposing building in black and gold paintwork. Its massive arched windows were brightly illuminated, and the interior seemed humming with people. A smart sign in the wall said, The Wolseley. They were greeted effusively by a liveried doorman in a top hat. Good evening, gentlemen, he said with a soft Irish accent. The Woolsey restaurant? Grace asked, feeling a little out of place here. Absolutely. Very nice to see you both. He held the door open and gestured them through. Grace, followed by Branson, stepped inside. There was a small crowd of people clustered around a reception desk. A waiter hurried past with a tray laden with cocktails into a vast domed and galleried dining room elegantly themed in black and white and packed with people. There was a noisy buzz. He looked around for a moment. It had an old-world Belle Epoque grandeur about it, yet at the same time it felt intensely modern. The waiting staff were all dressed in hip black, and most of the clientele looked cool. He decided Cleo would like this place. Maybe he would bring her up for a night in London and come here, although he thought he had better check out the prices first. A young woman receptionist smiled at them, then a tall man with fashionably long and tangled ginger hair greeted them. Gentlemen, good evening. Can I help you? We're meeting Mr. Taylor. Mr. Phil Taylor? Yes. He pointed at a bar area off to the side. He's in there, gentlemen. First table on the right. We'll take you to him. As Grace entered the bar, he saw a man in his early forties wearing a yellow polo shirt and blue chinos, looking up at him expectantly. Mr. Taylor? Aye. He half stood up. Detective Superintendent Grace? He spoke in a distinct Yorkshire accent. Yes, and Detective Sergeant Branson. Grace studied him fleetingly, weighing him up on first impression. He was relaxed and fit-looking, a tiny bit overweight, with a pleasant open face, a sunburnt nose, thinning fair hair and alert, very keen eyes. No flies on this man, he thought instantly. A set of car keys with a Ferrari emblem on the fob was lying on the table in front of the man next to a tall glass containing a watery-looking cocktail with a sprig of mint in it. Very pleased to make your acquaintance, gentlemen. Have a seat. Can I get you a drink? I can recommend the mojitos. They're excellent. He waved a hand to summon a waiter. Oh, I'm driving. Oh, I'll have a Diet Coke, Branson said. The same, Grace said, although still faced with the nightmare of the drive back with Branson, he could have used a pint of single malt. We'll pay for this, sir. It's very good of you to see us at such short notice, Grace began. Oh, it's not a problem. How can I help you? Can I ask you how long you've known Brian Bishop? Branson said, putting his pad down on the table. Grace watched the movement of the man's eyes as he thought. Mm, about six years? Yes, almost exactly six years. Branson noted this down. My own precaution? Phil Taylor asked, only half in jest. No, Branson replied. We're just here to try to confirm some times with you. 
I did give them to one of your officers yesterday. What exactly is the problem? Is Brian in trouble? We'd rather not say too much at the moment, Grace replied. How did you meet him? Branson asked. At a PI meeting. PI? It's a club for petrol heads that Damon Hill, the racing driver, former world champion, runs. You pay an annual subscription and get the use of various sports cars. We met at one of their cocktail parties. Eyeing the key fob, Glenn Branson said, Is that your Ferrari around the corner in Arlington Street? The 430? Yes. But that's my own car. Nice, Branson said. Nice motor. But even nicer without all your damned speed cameras. Can you give us a little bit of background about yourself, Mr. Taylor? Grace asked, not rising to the bait. Me? Well, I qualified as a chartered accountant, then I spent 15 years with the Inland Revenue, most of it on their special investigations team, looking into tax abuse scams mostly. Through it, I saw how much money the IFA community, the independent financial advisors, made. I decided that's what I should be doing. So I set up Taylor Financial Planning. Never looked back. Wasn't long after I started that I met Brian. He became one of my first clients. How would you describe Mr. Bishop? Branson asked. How would I describe him? Well, he's a top man. One of the best. He thought for some moments. Absolute integrity. Smart, reliable, efficient. Did you ever arrange any life insurance for him? We're getting into an area of client confidentiality, gentlemen. I understand, Grace said. There is one question I would like to ask, and if you don't want to answer it, that's fine. Did you ever arrange a life insurance policy on Brian Bishop's wife? I can answer that with a categorical no. Thank you. Is it correct, Mr. Taylor, that you and Mr. Bishop had dinner here in this restaurant last week on Thursday the 3rd of August? Grace continued. Yes, we did. His demeanour had become a little defensive now. This uh, regular haunt of yours? Branson asked. Well, it is. I like to meet clients here. Can you remember what time, approximately, you left the restaurant? I can do better than that, Phil Taylor said, a little smugly. Fishing his wallet from his jacket, which was lying beside him on the bench seat, he rummaged inside and pulled out a credit card receipt from the restaurant. Grace looked at it. Bishop hadn't been lying, he thought, when he saw the items of drink that the two men had consumed. Two mojito cocktails, two bottles of wine, four brandies. Looks like you had a good evening, he said. He also privately noted that the prices were no higher than decent Brighton restaurants. He could afford to bring Cleo here. She would love it. Aye, we did. Grace did a mental calculation. Assuming both men drank more or less equally, Bishop would have been way over the drink-drive limit when he left the restaurant. Could the drink have brought on a rage about his wife's infidelity, and given him the courage to drive recklessly? Then, studying the receipt carefully, he found towards the top right what he was looking for. Time, 22.54. Uh, how did Brian Bishop seem to you last Thursday evening? Grace asked Phil Taylor. It was in a good mood, very cheerful, good company. He had a golf match in Brighton next morning, so he didn't want to be late or drink too much. But we still managed to, he chuckled. Can you remember how soon after you got your bill you left this place? Immediately. I could see Brian was anxious to get home. He needed to make an early start next morning. So he got a taxi. Aye, Dom and John got one. I'll let him take the first. So that was about eleven. Around then, yes. Couldn't say exactly. Maybe a few minutes before. Grace paid the bill for the drinks. Then they thanked him and left. As they turned the corner into Arlington Street, Grace was silent, doing some mental arithmetic. Then, just as they reached the Mondeo, he slapped Branson warmly on the back. Every dog has his day. What's that supposed to mean? Suddenly, my friend, it's all your birthdays rolled into one. Sorry, old Tana, you've lost me. Your driving skills. I'm going to give you a chance to show them off. We're going to drive first at a steady legal speed to Bishop's Flat in Notting Hill. From there, you're going to drive like the clappers. 
we're going to see just how quickly Bishop could have made that journey. The detective sergeant beamed. Chapter 99 So what the fuck was all this about? Yesterday in Brighton you could throw a stick in any direction and you'd hit an MGTF. Now there wasn't one to be seen anywhere in the whole city. Skunk stared angrily out of the windscreen of Beth's mother's little Peugeot. Make me come, Beth said. Fuck off, he said. Find me a fucking MG. Women, shite. It was half past ten. They'd done the round of all the regular car parks. Nothing. Nothing, at any rate, that matched Barry Spiker's specification. And after his last experience with the car handler, he wasn't going to repeat the mistake of getting the wrong model. An MGTF 160, blue, any spec, couldn't be clearer than that. He was wired as hell, needed some brown badly. He had it all worked out two hours ago. DC Packer had agreed he would grab the car, take it to Spiker, Packer would wait until he left with his cash from Spiker, all organised. Packer would pay him tomorrow. He'd buy his brown tonight with Spiker's money. Now came the hitch. There were no blue MGTF 160s to be found anywhere. Not one. It was like they'd been hoovered up from the planet. They were heading up Shirley Drive, one of the central and smartest arteries of Hove. It flowed with conspicuous cash instead of blood. Swanky houses, showy wheels on the driveways, anything you could ever imagine you might want to buy if your lottery number came up. Beamers, Mercs, Porsches, Bentleys, Ferraris, Range Rovers, you name it. Gleaming expensive metal as far as the eye could see and the credit cards could stretch. Turn right, he commanded. At least finger me. I'm busy, I'm working. You shouldn't be in the office this late, she scolded. Yeah, tell you what, find that car and I'll fuck you all night. I'll get some stuff we'll do together. Bethany leaned over and kissed him. The ring in her lip tingled his cheek. You know I adore you, don't you? Skunk looked at her. She was quite pretty from some angles, with her snub nose and cropped black hair. Something welled up deep inside him. Something he'd never felt during all the shitty years of his childhood, and didn't know how to handle now. He took a deep breath, fighting back tears. You know, Beth, you're the only nice thing that ever happened to me in my life, he shrugged. I mean it. I want you to know that. Now fuck off and drive. We've got work to do. And then, as she made the right turn, he suddenly leaned forward in excitement. His seatbelt jerked him sharply back. Accelerate, quick! Bethany stoked the gears and the Peugeot surged forward, up past the smart, detached houses of Onslow Road, gaining on the taillights in front of them. They caught up with the MG, waiting for a gap in the traffic to turn right into Dyke Road. Skunk stared ahead, the headlights giving him a clear view of the little MG. It was a TF-160, dark blue, with a blue hardtop. Why the driver had the hardtop on during glorious summer weather like this mystified him, but that wasn't his problem, and surely Spiker would be pleased. The hardtop would be an added bonus. The MG pulled out. Follow him! Don't let him see us, but don't lose him. What's going on, Bear? Bear was her pet name for him, because she didn't like him to be called Skunk. I'm working, don't ask questions. Grinning, amused by his strange ways, Bethany pulled out right in front of another car. Blinding lights, a squeal of brakes and the blast of a horn. Shite, he said. You're a fucking lunatic driver. You said follow him. Don't let him see us. She slowed. The MG sped away down the road, then stopped at traffic lights. Bethany pulled up behind it. Skunk saw the back of the driver's head at the wheel. Long, dark hair. It looked like a woman. When are you going to tell me what this is all about? Bethany demanded. Just follow her. Keep your distance. The time billionaire was concerned about the headlights right behind him. Was the car following him, a police car? The lights turned green and he accelerated, keeping rigidly below the 30 mile per hour speed limit. To his relief, the car behind stayed put, 
then moved forward very slowly. He pulled up behind him again at the next lights, the junction with the old Shoreham Road. It was halted right beneath a lamppost, and he could see that it was just a crappy little old Peugeot 206. Definitely not a police vehicle. Just some slapper and a prat she was driving. No worries. Five minutes later he pulled up in the street alongside Cleo Morris' home and double-parked beside the birdshit-spattered Volvo. He moved his Prius out of the parking space, then drove the MG back into it. Perfect. The bitch would have no reason at all to suspect a thing. Skunk, standing at the top of the street, concealed in the shadows, watched the curious manoeuvre with interest. He had no idea what was going on, nor what the woman was doing spending so much time in the MG, fiddling about, with the Prius double-parked, blocking the street. Then the woman climbed out of the car, and he saw that he was wrong. It was a bearded bloke. Skunk watched him get into the Prius and glide off. Then he walked back to the Peugeot, parked a short distance away, and dialed PC Paul Packer's number. Hi, mate, Packer said. What's up? I found my car. OK. I have a slight problem for a couple of hours. I've been called to a job. Can you hang tight? For how long? Couple of hours, Max? Skunk looked at the Peugeot's clock. It was 10.50. No more, he said. I can't wait no more than that. Give me the location, I'll get it sorted. Skunk told him where he was. Then he hung up and turned to Bethany. Get your panties off. I'm not wearing any, she said. Chapter 100 Grace checked his watch. Seven minutes past eleven. Then he glanced at the speedometer. They were doing a steady 135 miles an hour. Lights streaked past. Darkness rushed at them. He was concentrating on the cars ahead, trying to keep Glenn out of trouble. As they closed on each vehicle, he tried to check whether it was a police car. It was hard because there were so many unmarked patrol cars used on this stretch of road. But he knew some of the telltale signs to look for. Two figures in the car, a clean, late-model four-seater, and external aerials were the best clues. But he also knew there weren't many out late at night. There was a preference for marked cars then a visible police presence. He was already going to have to pull some strings, not an easy task when the police were under ever-increasing public scrutiny, to avoid Branson getting fined and points on his licence for the four Gatso cameras that had double-flashed them on their way out of London. Four cameras, three points each, maybe even more for the speed at which they'd hit a couple of them. At least twelve points on his licence, an instant ban. He grinned at the thought, imagining his friend's protests. What's funny? Branson asked, having to raise his voice above the Bubba Sparks rap song that he was playing at maxed-out volume on the radio. What are you grinning at? Grace was tolerating the din because Glenn had told him he needed the music to put him in the zone for a fast drive. My life, he replied. Eight minutes passed. They were well beyond Junction 8, and Junction 9 should be coming up at any moment. He scanned for the dark road ahead for the signs. Your life? I thought your life was just sad. Didn't realise it was a comedy. Just drive. I'm having one of those, what do you call them? Near-death experiences. When your whole life flashes in front of your eyes. It's been like that since we left Notting Hill. The big blue and white sign for the Gatwick Airport turn-off and the Junction 9 marking were now looming ahead. They hurtled past. A short way in the distance, Grace could see the silhouette of the flyover across the motorway. Thirty seconds later, as they passed under it, Grace's eyes swung from his watch to the car's mileometer. OK, you can slow down now. No way. Bubba Sparks ended, to Grace's relief. He leaned forward to turn down the volume, but Branson protested. It's Mob Depp coming on the next man. He's like well out of your depth, but he's my kind of music. If you don't slow down, I'm going to find some Cliff Richard, Grace threatened. Branson slowed down, a fraction, shaking his head. For a moment, Grace tuned out Branson and his music and concentrated on some mental calculations. They had covered just over 28 miles from outside Bishop's apartment building in Westbourne Grove, Notting Hill, some of which was through built-up urban areas and some on dual carriageway and motorway. There were a number of different routes that Bishop could have taken, an analysis of all speed cameras and CCTV cameras covering them 
might in time reveal the one he'd chosen. There had been some heavy traffic coming out of London, and Grace knew that on different days at different times you could be lucky or unlucky. Tonight they'd covered this distance in 36 minutes. At legal speeds, the journey would have taken closer to an hour. Branson really had been driving like the wind, and it was a miracle they hadn't been stopped anywhere. With lighter traffic, or taking a different route, he reckoned it might be possible to knock five to ten minutes off this time, which meant Bishop could have driven it in twenty-six minutes. There were a number of factors to be considered. Phil Taylor's restaurant receipt showed the bill had been paid at 10.54 on Thursday night. The clock on the credit card machine wouldn't necessarily be a hundred percent accurate. It could easily be a few minutes fast or slow. He made an assumption for the moment, erring on the side of caution to give Bishop the benefit of the doubt that it was five minutes slow. So, he assumed Bishop had left the restaurant more or less exactly at eleven on Thursday night. The cab journey, assuming no traffic hold-ups, could have been done in fifteen minutes. Add on a couple of minutes for Bishop to get his car out of the underground parking area beneath his flat. Bishop could have been in his car on Westbourne Grove by 11.20. The ANPR camera on the bridge of Junction 9 at Gatwick had clocked him at 11.47. Twenty-seven minutes to do a journey that had just taken them 36. And Bishop had a much more powerful car, the fastest saloon car in the world. The ANPR camera clock wouldn't necessarily be dead accurate either. There was a whole bunch of moving parts to this timeline. But what he was now certain of was that it was possible. He turned the radio off. Hey, Branson protested. And don't start playing that stuff in my house, or you'll be out in the chicken shed. You don't have a chicken shed. I'll buy one in the morning. You'll crap it, DIY. You'd never put it together. So you'll have to hope it's not raining. Then, serious, he asked. Give me your assessment of Phil Taylor as a witness. Be straight. Well, Flash, with that car and all. Cocksure. Covering for his client? In league with Bishop for the insurance money? Branson shook his head. Didn't strike me as the type. Ex-Inland Revenue Special Investigator. Nothing to say anyone isn't a villain, but he just seemed straight to me. Regular guy, he was all right. But that car, though, bastard. I hate him for that. I think he's straight, too. And he'd come over as a credible witness in court. So? You did the journey in 36 minutes. On my calculations, Bishop would have needed to have done it in 27, but there's give or take on either side. I could have gone faster. Grace winced at the thought. You did it exactly right. So? We're going to charge him. Grace pulled out his mobile phone and dialed the home number of the Crown Prosecution Service solicitor, Chris Binns, with whom he'd already been liaising over the past couple of days whose sanction he would require in order to formally charge Bishop. He informed the lawyer of his latest findings tonight, and the time constraints they were under with Bishop's detention. They arranged to meet at 6.30am at Sussex House. Chapter 101 Cleo lay on a sofa in a downstairs living area, with an almost empty bottle of rosé wine on the floor, and a completely empty glass lying next to it. A DVD of Memoirs of a Geisha was playing on the large television screen, but she was struggling to keep her eyes open. She shouldn't really have drunk anything she knew, being on call tonight, and she had an essay to write for her philosophy course, but finding fish on the floor had really upset her. It was strange, she was thinking, that she saw dead human beings all day long, and with the exception of children, remained emotionally detached from them but seeing little fish lying sideways across the join between two oak planks, much of her vivid gold colour faded to a dull bronze, her opaque eyes staring up at her, accusatory, as if saying, Why didn't you come home and rescue me? And how the hell had the little creature got there? If it had been yesterday, she could have blamed her cleaning lady, Maria, because the clumsy woman was always breaking things. But she didn't come on Tuesdays. Could a cat have got in here? A bird? Or had poor Fish been trying out some wild new exercise? She reached out her arm, poured the last drops into her glass and drained it. On the screen, the geisha was being taught the arts of pleasuring a man. She watched keenly, suddenly feeling more awake now, getting her second wind. 
She had put this film on in the hope of learning a few things she could try out on Roy, which was why all she had on beneath her silk dressing gown was some very slinky and revealing cream lace underwear that she bought on Saturday, at an outrageous cost, from a specialist shop in Brighton. All evening she'd been planning what she would do when he arrived. She would open the door, kiss him, then stand back and let the front of the dressing gown fall open. She was longing to see his reaction. She had once read that men got turned on by women who took the lead, and it was a real turn-on for her just lying here in this outfit, thinking about it. The clock on the front of the video player read eight minutes past midnight. Where are you? she wondered. As if in response, her home phone rang. She put the cordless handset to her ear and answered. It was Roy on a crackly mobile. Hey, he said. How are you doing? I'm okay. Where are you, you poor thing? Five minutes from the office. I've got a couple of things to quickly sort for the morning. I could be with you in half an hour. Is it going to be too late to come over? No, it won't be too late at all. Just get here when you can. I'll have a drink waiting for you. How's it gone? Good. It was very good. Tiring, but worth the journey. Are you really sure you'd like me to come over? I'm totally sure, my darling. Making love is really a lot more fun with two people than one. She heard the call waiting beep just as she hung up. The phone instantly rang again. Hello, she answered. And then, shit, she thought, her heart sinking as she heard the voice at the other end. Bugger, bugger, bugger. Why now? Chapter 102 Skunk's phone pinged, an incoming text. He disentangled himself from a half-undressed Bethany, desperately trying to get his bearings. He'd been asleep. His body was all cramped up. He couldn't find the fucking phone, and he had the shakes badly now. Ouch, Beth said as he dug his hand under her thigh. Trying to find my phone. Think I broke my back earlier, she said, then giggled. You're a dirty cow. He found it on the floor in the front passenger footwell. It was a text from DC Paul Packer. In place. You ready? Skunk texted back. Yes. The time display showed fourteen minutes past midnight. Awkwardly wiggling around, with Bethany complaining that he was squashing her, Skunk got his shell suit bottoms back up. He still had his sneakers on. He gave Bethany a quick peck on the cheek. See ya. What are you doing? Where are you going? Got a meeting in the office. Tell me about it. I don't go. He climbed out of the car with difficulty, his body still stiff and very shaky, and stood in the dark shadow of the construction site hoarding, one hand on the car, the other on the hoarding wall. He was breathing heavily, palpitating, and thought for a moment he was going to throw up. Rivulets of sweat were guttering down his head and body. He saw Beth's face peering out anxiously at him, caught like a ghost by the glare of a street lamp opposite. He took a step forward and realised he was giddy. He swayed and nearly fell over, just catching the side of the car in time to steady himself. Got to do this, he told himself. Got to do this. Hang it out a little longer. Just take those steps forward. Can't screw this up. Got to do it. Got to. Got to. He pulled the hood of his thin cagoule up over his head, then launched himself forward. A breeze had started and the hoarding rattled a little. There were silent cars parked along both sides of the street, bathed in orange sodium glow from the street lighting. The MG was about fifty yards ahead. He was conscious that he was walking unsteadily, and aware that he was being watched. He didn't know where they were, but he knew there was someone in this street probably in one of the cars or vans. He passed a black Prius, a 2CV Citroen, a dusty Mitsubishi people carrier blurred out of focus as he reached it, then came back into focus again. The nausea was even stronger now. He felt an insect crawling on his left arm and slapped it with his hand. Then there were more insects crawling over him. He could feel their tiny, sharp feet on his skin. He patted his chest, reached around and patted his neck, then his stomach. Get off! he blurted. In a sudden panic, he thought he'd forgotten his leavers kit, 
Had they fallen out in the car? Or had he left them in the camper? He checked his pockets, each one in turn. No, shite, no! Then he checked them again. And there they were, nestling in the right-hand pocket of the cagoo, closed up in their hard plastic casing. Get a grip! As he reached the rear of the MG, he was suddenly lit up with bright white light. He heard the roar of an engine and stepped aside. Bethany hurtled past, flat out in first gear, waved, then gave him a toot. Stupid cow. He grinned, watched her taillights disappear. Then, moving swiftly, feeling a little better suddenly now he was actually here, he removed the lever set from his pocket, opened the one he wanted and eased the tip into the door lock. It popped open within a few seconds. Instantly the alarm went off, a loud beeping, combined with all the lights flashing. He stayed calm. They were not easy to nick, these cars. They had shock sensors and immobilizers. But some of the key wiring was right behind the dash. You could short it out, neutralizing the shock sensor and the immobilizer, and start the engine with just one bridge. The interior smelled nice, all new upholstery, leather, and a faint tang of a woman's scent. He climbed in, leaving the door open to keep the interior light on, ducked his head under the dash and immediately found what he was looking for. Two seconds later and the alarm stopped. Then he heard a shout, a woman's voice, bellowing in fury. Hey, that's my bloody car! Cleo sprinted down the street, her blood boiling. She was irritated enough that her carefully planned evening, already messed up by Roy's unexpected trip to London, had now been totally and utterly ruined by a call-out to recover the body of a dead wino from a bus shelter in Peacehaven. Seeing some low-life fuckwit in a hoodie trying to steal her car, she was ready to rip his limbs off. The car's doors slammed shut. She heard the engine turn over. The taillights came on. Her heart was sinking. The bastard was getting away. Then just as she drew level with the Volvo parked behind it, the whole interior of the MG suddenly lit up in a bright flash, as if a massive light bulb had been switched on. There was no bang, no sound of any explosion. It was just suddenly filled with silent, leaping flames contained inside the cockpit, like a light show. She stopped, staring in numb shock, wondering for an instant if the fuckwit hoodie was just a vandal, deliberately setting it on fire. Except he was still inside the car. Throwing herself forward, she reached the driver's door and saw his desperate, emaciated face at the window. He seemed to be struggling with the interior handle, throwing his weight against the door as if it were stuck, then frantically hammering on the door window with his fist, looking at her with pleading eyes. She could see his hood was on fire, and his eyebrows, and she could feel the heat now. In panic, she reached out for the door handle and pulled it. Nothing happened. Suddenly, there were two men beside her, Police officers in black boiler suits and stab jackets, a stocky one with a shaven head and a taller one with a brush cut. Get back, please, lady, the stocky one said. He put both hands on the door handle and pulled, as the other one ran around to the other side and tried that door. Inside, the figure in the burning cagoule was turning his head frantically, his mouth twisted open in an expression of utter terror and agony, his skin blistering in front of her eyes. Unlock the door! Skunk, for God's sake, unlock the door! The stocky one was yelling. The figure inside mouthed something. It's my car! Cleo jumped forward and put her key in the lock, but it would not turn. The policeman tried for a moment, then, giving up, he pulled out his truncheon. Stand back, miss, he said to Cleo. Stand right back. Then he hit the window hard, cracking it. He hit it again and the blackened glass buckled. Then he hit it again, punched it through with his fists, showering the squealing occupant ignoring the flames that were leaping out of the window, the dense black smoke, the stinking fumes of burning plastic. Putting his hands on the window frame, he pulled frantically on the door. It would not give. Then, taking a deep breath, the officer leaned right in through the window, into the inferno, put his arms around the figure and somehow, with his colleague's help now, slowly, far too slowly, for the poor squealing man, it seemed to Cleo, dragged him out through the window and laid him down on the street. All his clothes were on fire. She saw the laces of his trainers burning. He was writhing, thrashing, moaning, in the most terrible agony she had ever seen a human being experience. Roll him, yelled Cleo, desperate to do something to help him. 
Roll him over to get the flames out. Both officers knelt, nodding, and rolled him, then over again, then one more time, away from the burning car, the stocky one ignoring or oblivious to his own singed brows and burnt face. The burning hood had partially melted into the victim's face and head, and his shell-suit trousers had melted around his legs. Through the stench of molten plastic, Cleo suddenly caught a momentarily tantalising smell of roasting pork, before revulsion kicked in at the realisation of what it actually was. Water, she said, her first aid course from years ago coming back to her. He needs water and he needs covering. Seal the air off. Her eyes jumped from the terrible suffering of the man in the road to the fiercely burning interior of her car, frantically trying to think if she had anything she needed in the glove compartment or boot. Not that there was much she could do about it. There's a blanket in the boot, she said, a picnic blanket. Could wrap him. Need to stop the air. One of the officers sprinted up the road. Cleo stared down at the writhing, blackened figure. He was shaking, vibrating, as if he was plugged into an electrical socket. She was scared that he was dying. She knelt beside him. She wanted to hold his hand, to comfort him, but he looked so painfully blackened. He'll be okay, she said gently. You'll be okay. Help's coming. There's an ambulance coming. You're going to be fine. He was rolling his head from side to side, his mouth open, the lips blistered, making pitiful, croaking sounds. He was just a kid, maybe not even twenty. What's your name? she asked him gently. He was barely able to focus on her. You'll be okay, you will. The officer came running back, holding two coats. Help me wrap these around him. He's covered in molten fabric. Do you think we should try and get it off? she asked. No, just get these around him, tight as we can. She heard a siren in the distance, faint at first, but rapidly getting louder, then another, followed by a third. From the darkness of the interior of his Prius, the time billionaire watched Cleo Mori and the two police officers kneeling on the ground. He heard the sirens. A splinter of blue light skittered past his eyes. He watched the first police car arrive, two fire engines, then a third, an ambulance. He watched everything. He didn't have anything else to spend his time on tonight. He was still there, watching, as dawn was breaking, and the low loader arrived and craned the MG, its interior all blackened but the exterior looking fine, considering, out of its space and carted it away. Suddenly the street seemed quiet. But inside his car, the time billionaire was raging. Chapter 103 The alarm was due to go off in a few minutes at 5.30, but Roy Grace was already wide awake, listening to the dawn chorus, thinking. Cleo was awake too. He could hear the scratching of her eyelashes on the pillow each time she blinked. They lay on their sides, two spoons. He held her naked body tightly in his arms. I love you, he whispered. I love you so much, she whispered back. Her voice was full of fear. He had still been in the office at 1am, preparing for his meeting with the CPS solicitor, when she'd rung him, sounding truly terrible. He'd gone straight over to her house, and then, in between comforting her, had spent much of the next hour on the phone, tracking down the two officers who had first arrived on the scene. Eventually he'd got through to an undercover PC on the car crime unit called Trevor Salis, to explain what they'd been doing. It had been a sting to catch the ringleader of a gang. According to Salis, a local low-life villain had been cooperating with the police, and in one of life's coincidences, it had been Cleo's car that was targeted. Something had gone badly wrong, it appeared, in the thief's attempt to hot-wire it. MGTF cars were, it appeared, notoriously hard to steal. The explanation had calmed Cleo down but something that he couldn't quite put a finger on bothered Grace deeply about the incident. The would-be thief was now in the intensive care unit at the Royal Sussex County Hospital. God help him in that place, he thought privately, and he was due to be transferred, if he survived the next few hours, to the Burns unit at East Grinstead. The other officer, Paul Packer, was also in the same hospital, with severe but not life-threatening burns. What could make a car catch fire? A low-life jerk, fiddling with wires he did not understand, rupturing a fuel pipe. 
The thoughts were still churning through his tired brain when the alarm started beeping. He had exactly one hour to get home, shower, put on a fresh shirt. There was another press conference scheduled for later this morning and get to the office. Take the day off, he said. I wish. He kissed her goodbye. Chris Binns, the CPS solicitor who had been allocated to the Katie Bishop case, was, in Grace's opinion, which was one shared by a good many other officers, several miles up his own backside. The two of them had had plenty of encounters in the past, and there wasn't a huge amount of love lost. Grace viewed his own job as principally to serve decent society by catching criminals and bringing them to justice. Binns viewed his priority as saving the Crown Prosecution Service unwarranted expense in pursuing cases where they might not secure a conviction. Despite the early hour, Binns entered Grace's office looking and smelling as fresh as a rose. A tall, trim man in his mid-thirties, sporting a bouffant hairstyle, he had a large, aquiline nose, giving his face the hawkish look of a bird of prey. He was dressed in a well-cut dark grey suit that was too heavy for this weather, Grace thought, a white shirt, sharp tie, and black oxfords that he must have spent the whole night buffing. So nice to see you, Roy, he said in his supercilious voice, giving Grace's hand a limp, moist shake. He sat down at the small, round conference table and placed his upright black calfskin attaché case down on the floor beside him, giving it a stern look for a moment, as if it was a pet dog he had commanded to sit. Then he opened the case and produced a large, hardbound notebook from it and a Mont Blanc fountain pen from his breast pocket. I appreciate you coming in so early, Grace said, stifling a yawn, his eyes heavy from tiredness. Can I get you any tea, coffee, water? Some tea, uh, milk, no sugar, thanks. Grace picked up the phone and asked Eleanor, who had also come in early at his request, to get them one tea and a coffee that was as strong as she could possibly make it. Binns read through the notes in his book for a moment, then looked up. So you arrested Brian Desmond Bishop at 8 p.m. on Monday? Yes, correct. Can you recap on your grounds for charging him? Any issues we should be concerned about? Grace summarised the key evidence as being the presence of Bishop's DNA in the semen found in Katie Bishop's vagina, the insurance policy taken out on her life just six months previously, and her infidelity. He also pointed out Bishop's two previous convictions for violent acts against women. He raised the issue of Bishop's alibi, but then showed the solicitor the timeline sheet he had typed up last night after getting back from London demonstrating that Bishop would have had enough leeway to get to Brighton and murder his wife, and then return to London. I imagine he would have been a bit tired on the golf course on Friday morning, Chris Binns said dryly. Apparently he was playing a blinder, Grace said. Binns raised an eyebrow, and for a moment Grace's spirits sank, wondering if Binns was now going to nitpick and request witness statements from Bishop's golfing partners. But, to his relief, all he added was, could have been on an adrenaline rush, from the excitement of the kill. Grace smiled. For a welcome change, the man was on his side. The CPS solicitor shot his cuff, revealing elegant gold links, and frowned at his watch. So, how are we doing now? Grace had been keeping a tight eye on the time. It was five to seven. Following our conversation last night, Bishop's solicitor was contacted. He's meeting with his client at seven. D.S. Branson, accompanied by D.S. Nicol, will charge him. At 7.30, Glenn Branson and Nicol, accompanied by a custody sergeant, entered the interview room, where Brian Bishop was already seated with his solicitor. Bishop, in his paper suit, had dark rings under his eyes, and his skin had already taken on a prison pallor. He had shaved, but clearly in a poor light or in a hurry, and had missed a couple of spots, and his hair was not looking as neat as before. After just thirty-six hours, he was already looking like an old lag. That's what prison did to people, Glenn knew. It institutionalised them more quickly than they realised. Leighton Lloyd looked up at Branson and Nickel. Good morning, gentlemen. I hope you are now going to release my client. I'm afraid, sir, that following inquiries made last night, we have sufficient evidence to charge your client. Bishop's whole body sagged. His mouth fell open and he turned to his solicitor, bewildered. Leighton Lloyd jumped to his feet. 
And what about my client's alibi? Everything has been looked into, Branson said. This is preposterous, the solicitor protested. My client has been completely open with you. He's answered everything you've asked him. That will be noted at trial, Branson responded. Then, cutting to the chase, he addressed Bishop directly. Brian Desmond Bishop, you are charged that on or about the 4th of August of this year, at Brighton in the county of East Sussex, you did unlawfully kill Catherine Margaret Bishop. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something which you later rely on in court. Anything you say may be given in evidence. Is that clear? Bishop glanced at his solicitor again, then back at Branson. Yes. The word came out as a whisper. Branson turned to Leighton Lloyd. We will be making arrangements to put your client before Brighton Magistrates Court at two o'clock this afternoon, when we will be requesting a remand in custody. We will be making an... Yes, Grace said. Could be. But equally, it's typical behaviour of someone in a highly agitated state. Diagon clicked the remote again. It was darker on the screen now. The image was a rear view of a man who strongly resembled Bishop, in the same place as the earlier photograph, passing along the arches. At 8.54, DC Corbin read on, Bishop was again recorded on the same CCTV camera as at 8.14, this time walking in the opposite direction. From the phone mask log, we have the information that he headed west again in the direction of Lansdowne Place Hotel. A, a member of the hotel reception staff recalls that Bishop returned to the hotel at approximately 9.25 when she gave him the message that Detective Superintendent Grace had left for him. She looked up at Grace. He then rang you at 9.30. Yes. But then he drove up to Sussex House where Detective Superintendent Grace and D.S. Branson interviewed him the interview commencing at 10.22. According to the phone mask plot, Bishop did not leave the hotel until 9.49. He'd have driven almost past Sophie Harrington's door on his way from the hotel to here, Glenn Branson said. The drive here would have been at least 15 minutes. I only live half a dozen streets along from the Lansdowne, Grace replied. I do the drive every day, at all times of the day and night. It always takes 15 to 20 minutes. So that would have left him 18 minutes to kill Sophie Harrington. Impossible. Not with what was done to her, all those holes drilled in her back. He couldn't have done that and cleaned himself up in that time frame. I agree, Dygan said. Which means we have a problem, Grace said. Either Bishop didn't kill Sophie Harrington, or he had an accomplice. Or... He fell silent. Chapter 106 Grace went straight from the briefing meeting, past his office, past the mostly empty desks and offices of the detective's room, and put his head around the door of Brian Cook's office. He was relieved to see the scientific support branch manager was still at work. Cook was on the phone, making what sounded like a private call, but waved him in, cheerily told the person at the other end that he would hold him to that drink, and hung up. Roy, has John Pringle contacted you yet about Cleo Mori's car? he asked. No. I put him on it today, told him to report to you. Thanks, Brian. Changing the subject, Grace said, Tell me something. What do you know about the DNA of twins? What do you want to know? How close would the DNA of identical twins be? It would be identical. Completely? Well, one hundred percent. The fingerprints would be different, interestingly, but the DNA would be an exact match. Grace thanked him and walked along to his own office. He went and closed the door, then sat quietly at his desk for some moments, planning what he was going to say very carefully before he rang the mobile number in front of him. Leighton Lloyd, the man answered, his voice crisp and ready for a fight, as if he already knew who his caller was. It's Detective Superintendent Grace, Mr. Lloyd. Can we have this conversation off the record? There was some surprise in the solicitor's tone. Yes, OK. We're off the record. Do you have some new information? We have some concerns, Grace said, remaining guarded. He still didn't trust the man. Would you happen to know if your client has a twin? Well, he hasn't mentioned anything. Do you want to elaborate on this? 
Lloyd asked. Not at this stage. It might be helpful to all of us if we could establish or eliminate this. Could you ask your client urgently? It's after visiting hours. Can you authorize Lewis Prison to let me speak to my client on the phone? Yes, I'll get that done now. Would you like me to call you back tonight? I'd appreciate it. As Grace hung up, his phone rang again almost immediately. Roy Grace, he answered. The voice at the other end sounded very serious and pensive. Uh, Detective Superintendent, it's Sir uh, John Pringle. I'm with Socco, and I was asked to look at a fire-damaged MG motor car that was brought into the pound this morning. Uh, Brian Cook told me to report my findings to you. Yes, thank you. He said you'd be calling. I've just completed my examination of the vehicle, sir. Extensive fire damage to the interior has caused some of the wiring to melt, so I can't give as complete a report as I would have liked. Understood. What I can say, sir, is that the fire wasn't caused by anyone trying to steal the vehicle or by vandalism. There was a long silence. Grace clamped the phone tighter to his ear and hunched over his desk. I'm listening. What did cause it? The vehicle had been tampered with. Deliberate sabotage without any question. An extra set of fuel injectors had been added and positioned to spray petrol directly into the driver footwell when the ignition was switched on. A wiring loop had been connected from the starter motor so as to send out sparks into the footwell when it activated. Combined with that, although it's hard to be certain, because so much of the wiring has melted, it looks to me as if the wiring of the central door locking had been altered, so that once locked, the doors could not be unlocked. Grace felt a cold prickle crawl down his spine. This had been done by someone very clever, someone who knew exactly what they were doing. It wasn't about harming the car, Detective Superintendent. In my view, they were intending to kill the driver. Grace sat on one of the two large red sofas in the downstairs room of Cleo's house, with Cleo snuggled up beside him, the empty fish tank sitting on the table still filled with water. He had one arm draped around her, and he was holding a large glass of Glenfiddich and ice with his free hand. Her hair smelled freshly washed and fragrant. She felt warm, alive, so intensely, beautifully alive, and so vulnerable. He was scared as hell for her. Bizet's The Pearl Fishers was playing on the hi-fi. It was exquisite music, but it was too poignant, too sad for this moment. He needed silence or something cheerful, but he didn't know what. He suddenly felt that he didn't know anything, except for this, that he loved this beautiful, warm, funny creature he was holding. He loved her truly and deeply, more than he'd ever imagined he could love anyone after Sandy, and that somehow... He had to let Sandy go. He didn't want her shadow destroying this relationship. And he couldn't stop thinking what would have happened if that sad little villain, who was still fighting for his life, had not beaten her to her car. If there'd been no police stakeout, nobody around to pull her out. The thought was almost unbearable. Some psycho had planned to kill her and had gone to great trouble. Who? Why? And if that person had tried once and failed, then was he, or she, going to try again? His mind went back to Sunday, when someone had sliced open the soft top of the MG. Was that just a coincidence, or was there a connection? Tomorrow a detective would sit down with her and go through a list of all the people she might have upset during her work. There were plenty of relatives of victims who got angry about their loved ones having post-mortems and invariably they took their anger out on Cleo rather than on the coroner, who was actually the person responsible for that decision. Cleo had initially greeted the news with disbelief, but during the past hour, since he had arrived home, it was starting to sink in, and the shock was now hitting her. She leaned down, picked up her wine glass and drained it. What I don't understand is... She stopped in mid-sentence, as if a thought had struck her. If someone was going to wire my car to blow up, wouldn't they do it to make it look like an accident? They'd know that forensics will be crawling all over it afterwards. It sounds like what this person did made it look very obvious. You're right. Whoever it was, they did. They made it very obvious. Although I doubt they could have easily disguised what was done. I'm not a mechanic, but it was a lot more elaborate than just crossing a couple of wires. It was vicious, sadistic, he thought but did not say. 
He hadn't yet told her that her car was now being treated as a crime scene, the event categorized as a major incident, with a senior investigating officer being appointed in a full inquiry team. She turned and looked at him with round, worried eyes. I just can't think of anyone who could have done this, Roy. What about your ex? Richard? Yes. She shook her head. No, he wouldn't go this far. He stalked you for months. You had to threaten him with a court order at one point. That was when he backed off, you said. But some stalkers don't go away. I just can't imagine him doing this. Didn't you say he raced cars? We well, did, until God started occupying his weekends. Grace's mobile rang. He put his glass down and disentangled himself from Cleo to retrieve it from his jacket pocket. Glancing at the caller display, he saw it was Lloyd. Roy Grace, he answered. OK, I've spoken to my client, the solicitor said. He was adopted. He doesn't know anything about his birth parents. Does he know anything about his background at all? He only found out he was adopted after the death of his parents. After his mother died, he was going through her papers and found his original birth certificate. It was a big shock. He didn't know. Has he made any attempt to find his birth parents? He says he had been planning to quite recently, but hadn't yet done anything about it. Grace thought for a moment. Did he by any chance tell you where his birth certificate is? Yes, it's in a filing cabinet in his office at Dyke Road Avenue. It's in a folder marked Personal. Would you like to tell me any more? Not at this stage, Grace replied. But thank you. I'll let you know what I find. He ended the call, then immediately dialed the number of the Operation Chameleon incident room. Chapter 107 Despite being desperately tired, Grace slept fitfully, woken by the slightest noise and not settling again each time until he was certain that it had come from outside Cleo's house, not from inside. His mind was a jumble of dark thoughts. A burning MG, a tattoo, a gas mask, a body with crabs falling off it, rolling through the surf on a Brighton beach, Janet McWhirter's smiling, cheerful face in her PNC office. Clear the ground under your feet. The words of his own mentor, the recently retired Chief Superintendent Dave Gaylor, were rolling around like surf inside his head. Gaylor had been a detective inspector when Grace had first met him, the youngest ever DI in Sussex. Twelve years his senior, Gaylor had taught him much that he knew today. In a sense, his own attempts at helping Glenn Branson were his way of passing that knowledge on. Clear the ground under your feet. It was an old CID expression. Gaylor had always impressed on him the importance of looking at what was immediately around you when you were at a crime scene, of not ignoring anything, however irrelevant it might seem at the time. He'd also told Grace that if something felt wrong, then it probably was wrong. Janet McWhirter's death felt wrong to him. The words of one of his own personal mantras, cause and effect, were also tumbling around in his mind. Cause and effect cause and effect. After fifteen years in the police PNC department, Janet McWhirter falls in love. She goes for a career change, a lifestyle change, plans to move to Australia. Was the cause of her lifestyle change the man she met, and the effect for her to end up dead? It was really troubling him. Dawn was breaking outside. Grace had never been afraid of the dark, even as a child perhaps because he knew his policeman dad was there, in the next room, to protect him. But he had been worried during these past hours of darkness now, concerned who might be out there wanting to harm Cleo. Her insanely jealous ex fiance Richard? Richard Northrop Turner. The man who had stalked Cleo relentlessly and increasingly nastily until she had threatened to go to court. Then he had gone away, or so it seemed. Richard Northrop Turner, who raced cars and did the mechanics himself. Despite all Cleo's protestations that she did not believe her ex would go as far as trying to kill her, the first call he would make this morning when he left here would be to the SIO on the investigation into her attempted murder, a competent DI called Roger Pohl, and suggest they concentrate on Richard Northrop Turner as the prime suspect. 
Cleo stirred and he kissed her lightly on the forehead, feeling her warm, sour breath on his face. He wanted to move her out of here and into his own house for the next few days, which would, ideally, mean getting rid of his lodger. For some moments as he lay awake, he wondered whether he could do a swap with Cleo, let Glen Branson come and stay here and act as a guard while she stayed with him. But when he suggested it to her as he was getting dressed a while later, she was less than enthusiastic. It's safe here, she said. There's only one way in and out, through the front gates. I feel secure here. You're not secure when you leave here. How many more nights are you on call-out? All this week. If you have to go out again in the middle of the night, I'm coming with you. Oh, you're sweet. Thank you. How secure are you at the mortuary? The doors are always locked. I have Darren there all the time, and Walter Horden most of the time as well. I'm going to get extra patrols around here at night, and also our patrols keep an extra vigilant eye around the mortuary. Do you have a reasonably recent photograph of Richard? Loads, Cleo said, on my computer. Email me one this morning, something that's a good likeness. I'm going to get it circulated to the local police, in case they see him anywhere. OK. How will you get to work today? Darren's picking me up. Good. Grace told Cleo he would bring round a Chinese takeaway tonight, as soon as he could get away, and a bottle of wine. She kissed him goodbye, telling him she thought that was a very good plan. It was a quarter to six when he left the house, and he just about had time to dash back to his home to shower, shave and change. He entered as quietly as possible so as not to wake up Glen Branson, more to avoid having to endure another round of early morning soul-searching from his friend than from any concern for the detective sergeant getting his requisite hours of beauty sleep. As usual, Glenn had left the living room looking like a tip. CDs and DVDs, pulled from their sleeves, were spread around everywhere, and the detritus of some reheated ready meal in a foil box, fish pie it smelled like, was lying on and around a tray on the carpet, along with two empty cans of Coke and an ice cream carton. Grace got himself ready and fled, pausing only to slip a CD from a rapper he'd never heard of into the living room hi-fi and switch it on, turning the volume up high enough to shake a man's fillings out five miles away. It was far too loud for him to hear Glenn Branson's shouts and curses as he drove away. Chapter 108 There was a brown envelope lying on Roy Grace's desk when he walked in, just before seven, with an explanatory note from Bella Moy taped on top, stating these were the certificates for Brian Bishop he'd requested. She had also written down the name and contact details of a post-adoption counsellor, who, she said, had previously helped the local police through the obstacle course of finding out information on adopted people. Inside were two creased, oblong documents, about six inches high and a foot wide. They were on yellowing paper with red printing, and handwritten details inserted in black fountain pen ink. He unfolded the first one. It was headed, Certified Copy of an Entry of Birth. Under that were a series of columns. When and Where Born, 7th of September 1964, at 3.47am, Royal Sussex County Hospital, Brighton. Name, if any, Desmond William. Sex, boy. Name and surname of father. Name and maiden surname of mother, Eleanor Jones. Then, in a space at the extreme right, was written, Adopted. It was signed, Albert Hull, Superintendent Registrar. Grace then unfolded the second document. It was headed, Certified Copy of an Entry in the Records of the General Register Office. At the very bottom of the document were the words, Certified Copy of an Entry in the Adopted Children Register. Then he read along the columns. Date of entry, 19th of September, 1964. Name of adopted child, Brian Desmond. Sex of adopted child, male. Name and surname, address and occupation of adopter or adopters, Mr. Rodney and Mrs. Irene Bishop, 43 Brangwyn Road, Brighton, company director. Date of birth of child, 7th of September, 1964. Date of adoption order and description of court by which made Brighton County Court. Signature of officer deputed by Registrar General to attest the entry, Albert Hole. He read both documents through again carefully, absorbing the details. 
Then he looked at his watch. It was too early to call the post-adoption counsellor, so he decided he would do it straight after the 8.30 briefing. Loretta Lebanite, she answered in a warm, gravelly voice. Grace introduced himself and explained briefly what he was looking for. You want to try and find out if this Prime Bishop has a twin? Exactly, he replied. OK, uh, what information do you have on him? I have his birth certificate and what appears to be an adoption certificate. Is it a long birth certificate or a short one? Grace described it to her. Good, she said. It's the long one. And more information on it. Now, there's uh, usually one sure way to tell if the birth is in England and Wales, is it? Yes, he was born in Brighton. Can you read out to me what it says under uh, when and where born? Grace obliged. It says 7th of September 1964 at 3.47am? She checked. Yes. And the place of birth is given as where? She asked, checking again. Brighton, the Royal Sussex County Hospital. You have the information right there. She sounded pleased. I do. In England and Wales, the time of birth, in addition to the date of birth, is only put down for multiple births. From that information, Detective Superintendent, you can be 100% certain that Brian Bishop has a twin. Chapter 109 Minutes after its 10am opening time, Nick Nicole walked through the entrance scanner poles and into the handsome pastel blue room of the Brighton Reference Library. The smells of paper, leather and wood reminded him of school, but he was so exhausted from yet another virtually sleepless night, courtesy of his son, Ben, that he barely took in his surroundings. He walked over to the inquiry desk and showed his warrant card to one of the librarians, explaining what he needed. Five minutes later the young detective was seated beneath the domed and stuccoed ceiling in front of one of a bank of microfish units holding a rectangle of film with a red band along the top, which contained the register of births in the whole of the UK for the third quarter of 1964. He inserted it the wrong way around three times, before finally getting the hang of the reader. Then he fiddled with the jerky controls, trying to scroll through the lists of first names beneath surname headers, in print that was almost too small and blurry to read, for his tired eyes at any rate. As directed by the helpful post-adoption counsellor Loretta Lebanite, he was looking for unmarried mothers with the surname Jones. The clear indicators would be a child with the same surname as the mother's maiden name, although with one as common as Jones, the librarian had warned him there would be some instances of two persons marrying who had the same surname. Despite the words, Silence Please, written in large, clear gold letters on a wooden board, a father somewhere behind him was explaining something to a very loud-mouthed, inquisitive boy. Nick made a mental note never to let his son speak that loudly in a library. He was fast losing track of all the mental notes he had made about irritating things he was not going to let his son do when he was older. He totally doted on him, but the whole business of being a parent was starting to seem daunting, and no one had ever really, properly warned him that you had to do all this while suffering sleep deprivation. Had he and Jen really had a sex life once? Most of their former life together now seemed a distant memory. Near him, a fan hummed, swivelling on a stand, momentarily fluttering a sheaf of papers before it turned away again. Names in white letters on the dark screen in front of him sped past. Finally, he found Jones. Belinda, Bernard, Beverly, Brett, Carl... Caroline. Jiggling the flat metal handle awkwardly, he lost the Jones list altogether for a moment. Then, more by serendipity than skill, he found it again. Daniela, Daphne, David, Davis, Dean, Delia, Denise, Dennis. Then he came to a Desmond and stopped. Desmond was Bishop's first name on his birth certificate. Desmond. Mother's maiden name, Trevor's born in Romford. Not the right one. Desmond, mother's maiden name, Jones, born in Brighton. Desmond Jones, mother's maiden name, Jones. Bingo! And there was no other Desmond Jones on the list. Now he just had to find another match of the mother's first and maiden name. 
But that was a bigger problem than he had anticipated. There were twenty-seven matches. He wrote each one down, then hurried from the library to his next port of call, phoning Roy Grace the moment he was out of the door. Deciding it would be quicker to leave his car in the NCP, he walked, heading past the Royal Pavilion in the Theatre Royal, cutting through the narrow streets of the lanes, which were lined mostly with second-hand jewellery shops, and emerged opposite the imposing grey building of the town hall. Five minutes later he was in a small waiting room in the registrar's offices with hard grey chairs, parquet flooring and a large tank of tropical fish. Grace joined him a few minutes later. The post-adoption counsellor had advised them that they would probably need to pull rank in order to get the information they required. A tall, urbane, but rather Harris-looking man of fifty, smartly dressed in a suit and tie, and perspiring from both the heat and clearly being in a rush, came in. Yes, gentlemen, he said. I'm Clive Ravensbourne, the superintendent registrar. You wanted to see me rather than one of my colleagues. Thank you, Grace said. I appreciate you seeing us at such short notice. You'll have to excuse me for making this brief, but I'm doing a wedding in ten minutes' time, he glanced at his watch. Actually, nine minutes. I explained to your assistant why we needed to see you. Did she brief you? Yes, yes, a murder inquiry. Nicole handed him the list of twenty-seven Jones births. We're looking for a twin, he said. What we need is for you to tell us if any of these boys is a twin of... He pointed at the name. Desmond William Jones. The registrar looked panic-stricken for a moment. How many names do you have on this list? Twenty-seven. Uh, we need you to look at the records and see if you can get a match from any of them. We're pretty sure one of them is a twin, and we need to find him urgently. He glanced at his watch again. I don't have the... I... Oh, hang on. We could short-circuit this. He nodded to himself. Do you have a birth certificate for this Desmond William Jones? We have copies of the original and the adoption certificate, Nicole replied. Just give me the birth certificate. There'll be an index number on it. Nicole pulled it out of the envelope and handed it to him. He unfolded it and scanned it quickly. There, you see, he said, pointing at the left-hand edge of the document. Just wait here. I'll be right back. He disappeared through the doorway and re-emerged after a couple of minutes, holding a large, dark-red, leather-bound registry book. Still standing, he opened it approximately halfway through and quickly turned over several pages. Then he appeared to relax a little. Here we are, he said. Desmond William Jones, mother Eleanor Jones, born at the Royal Sussex County Hospital, 7th of September 1964, at 3.47 a.m., and it says... Adopted, right? Got the right chap? Grace and Nicol both nodded. Good. So right underneath it, bottom of the page, we have Frederick Roger Jones, mother Eleanor Jones, born at the Royal Sussex County Hospital, 7th of September 1964, at 4.05 a.m. Also subsequently adopted. He looked up with a smile. He sounds the ticket to me. Born 18 minutes later. That's your twin, Frederick Roger Jones. Grace felt a real surge of excitement. Thank you. That's enormously helpful. Can you give us any further information? The registrar shut the book very firmly. I'm afraid that's as much as I can do for you. Adoption records are more tightly protected than the crown jewels. You'll now have to do battle with social services. And good luck to you. Ten minutes later, most of them spent on his mobile phone in the hallway of the town hall, being shunted from extension to extension within social services, Grace was beginning to understand what the man had meant. And after a further five minutes on hold, listening to a perpetual loop of green sleeves, he was ready to kill. Chapter 110 Twenty minutes later, still standing in the grand entrance of the town hall, Grace finally got put through to the Director of Social Services, managing, just, to keep his temper under control. He explained the circumstances and his reasons for needing access to an adoption file. The man listened sympathetically. Of course, Sir Detective Superintendent, you understand that to do this would be a very big exception to our policy, he said pedantically. I would need to be able to justify releasing this information to you, and I would need assurances that it would only be for the purposes you've outlined. 
Some adopted people do not know they are adopted. The effects on them from hearing the news can be very traumatic. Probably not as traumatic as it was for the two women who have been murdered in this city in the past week, Grace responded, or for the next woman on this maniac's list. There was a brief silence. And you really think this twin might be the killer? As I've just told you, it's possible he could be responsible, and if he is, he could kill again. I think the public safety is more important at this stage than hurting the feelings of one middle-aged man. If we did release information that would enable you to find him, what would your intentions be? My intentions? I don't have any interest or agenda for this information, other than finding the man as quickly as possible, with a view to questioning him and eliminating him from our inquiries. Or arresting him? I can't speculate. But if we have reason to believe, after interviewing him, that he is involved in the very savage murders of two innocent young women, then that is almost certain, yes. There was another long silence. Grace felt his temper straining again, pulling like a tattooed pit bull terrier on a leash, and the leash was fraying. It's a difficult decision for us. I appreciate that. But if a third person is murdered, and it turns out that this twin was the killer, or could have led us to the killer, and you could have prevented it, how would you feel about that? I'll have to make a phone call and check something with our legal department. Can you give me five minutes? I need to make a decision whether to go back to my office or hang around downtown, Grace replied. Will it be just five minutes or longer? I will be very quick. Detective Superintendent, I assure you. Grace used the time to make a quick call to Roger Pohl, the SIO on the investigation into the attempted murder of Cleo Mori, to get a progress update. Two officers had gone this morning to interview her former fiancé, Richard Northrop Turner, at his chambers in Chichester, Pohl told him, and it looked like the barrister had an alibi. Before they'd finished speaking, Grace's phone started beeping with an incoming call. He thanked Paul and switched to the new call. It was the Director of Social Services again. All right, Detective Superintendent, you won't need to explain all this to the post-adoption social worker. I will get her to bring you the file and let you have the information you require. Is it the names of the people who have adopted Frederick Roger Jones that would suffice for your purposes? That would be a good starting point, Grace responded. Thank you. A bus rumbled past the first floor window of the small, sparsely furnished conference room in the council office building. Grace glanced out, through the Venetian blinds, at the pink banner advertising the television series Sugar Rush below its top deck. He'd been sitting in this damn room with Nick Nicole for over a quarter of an hour, with no offer of a coffee or even a glass of water. The morning was slipping by, but they were at least making some progress. His nerves were badly on edge. He was trying to concentrate on his own cases, but he could not stop thinking and worrying about Cleo almost every second. "'How's your lad?' he asked the young DC, who was yawning and pallid-faced despite the glorious summer weather. "'Wonderful,' he said. "'Ben's just amazing, but he doesn't sleep very well. "'Good at changing nappies, are you? "'I'm becoming world-class.' A leaflet on the table was headed Brighton and Hove City Council Directorate of Children, Families and Schools. On the walls were posters of smiling, cute-looking children of different races. Finally the door opened and a young woman entered, managing to put Grace's back up even before she opened her mouth, just from the way she looked, combined with her scowl. She was in her mid-thirties, thin as a rake, with a pointed nose, a hoop-shaped mouth ringed with red lipstick, and her hair was dyed a vivid fuchsia, gelled into small, aggressive-looking spikes. She was wearing an almost full-length printed muslin dress and what Grace thought might be vegan sandals, and was carrying a buff file folder with a post-it note stuck to it. "'You're the two from the police?' she asked coldly, in a South London accent, her eyes behind emerald-framed glasses, finding a gap between the two detectives. Grace, followed by Nicol, stood up. Detective Superintendent Grace and Detective Constable Nicole from Sussex CID, Grace said. Without giving her name, she said, The director has told me that you want to know the adopted name of Frederick Jones, who was born on the 7th of September 1964. 
Now she looked straight at Grace, still intensely hostile. Yes, that's right, thank you, he said. She pulled the post-it note off the folder and handed it to him. On it was written, in neat handwriting, the name Tripwell, Derek and Joan. He showed it to Nick Nicole, then looked at the folder. Is there anything else in here that could give us any help? I'm sorry, I'm not authorised, she said, avoiding eye contact again. Did your director not explain that this is a murder inquiry? It's also someone's private life, she retorted. All I need is an address for the adoptive parents, Derek and Joan Tripwell, he said, reading from the yellow note. Then he nodded at the folder. You must have it in there. I've been told to give you their names, she said. I haven't been told to give you any more. Grace looked at her, exasperated. I can't seem to get it across. There may be other women in this city whose lives are in danger. Detective Superintendent, you and your colleagues have your job to do protecting the citizens of Brighton and Hove. I have my job to do protecting adopted children. Is that clear? Let me make something clear to you then, Grace said, glancing at Nicole and clenching up with anger. If anyone else is murdered in this city, and you are withholding information that could have enabled us to prevent it, I'm going to personally hang you out to dry. I'll look forward to it, she said, and left the room. Chapter 111 Grace was driving his Alpha up the hill, past Asda and British bookstores, about to turn in through the gates of Sussex House, when DC Pamela Buckley rang him. He stopped. I'm not sure if it's good news or bad, Detective Superintendent, she said. I've checked the phone directory and the electoral register. There are no trip walls in Brighton and Hove. I've done a broader sweep. There is one in Horsham. There are two in Southampton, one in Dover and one in Guildford. The one in Guildford matches your names, Derek and Joan. Let me have their address. He wrote it down. 18 Spencer Avenue. Can you give me directions? The traffic system in the centre of Guildford, Grace decided, had been designed by an ape, out of its mind on hallucinogenic mushrooms, who had tried to copy the Hampton Court maze in tarmac. He had got lost every time he had ever come to Guildford previously, and he got lost again now, stopping to check his street map twice and vowing to buy himself a sat-nav system at the next opportunity. After several frustrating minutes, his temper worsening along with his driving, he finally found Spencer Avenue, a cul-de-sac near the cathedral, and turned into it. It was a narrow road on a steep hill, with cars parked on both sides. There were small houses above him to the right and below to the left. He saw the number 18 on a low fence to his left, pulled his car into a gap a little further on, parked, and walked back. He went down the steps to the front door of a tiny, semi-detached house, with a trim front garden, nearly tripping over a black-and-white cat which shot across his path, and rang the doorbell. After some moments, the door was opened by a small, grey-haired woman in a strap-top vest, baggy jeans and gumboots, wearing gardening gloves. Hello, she said cheerily. He showed her his warrant card. Detective Superintendent Grace of Sussex CID. Her face dropped. Oh, dear, is it Laura again? Laura? Is she in trouble again? She had a tiny mouth that reminded him of the spout of a teapot. Oh, forgive me if I've come to the wrong address, he said. I'm looking for a Mr. Derrick and Mrs. Joan Tripwell, who adopted a boy called Frederick Jones in September 1964. She looked very distressed suddenly, her eyes all over the place. After a few moments, she said, No, you haven't. I haven't come to the wrong address. Would you like to come in? She raised her arms. Excuse my appearance. Wasn't expecting visitors. He followed her into a tiny, narrow hallway, which had a musty smell of old people and cats, then threw into a small living and dining room. The living area was dominated by a three-piece suite and a large television set on which a cricket match was playing. An elderly man, with a tartan blanket over his thighs, a sparse thatch of white hair and a hearing aid, was slumped in one of the armchairs in front of it, asleep, although from the colour of his face he could have been dead. 
Derek, she said, we've got a visitor, a police officer. The man opened one eye, said, Ah, then closed it again. Would you like a cup of tea? she asked Grace. Well, if it's no trouble, that would be very nice, thank you. She indicated the sofa. Grace stepped over the slumbering man's legs and sat down as she went out of the room. Ignoring the cricket, he concentrated on looking around the room, searching for photographs. There were several. One showed a much younger Joan and Derek with three children, two boys and a rather sullen-looking girl. Another, on top of a display cabinet filled with Capo de Monte porcelain figures, was in a silver frame. It contained a picture of a teenage boy with long, dark hair in a suit and tie, posing for the camera with what appeared to be some reluctance. But he saw in the boy's looks what resembled, very definitely, a young Brian Bishop. There was a cheer on the television, followed by clapping. He glanced at the screen and saw a helmeted batsman walking away from the crease, the middle stump behind him bent sharply back. Sure just have blocked it, the man who appeared to be asleep beside him said. Silly idiot, try to hit it through the covers. You a cricketing man? Not really, uh, rug is my game. The man grunted and fell silent. The woman came back into the room with a tray containing a china teapot, milk jug, sugar bowl, cups and saucers and a plate of biscuits. She'd removed her gardening gloves and replaced her gumboots with pom-pom slippers. Would you like tea, Derek? she said, raising her voice. Got a bloody rugger bugger in the house, he grumbled, then appeared to fall asleep again. Milk and sugar? she asked Grace, setting the tray down. He eyed the plate of biscuits on the tray hungrily, realising it was lunchtime and he'd barely had any breakfast. Uh, milk, uh, no sugar, please. She handed the plate over to him. It was laden with digestives, penguins and marshmallows. He took a penguin gratefully and unwrapped it. She poured his tea and passed it to him, then pointed at the silver-framed photograph. We didn't like the name Frederick, did we, Derek? A small negative-sounding moan came from the man's mouth. So we renamed him Richard, she said. Richard, the old man echoed with a grunt. After Richard Chamberlain, the actor, Dr. Kildare. Did you ever see Dr. Kildare? For his bloody time, her husband mumbled. I remember it vaguely, Grace confessed. My mum was a fan. He stirred his tea, anxious to get to the point of this visit. Uh, we adopted two children, Joan Tripwell said. And then our own came along, Geoffrey. He's doing well. He does research for a pharmaceutical company, Pfizer, working on cancer drugs for them. Grace smiled. Good. Laura's the problem one. That's what I thought you had come about. She's always been in trouble. Drugs. It's a bit ironic, isn't it? Our Geoffrey doing so well with the drugs company, and Laura in and out of homes, always in trouble with the police. And Richard, uh, how's he doing? Grace asked. Her little mouth closed, her eyes all over the place again suddenly, and Grace realised he'd touched a nerve. She poured her own tea and added two lumps of sugar, using silver tongs. What exactly is your interest in talking about Richard? she asked, her voice suddenly full of suspicion. I was hoping you could tell me where I could find him. I need to speak to him. To speak to him? She sounded astonished. Lot 437, row 12, the old man suddenly said. Derek, she admonished. Well, that's where it bloody well is. What's the matter with you, woman? Excuse my husband, she said, picking her cup up daintily by the handle. He's never really got over it. I suppose neither of us has. Got over what? Grace probed as gently as he could. He was a premature baby, like his brother, poor little soul. He was born with a congenital weakness, malformed lungs. They never developed properly. He had a weak chest, you know, always getting infections as a child, and really bad asthma. What do you know about his brother? Grace asked, 
too interested now to take a bite of his penguin. That he passed away in the incubator, poor little mite. That's what they told us. What about their mother? The woman shook her head. The social services were terrible on giving out information. Tell me about it, Grace said bitterly. It took us a long time to find out there was a single parent. Of course, that was a bad thing in those days. She was killed in a car crash, but we'd never really knew the details. Are you sure that Frederick, I'm sorry, Richard, he corrected himself, that Richard's brother died? You can't be certain of anything the social services say, but that's what they told us at the time. Grace nodded sympathetically. There was another roar on the television. Grace glanced at it and saw a replay of a silly mid-on-fielder making a catch. Can you tell me where I can find your son, Richard? Already bloody told you, the old man grumbled. Plot 437, row 12. She goes there every year. I'm sorry, Grace said. I don't understand. What my husband is trying to tell you is that you are twenty years too late, she said. Too late? Grace was getting all kinds of bad, confused signals. When he was twenty-one, Joan Tripwell said, Richard went to a party and forgot to take his Ventolin inhaler. He always had to carry it with him. He had a particularly bad asthma attack. Her voice was faltering. She sniffed and dabbed her eyes. His heart gave out. Grace stared at her in astonishment. As if reading some uncertainty in his face, Joan Tripwell said emphatically, Poor soul. He died. He never really had his life. Chapter 112 After an hour's drive back, a very despondent Roy Grace reported his findings to the Operation Chameleon team in MIR-1. Then he sat down and began reviewing all the evidence they had for Brian Bishop. Convinced that Joan Tripwell had been telling the truth, he was left with a number of anomalies that did not quite fit together. It was like trying to hammer pieces into a jigsaw that looked sort of right, but were not the exact shape. He was bothered by the details of the twin that the superintendent registrar had read out to him. Grace reread the notes he'd written down in the town hall, then rechecked Bishop's birth certificate and his adoption certificate. He had been born on the 7th of September at 3.47, 18 minutes earlier than his brother, Frederick Roger Jones, who was renamed Richard and died at the age of 21. So why had social services told Joan Tripwell that the other twin had died? He rang the post-adoption counsellor, Loretta Lebanite, she responded cheerily that in those days it was exactly the kind of thing that social services might do. They didn't like to split up twins, but there was, even back then, a long list of people waiting to adopt. If one had been sickly, in an incubator for a period of time, they might have made the decision to put the healthy one out for adoption then, if the other survived, tell a white lie in order to satisfy another couple desperate for a child. It had happened to her, she added. She had a twin, yet her adoptive parents were never informed of that. From his experiences with the hag earlier, he could well believe they were capable of anything. Grace put the CCTV footage up on the monitor in the room and stared at it, checking it against the detailed mobile phone log that DC Corbin had prepared. That man up on the screen was Brian Bishop. He was absolutely certain, unless the man had an exact double but the fact that the log showed him leaving the immediate vicinity of the Lansdowne Place Hotel and then returning to it made the chance of an accidental double in exactly the right place at the right time too big a coincidence to accept. On his pad he wrote down the word complicity, followed by a big question mark. Had someone gone to the trouble of having surgery to make himself look like Brian Bishop? Then somehow obtained fresh semen from the man? His thoughts were interrupted by the sound of his name being called, and he turned his head. He saw the heavily bearded figure of George Erridge from the photographic unit. Erridge, who always looked like an explorer just returned from an expedition, was walking towards him excitedly, holding a sheaf of what looked like photographic paper in his hand. 
This CCTV footage you gave me yesterday, Roy, from the Royal Sussex County Hospital? The bearded guy in sunglasses and long hair who was in there, creating a scene on Sunday? Grace had almost forgotten about it. Yes? Well, we've got something. I've been running it through some software they've developed at the Missing Persons Helpline, yep, to detect changes of identity in people, how they might look in five, ten, twenty years' time, yep, with hair, without hair, with beards, without beards, all that stuff. I've been trying to persuade Tony Case we need to invest in it for here. Tell me, Grace said. Eridge put the first photograph down. Grace saw a man with a heavy beard and a moustache, long, straggly hair that hung low over his forehead, and large, tinted glasses, dressed in a baggy shirt over a string vest, slacks and sandals. We've had the computer remove the long hair, the beard, the sunglasses, yep? OK, Grace replied. Eridge slapped down a second photograph on Grace's desk. Recognise him? Grace was staring at Brian Bishop. For some moments he said nothing. Then he said, Bloody hell! Well done, George. How the hell did you get the eyes behind the glasses? Eridge grinned. We got lucky. There's also a CCTV camera in the men's room. Your guy took his glasses off in there to wipe them. We got footage of his eyes. Thank you, Grace said. This is ace work. Tell that tight bastard Tony Case, will you? We need this kid here. Could have got this back to you yesterday if we'd had it in-house. I'll tell him, Grace said, standing up and looking around for Adrian Corbin, the young detective constable who had been working on the phone log. Addressing no one in particular, he asked, Anyone know where D.C. Corbin is? Taking a break, Roy, Bellamoy said. Can you get hold of her? Ask her to come back here quickly. He sat down staring at each of the photographs in turn, thinking. The transformation was extraordinary, a total metamorphosis from a suave, good-looking man into someone you'd want to cross the road to avoid. Sunday, he was thinking. Bishop was at the hospital late on Sunday morning, so he was out and about. It was Sunday morning when Cleo had the roof of her car ripped open. He leafed through the timeline report until he reached Sunday morning, According to Bishop's own statement, in his first interview, he had spent the morning in his hotel room, catching up on his emails, and then had gone to some friends for Sunday lunch. There was a note that the friends, Robin and Sue Brown, had been contacted and confirmed that Bishop had arrived at half-past one and stayed with them until just after four. They lived in the village of Glind, a fifteen to twenty minute drive from the Royal Sussex County Hospital, Grace estimated. The time showing on the CCTV footage on the first photograph was 12.58. Tight, but possible. Very possible. He looked back at the timeline for earlier that morning. The duty FLO, Linda Buckley, reported that Bishop had remained in his hotel room until noon, then had left in his Bentley, telling her that he was going to the lunch and would be back later. She had logged his return at 4.45. The concern inside him was growing. Bishop could easily have diverted on his route to the hospital and gone via the mortuary. But why? What on earth would have been the point? His motive. But then again, he had no motive yet for the death of Sophie Harrington. Adrienne Corbin came hurrying into the room, puffing from exertion and perspiring, a dumpy frame clearly not suited to this hot weather. Sir, you wanted to see me? Grace apologised for cutting short her break and told her what he needed from the phone mask records and from the CCTV records. He wanted to plot Bishop's movements from midday on Sunday, when he left the hotel, to the time he arrived at the Browns' home in Glind. Old-timer, Branson, who had been sitting quietly at his workstation, suddenly spoke. What? If Bishop was treated in A&E at the hospital, he'd have had to sign the register, right? And suddenly Grace realised just how tired he was and what an addling effect it was having on his mind. How on earth could he have overlooked that? You know what, he replied. I'm all ears. Sometimes I actually think you do have a brain. Chapter 113 Finding a route through the red tape of social services had been a doddle compared to the phone marathon that now ensued with the Brighton Healthcare Trust, Grace rapidly discovered. It took Glenn Branson over an hour and a half of being shunted from official to official and waiting for people to come out of meetings, 
before he finally got through to the one manager who was in a position to sanction the release of confidential patient information. And then only after Grace had been put on the line and pleaded his case. The next problem was that no one by the name of Bishop had been seen at the A&E department on Sunday, and 17 people had been treated for hand injuries during the day. Fortunately, Dr. Raj Singh was on duty, and Grace dispatched Branson to the hospital with a photograph from the CCTV in the hope that Singh would recognise him. Just after 4.30, he stepped out of MIR1 and phoned Cleo to see how she was. Quiet day, she said, sounding tired but reasonably cheerful. I've had two detectives here all the time, going through the register. I'm just tidying up with Darren, then he's driving me home. How's you? Grace relayed the conversation with D.I. Pole he'd had earlier. I didn't think it was Richard, she said, sounding strangely relieved, which annoyed him. He was being irrational, he knew, but there was a warmth in her voice whenever she mentioned her ex which concerned him. As if it was over, but not really over completely. Are you going to be working late? she asked. I don't know yet. I have the 6.30 briefing and I'll have to see what that throws up. What do you fancy for supper? You. How would you like me garnished? Naked, with just a lettuce leaf. Then get yourself over here as early as you can. I need your body. Love you, he said. I quite like you too, she said. Deciding to take advantage of the first free moment he'd had all day, Grace walked across to the PNC unit at the far end of the building, where poor Janet McWhorter had spent so much of her working life. Normally, the large office area, with many of its team civilian computer staff, had a lively buzz of activity. But this afternoon there was a subdued atmosphere. He knocked on the door of one of the few enclosed offices. It had been Janet McWhorter's room and now, according to the label on the wall, housed Lorna Baxter, PNC and Disclosure Unit Manager. He had known her, like Janet, for a long time and liked her a lot. Without waiting for a reply, he opened the door. Lorna, who was in her mid-thirties, was heavily pregnant. Her brown hair, normally long, was cropped short into a clumsy monk's fringe, which accentuated the weight that had gone onto her face, and although she was dressed lightly in a loose floral patterned dress, she was clearly suffering in the heat. She was talking on the phone, but signalled at him cheerfully to come in, pointing to a chair in front of her desk. He closed the door and sat down. It was a small square room, her desk and chair, two visitor chairs, a tall metal filing cabinet and a stack of box files just about filling it. There was a Bart Simpson cartoon pinned to the wall on his right with coloured drawing pins and a sheet of paper on which was crayoned a large heart and the words, I love you, mummy. She ended the call. Hey, Roy, she said. Good to see you. Then she shrugged. Palmer, isn't it? She had a strong South African accent despite having lived over twelve years in England. Janet? She grimaced. We were good friends. So what happened exactly? I heard that she fell in love with someone and was moving to Australia with him to get married. Yes, she was so happy. You know, she was thirty-six and had never really had a serious boyfriend before. I think she almost resigned herself to being single for the rest of her life. Then she met this fellow and he clearly shot the lights out for her. She was a changed person in weeks. In what way? She had a total makeover. Hair, clothes, everything. And she looked so happy. And then she wound up murdered. That's what it sounds like. What do you or anyone here know about this man, her fiancé? Not much. She was a very private person. I probably knew her as well as anyone, but she was a real class book. It was a long while before she even admitted to me that she was dating. She didn't say much about it, although she did let on that he was very wealthy, a house in Brighton and a flat in London. The big but was that he was married, planning to leave his wife. For Janet, that's what he told her. And she believed him. Totally. Any idea what he did? He was in software, she said. Something to do with uh, rostering? A very successful company, apparently. He was opening up in Australia and decided he wanted to make a new life there with Janet. Rostering. Grace was thinking hard. Rostering. 
That was the business Bishop was in. Did she ever tell you his name? No, nah, she wouldn't tell me. She kept telling me she couldn't give me his name because he was married, and she'd sworn to keep their affair secret. She was hardly the type to blackmail someone, Grace said, and I wouldn't have thought she had a lot of money. No, nah, she didn't. She used to travel to work on an old Vesper. So what could have been his motive for killing her, assuming he did? Or maybe they were both killed, she replied, and only her body has turned up. That's possible. Someone after him, and she just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Hmm, wouldn't be the first time. Have you heard anything from the investigating team? Not much progress so far. There's just one small thing that's interesting. What's that? I saw Ray Packham earlier, from the high-tech crime unit. Yes, I know him, he's smart. He's been running forensic software on the computer Janet used here, and he's recovered the electronic diary that she deleted when she left. Someone knocked on the door and entered. Grace looked up and saw a young man he recognised from this department standing there. Lorna looked up at him. Sorry, Dermot, is it anything urgent? No, no problem, see you tomorrow. He went out and closed the door. Her face blanked. Where was I? Janet's diary, he prompted. Yes, right. There was one name on it, about nine months back, that none of us here know. It was an entry for an evening in December last year. She had written down, Drink, Brian. Brian? Yes. Grace felt a sudden frisson. Brian. Rostering. Big house in Brighton, flat in London, a murdered woman. Now his brain was really engaging, all his tiredness gone. Was that why he had woken in the middle of the night, thinking about Janet McWhorter, his brain telling him that there was a connection? It looks like this means something to you, Roy. Possibly, he said. Who's running the inquiry on Janet? D.I. Winter in M.I.R. 2. Grace thanked Lorna and headed straight to the incident room that had been set up in MIR2. There he explained the possible connection to his own double inquiry that he'd just learned. Then he returned to MIR1, almost colliding with a triumphant-looking Glenn Branson, who came around the corner at a speed close to a run. Got him, Branson said, pulling a piece of paper from his pocket and unfolding it. I've got a name and an address. Grace followed him into the room. His name is Norman Jex. Grace looked down at the crumpled sheet of lined paper, with a jagged edge where it had been torn from a ring pad. On it was written, 262B Sackville Road, Hove. He looked up at Branson. That's not Bishop's address. No, it's not. But that's the one the man wrote down on the A&E registration form on Sunday morning. The disguised Brian Bishop. Maybe he has two lives. Grace stared at it with a bad feeling as if a dark cloud was swirling around his insides. Did Brian Bishop have a second home? A secret home? A secret life? Is it a real address? Bella's checked the electoral register. There's a Norman Jex at that address. He looked at his watch, adrenaline pumping into his veins. It was ten past six. Forget the briefing meeting, he said. Find out who the duty magistrate is and get a search warrant. Then get on to the local support team. We're going to pay Norman Jex a visit, just as fast as we possibly can. He sprinted back along the labyrinth of corridors to the PNC suite. Lorna Baxter was halfway out of the door when he arrived. Lorna, he said breathlessly, have you got a moment? I've got to pick up my eldest from a swimming lesson, she looked at her watch. Is it something quick? Just a few minutes. It's really important. Sorry to do this to you. I'm right, aren't I, that Janet McWhorter would have had signatory authority to make entries on the PNC. Yes, she was the only person here who could. On her own, unsupervised? Yes. Would you mind looking up something for me on the PNC? She smiled. I can see you need me for more than just a few minutes. I'll get someone to pick Claire up, she said, pulling her mobile from her handbag. They went and sat down in her office, and she tapped her keyboard, logging on. OK, she said. Shoot. I need you to look up someone's criminal record. What information do I have to give you? Just his name, age, address. Grace gave her Brian Bishop's details. He listened to the click of the keys as she entered the information. Brian Desmond Bishop, born 7th of September 1964. That's him. She leaned forward, closer to her screen. 
In 1979, at Brighton Juvenile Court, he was sentenced to two years in a young offender's institute for raping a 14-year-old girl, she read. In 1985, at Lewis Crown Court, he received two years probation for GBH on a woman. Nice guy, she commented. Is there any anomaly with the entry, he asked. Anomaly? In what sense? Could it have been tampered with? Well, there is just one thing, although it's not that unusual. She looked up at him. Normally records as old as these are never touched. They just sit on the file forever. The only time they are touched is when amendments are made, sometimes because of new evidence, old convictions getting quashed or a mistake that needs rectifying, that sort of thing. Can you tell when they've been touched? Absolutely, she nodded emphatically. There's an electronic footprint left every time they're altered. Actually, there's one here. Grace sat bolt upright. There is? Each of us with signatory authority has an individual access code. If we amend the record, the footprint we leave is our access code. And the date. So you can find out whose access code that is. She smiled at him. I know that access code without having to look it up. It's Janet's. She amended this record on... She peered closer. 7th of April this year. Now Grace's adrenaline was really surging. She did. Uh-huh. She frowned, tapping her keyboard, then peered at the screen again. This is interesting, she said. That was her last day in the office. Chapter 114 An hour and a half later, shortly before eight o'clock, Nick Nicole drove a marked police Vauxhall Vectra slowly up Sackville Road. Grace was in the front seat, wearing a bulletproof vest beneath his jacket, and Glenn Branson, also in a bulletproof vest, sat behind him. Both men were counting down the house numbers on the grimy Edwardian terrace buildings. Following right behind them were two marked police Ford Transit vans, each containing a team of uniformed officers from the local support team. 254, Glenn Branson read out. 258, 260, 262, we're here. Nickel double-parked alongside a dusty Ford Fiesta, the other vehicles pulling up behind him. Grace radioed the second LST van to drive round and cover the back entrance, and to let him know when they were in position. Two minutes later he got the call back that they were ready. They climbed out of the car. Grace instructed the Socko to stay in his vehicle for the moment, then led the way down the concrete steps, past two dustbins, then a grimy bay window with net curtains drawn. It was still daylight although fading fast now, so the absence of any interior light did not necessarily mean the flat was empty. The tatty grey front door, with two opaque glass panes in it, was in bad need of a lick of paint, and the plastic bell push had seen better times. Nonetheless, he pressed it. There was no sound. He pressed it again. Silence. He rapped sharply on the panes. Then he called out, Police! Open up! There was no response. He rapped again, even more loudly. Police, open up! Then he turned to Nicole and told him to get the LST team to bring the battering ram. Moments later, two burly LST officers appeared, one of them holding the long, yellow, cylindrical door-busting ram. OK, Chief, he said to Grace. Grace nodded. He swung the ram at one of the glass panes. To everyone's amazement, it bounced off. He swung it again, harder and again it bounced off. Both Branson and Nickel frowned at him. Didn't eat enough spinach when you were a kid, the LST officer's colleague joked. Fuck this! His colleague, who was even more heavily built, took the implement and swung it. Moments later he was looking sheepish too, as it bounced back from the glass again. Shit, the constable said. He's got armor-plated glass! He swung it at the door lock. The door barely moved. He swung it again, then again, breaking out into a sweat. Then he looked at Grace. I don't think he likes burglars. Obviously been taking advice from his local crime prevention officer, Nick Nicol quipped, in a rare display of humour. The constable signalled them to move out the way, then took an almighty swing at the centre of the door low down. It buckled, with wood splinters flying off. Reinforced, he said grimly. He swung again then again, until the wood was sheared away 
and he could see the steel plate behind it. It took another four swings of the ram before the plate had been bent back enough for someone to crawl through. Six LST officers went in first to establish if anyone was in the flat. After a couple of minutes, one of them unlocked the damaged door from the inside and came back out. The flat's empty, sir. Grace thanked the LST team, then asked them to leave, explaining that he wanted to limit the number of officers on the premises in order to conduct a forensic search. As Grace went in, pulling on a pair of latex gloves, he found himself in a small, gloomy basement room, almost every inch of the shabbily carpeted floor covered in partially dismembered computer equipment, piles of motoring magazines and car manuals. It smelled damp. At the far end of the room was a workstation with a computer and keyboard. The entire wall in front of it was covered in newspaper cuttings and what looked like flowcharts of family trees. To the right was an open door with a dark passageway beyond. He crossed the room, threading a careful path through the stuff on the floor, until he reached the ancient swivel chair at the workstation. Then he saw what was pinned up on the wall, and he froze in his tracks. Shit, Glen Branson, now standing beside him, said. It was a gallery of news cuttings. Most of the pages, cut or torn from the Argus and from national newspapers, appeared to track Brian Bishop's career. There were several photographs of him, including a wedding photograph of his marriage to Katie. Alongside was an article on a pink page from the Financial Times on the meteoric rise of his company, International Rostering Solutions, PLC, talking about its entry last year into the Sunday Times list of the UK's hundred fastest-growing companies. Grace was vaguely aware of Branson and other people moving past him, pulling on rubber gloves, doors and drawers opening and closing, but his attention was riveted by another article sellotaped to the wall. It was the front page of a late edition of Monday's Argus newspaper, carrying a large photograph of Brian Bishop and his wife, and a smaller inset photograph of himself. In one of the columns beneath was a red ink ring around his words, Evil Creature. He read the whole passage. This is a particularly nasty crime, Detective Superintendent Grace, the SAO, said. We will work around the clock to bring the evil creature who did this to justice. Nick Nicole suddenly waved a flimsy, legal-looking document in front of him. Just found this lease. He's got a lock-up. Two, in fact, in Westbourne Villas. Phone the incident room, Grace said. Get someone to type up a new warrant and get it down to the same magistrate. Then bring it here and tell them to shift. Then, as he was staring again at the red ring around the words evil creature, he heard Glenn Branson call out in a very worried voice. Boss man, I think you better take a look in here. Grace walked down a short passageway into a dank, windowless bedroom with a narrow, borrowed light high up. The room was lit by a solitary naked low wattage bulb hanging from a cord above a bed, neatly made, with a cream candlewick counterpane. Lying on the counterpane was a long brown-haired wig, a moustache, a beard, a black baseball cap, and a pair of dark sunglasses. Jesus, he said. Glenn Branson's response was simply to point with his finger past him. Grace turned, and what he saw chilled every cell in his body. Taped to the wall were three blown-up photographs, each taken, he reckoned, from his limited knowledge of the craft, through a long lens. The first was of Katie Bishop. She was wearing a bikini swimsuit, leaning back against what looked like the cockpit rail of a yacht. A large red ink cross was scrawled over her. The second was of Sophie Harrington. It was of her face in close-up, with what looked like a blurred London street behind her. There was also a red ink cross scrawled over her. The third was a picture of Cleo Morey, turning away from the front entrance door of the Brighton and Hove mortuary. There was no cross. Grace pulled his mobile phone from his pocket and dialed her home number. She answered on the third ring. Cleo, are you OK? he asked. I'm fine, she said. Never better. Listen to me, he said. I'm being serious. I'm listening to you, Detective Superintendent Roy Grace, she slurred. I'm hanging on to every word. I want you to lock your front door and put the safety chain on. Lock the front door, she echoed, and put the safety chain on. I want you to do it now, OK, while I'm on the phone. 
You're so boshy sometimes, Detective Superintendent. OK, I'm getting up from the sofa and now I'm walking over to the front door. Please put the safety chain on. I'm doing it right now. Grace heard the clank of a chain. Do not open the door to anybody, OK? Nobody at all until I get to you, OK? Do not open the door to anybody until you get to me. I've got that. What about your roof terrace door? he asked. That's always locked. Will you check it? Right away. Then jokingly repeating the instruction back to him, she said, Go up to the roof terrace. Check door is locked. There's no outside door, is there? Not last time I looked. I'll be there as quickly as I can. You'd better, she slurred and hung up. That's very good advice you've been given, a voice behind her said. Chapter 115 Cleo felt as if her veins had filled with freezing water. She turned in terror. A tall figure was standing inches behind her, brandishing a large claw hammer. He was garbed head to foot in an olive-green protective suit that reeked of plastic, latex gloves and a gas mask. She could see nothing of his face at all. She was staring at two round, darkened lenses set into loose-fitting grey material, with a black metal filter at the bottom in the shape of a snout. He looked like a mutant, male, violent insect. Through those lenses, she could just make out the eyes. They weren't Richard's eyes. They were not any eyes she recognised. Barefoot and feeling utterly defenceless, she took a step back, stone-cold sober now, quaking, a scream jammed somewhere deep inside her gullet. She took another step back, trying desperately to think straight, but her brain was shorting out. Her back was against the door, pressing hard against it, wondering if she had time to yank it open and scream for help. Except, hadn't she just put the damned safety chain on? Don't move and I won't hurt you, he said, his voice sounding like a muffled Dalek. Sure, of course not, she thought. You're standing in my house, holding a hammer, and you're not planning to hurt me. Who... Hoo hoo! The words jetted out of her mouth in high-pitched spurts. Her eyes were swinging wildly from the maniac in front of her to the floor, to the walls, looking for a weapon. Then she realised she was still holding her cordless phone. There was an intercom button on it that she'd hit a few times in the past in error that would set the extension in her bedroom shrieking. Trying desperately to remember where on the keypad the button was located, she surreptitiously pressed a key with her finger. Nothing happened. You had a lucky escape with the car, didn't you, bitch? The deep, baffled voice was venomous. Who? Who? She was shaking too much, her nerves twisting around in knots inside her, jerking her throat closed like a ligature each time she tried to speak. She pressed another button. Instantly there was a shrill sound up above them. He tilted his face towards the ceiling for one distracted instant, and in that moment, Cleo leapt forward and hit him on the side of the head as hard as she could with the phone. She heard a crack, heard him grunt in shock and pain, and saw him sag sideways, thinking for an instant that he was going to go down. The hammer fell from his hand and clattered onto the oak floor. It was difficult to see inside this thing, the time billionaire realised, recoiling dizzily. It had been a mistake. He could not get any real peripheral vision. Couldn't see the fucking hammer could just see the bitch, hand raised, holding her shattered phone. Then she was lunging onto the floor, and then he saw the gleam of the steel hammer right in front of her. Oh, no, you don't. He dived down onto her right leg, caught her bare ankle, which was sticking out of her jeans, and jerked it back, feeling her wriggling, strong, wiry, fighting like a big fish. He saw the hammer, lost sight of it again. Then, suddenly a quick gleam of steel in front of his face, and he felt a fierce pain in his left shoulder. She bloody hit him. He let go of her leg, rolled forward, seized a handful of her long blonde hair, and pulled sharply towards him. The bitch howled, stumbled, then turned, trying to pull free. He pulled harder, jerking her head back so sharply for a moment he thought he'd snapped her neck. She howled, in pain and anger, twisting round to face him. He head-butted her hard in her temple, saw the hammer spinning like a top across the floor. 
He tried to scramble over her, still missing too much of his vision, then felt an excruciating pain in his left wrist. The bitch was biting him. He swung his right wrist, hit her body somewhere, swung it again, trying desperately to wrench his arm free from her teeth, hit her again, then again, crying out in pain himself. Roy, she thought desperately, biting harder, harder still, trying to bite his bloody arm off. Please come, Roy. Oh, God, you were on the phone. If you just stayed on one second longer, one second. She felt the blow on her left breast, then on the side of her face. Now he had her ear, was twisting it, twisting, twisting. God, the pain was agonizing. He was going to wrench it off. She cried out, released his arm, rolling away from him as fast as she could, scrambling for the hammer. Suddenly she felt a grip-like vice around her ankle. She was jerked sharply back, her face scraping along the floor. As she turned to resist, she saw a shadow hurtle at her face, then felt a jarring, blinding, agonizing crunch, and she was falling onto her back, giddily watching downlighters in the ceiling hurtle past above her, out of focus. And now she could see he had the hammer again, was on one knee, crouching, levering himself to his feet and she was not going to let this creep get the better of her, was not going to die, here in her home, was not going to let herself get killed by a madman with a hammer. Not now, especially not now, just at this moment when her life was coming together, when she was so in love. A weapon. There had to be a weapon in the room. The wine bottle on the floor by the sofa. He was on his feet now. She was by the bookshelves. She pulled a hardback out and flung it at him. Missed. She pulled out another, a thick, heavy Conan Doyle compendium, getting onto her knees and launching it at him in one movement. It hit him in the chest, making him stagger back a couple of steps. But he was still holding the hammer, moving towards her. Now, through her pain and anger, she suddenly felt scared again. Looking desperately around, she saw Fish's empty tank on the table. Lunging forward, she seized it, lifted it up, water sloshing. It was so damn heavy she could barely hold it. She swung it at him, hurtling the entire contents, several gallons of water and the pieces of miniature Greek architecture, at him. The weight of the water took him by surprise, knocked him back several steps. Then, with all her strength, she threw the tank at him. It struck him in the knees, bowling him over backward like a skittle, with a muffled, angry howl of pain, then shattered on the floor. Still holding the hammer, somehow... He was already starting to get back onto his feet. Cleo stared around frantically again, trying to work out her options. There were knives in the kitchen, but she would have to pass him to get in there. Upstairs, she thought. She had a few moments on him. If she could get upstairs, into her bedroom, lock the door. She had the phone in there. Staggering to his feet, ignoring the excruciating pain, the sound of his breathing echoing all around him as if he were in a diving chamber. He watched with pure, utter hatred, tinged with a degree of satisfaction, as her bare ankles and feet disappeared up the stairwell, and a deep stab of lust. Nothing up there, sweetheart. He knew every inch of this house. Jangling in his trouser pocket, inside his protective suit, were the keys to the roof door and to the locks of all the triple-glazed windows. Her mobile phone was lying on the sofa next to an open folder, containing some project she appeared to be working on. He was aroused now. She had put up a spirited fight, just like Sophie Harrington, and that had been a very big turn-on. He smiled at the thought of the nights he had slept with Sophie Harrington, when all the time she'd thought he was Brian Bishop. But the biggest turn-on of all was now, the knowledge that in a few minutes he would be making love to Detective Superintendent Grace's woman evil creature. You'll think twice before you ever call anyone an evil creature again, Detective Superintendent Grace. He limped forward, his left shin in particular hurting like hell, knelt and unplugged the phone jack from the cordless base station. As he stood up again, he saw a jagged rip in his left leg, just below his knee, with blood leaking out. Too bad. Nothing he could do about that now. Carefully, he placed his foot on the first tread of the stairs. It wasn't so easy in this gas mask, as he could not see directly down in front of him very well. In addition, 
His balance didn't seem to have been too good these past couple of days. He was still feeling feverish, and in spite of the medication he was taking, his hand did not seem to be healing up. It had been a big decision, wearing this. He liked the thought that it would frighten the bitch. But most of all, he liked the idea that a third victim found with a gas mask would make Detective Superintendent Grace look a fool, because it would show he had the wrong man locked up. He liked that a lot. In fact, the gas mask had been a masterstroke. He had Brian to thank for that. He had found it by chance in a cupboard beside the bishop's bed when he'd been looking for toys to entertain Katie with. It was the only thing in his entire life that he had to thank his brother for. Cleo slammed her bedroom door shut, hyperventilating. In near blind panic, she grabbed the Victorian wooden chest at the end of her bed and dragged that over, jamming it against the door. Then she threw herself at her large bed, grabbed it by one leg and tried to pull it. But it would not budge. She tried again. It wasn't moving. Shit, you bastard, come on! Her eyes jumped around the room, looking at what else she could use for a barricade. She dragged across a small black lacquered wood dressing table, then the chair, which she wiggled into the remaining space between the dressing table and her bed. Not brilliant, but at least it should hold long enough for her to dial Roy, or maybe 999. Yes, 999 first, then Roy. But as she pressed the button to activate the phone, she let out a whimper of terror. The line was dead, and the stainless steel door handle was turning. Slowly, incredibly slowly, as if she was watching a freeze-frame video inching forward. Then a loud, blam, 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 as if he was kicking the door or hitting it with his hammer. Her stomach curdled in terror. The door was moving, just a fraction. She heard wood splintering, and realized to her horror it was the wooden trunk and the chair from her dressing table that were both slowly disintegrating. In desperation she ran over to the window. She was two stories up, but it might be possible to jump. Better than being in here. At least out in the courtyard, even injured, she would be safe, she reasoned. Then a shiver rocked her. The window was locked, and the key was missing. Frantic, she looked for something heavy, ran her eyes over makeup bottles, hairspray, shoes. What, what? Oh, please, God, what? There was a metal reading lamp on her bedside table. Gripping it by the top, she swung the flat, round base at the window. It bounced off. Down below, she saw one of her neighbours, a young man with whom she occasionally exchanged pleasantries, wheeling his bike across the courtyard, engrossed in a call on his mobile. He was looking up as if trying to see where the banging had come from. She waved at him frantically. He waved back cheerily, then, continuing his conversation, headed with his bike towards the front gates. Behind her, she heard another blam, 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 and more splintering wood. Chapter 116 Branson found a small silver pay-as-you-go Nokia phone hidden beneath Norman Jex's mattress and took it over to Grace, who was looking at his watch, fretting. It was now nearly 9 p.m., and he was growing increasingly worried about Cleo being alone in her house, despite the relative safety of a gated development. Bag it, he said distractedly, thinking he could send a patrol car up to check Cleo was okay. It was over three quarters of an hour since Nick Nicol had phoned the incident room, asking for a search warrant for Norman Jex's lockups to be typed out and taken to the same magistrate who had signed the one for here. It should have taken a maximum of ten minutes to complete the damn thing, fifteen minutes' drive to the magistrate's home, and the signing should have been a ten-second formality. Add a further fifteen minutes to get here. Okay. He knew in his impatience he wasn't allowing for any delays, traffic hold-ups, whatever, but he didn't care. He was scared for Cleo. There was someone out there, a man he had thought was securely banged up in Lewis Prison. A man who had done one of the most chilling things to a woman he had ever seen. Because you love her. Just as Branson was sealing the bag, he suddenly remembered the speculation about a pay-as-you-go mobile phone. Actually, hang on, Glenn. Let me see it. Under current guidelines, all phones seized should be handed straight to the telecoms unit at Sussex House, untouched. But there wasn't time for that at this moment any more than he had time for half the new policies that got dreamed up by idiot policymakers who had never been out of the real world in their lives. 
Taking it in his gloved hands, he switched the machine on and was relieved when it didn't ask him for a pin code. Then he tried to figure out how to navigate the controls before giving up and handing it to Branson. You're the techie, he said. Can you find the list of recently dialed numbers? Branson tapped the keys and within a few seconds showed Grace the display. He's only made three calls on it. Just three? Uh-huh. I recognise one of the numbers. And? It's Hove Streamline Taxis, 202020. Grace wrote the other two down, then dialed directory inquiries. One was for the Hotel Divin, the second was for the Lansdowne Place Hotel. Pensively, he said, Seems like Bishop might have been telling us the truth. Then a Socko who had accompanied them in the flat suddenly called out, Detective Superintendent, I think you should see this. It was a walk-in broom closet just off the entrance to the kitchen, but it had clearly been a long time since any brooms were kept in here. Grace stared around in amazement. It was a miniature control center. There were ten small television monitors on the walls, all switched off, a console with a small swivel chair in front of it, and what looked like a stack of recording equipment. What the hell is this? Part of his security system, Grace asked. He's got three entrances. Can't see why he'd need ten monitors, sir, the officer said. And there aren't any cameras inside or outside. I've checked. At that moment, Alfonso Zaffaroni came into the room, holding the signed search warrant for Norman Jex's lockups. Ten minutes later, having left Nick Nicole and the Socco officer continuing their search of the flat, Grace and Branson stood in a small mews that was tucked behind a wide, leafy residential street of substantial detached and semi-detached Victorian villas. There were a few small businesses in the mews, a couple of car repair outfits, a design studio and a software company, all closed for the night, and then a row of lock-up garages. According to the document that they had found, Norman Jex leased numbers 11 and 12. The blue painted wooden doors of both were secured by hefty padlocks. The local support team gorilla, who had bashed in the door of the flat, and four further members of his team stood in readiness. It was almost dark now, the mews eerily silent. Grace briefed them all that once the door was open, no one was to go in if the place appeared empty, which seemed likely, to preserve it forensically. Moments later the yellow battering ram smashed into the centre of the door, splintering the wood around the padlock's hasp, sending the entire lock, along with a jagged chunk of wood, onto the floor. Several flashlight beams shone in simultaneously, one of them graces. The interior, mostly taken up by a car beneath a fitted dust cover, was silent and empty. It smelled of engine oil and old leather. On the floor at the far end, two pinpricks of red light gleamed and then were gone. Probably a mouse or a rat, Grace thought, signalling everyone to wait, then stepping in himself and looking for the light switch. He found it, and two startlingly bright ceiling bulbs came on. At the far end was a workbench on which was a machine resembling the kind he had seen in shops that offered key-cutting services. A variety of blank keys were fixed to the wall behind it in a carefully arranged pattern. Tools were hung on all the other walls, very neatly again, all in patterned clusters. The whole place was spotlessly clean. Too clean. It felt more like an exhibition stand for tools than a garage. On the floor was a small, very ancient suitcase. Grace popped open the catches. It was full of old buff file folders, corporate documents, letters, and near the bottom he found a blue Let's Schoolboy's Diary for the year 1976. He closed the case. The team would go through the contents carefully later. Then, with Branson's help, he removed the car's cover to reveal a gleaming moonstone white 1962 3.8 Jaguar Mark II saloon. It was in such immaculate condition that it looked brand new despite its age, as if it had come straight from the factory to here without ever being soiled by a road. Nice, Branson said admiringly. You ought to get one of those, old man. Then you look like that detective geezer on the box inspecting malls. Thanks, Grace said, opening the boot. It was empty and just as brand new looking as the exterior. He closed it again, then walked towards the rear of the garage and stared at the key-cutting machine. Why would someone have one of these? To cut keys, Branson suggested, less than helpfully. 
Whose keys? The keys of anything you want to get into. Grace then asked the LST officers to turn their attention to the next door unit. As the door splintered open, the first thing his torch beam struck was a pair of license plates propped against the wall. He went straight over to them and knelt down. They each read LJ04 NWS. It was the number of Brian Bishop's Bentley. Possibly the number that had been photographed by the ANPR camera at Gatwick on Thursday night. He switched on the interior lights. This garage was every bit as immaculate as the one next door. In the centre of the floor was a hydraulic hoist jack capable of lifting an entire car. Other tools were tidily arranged around the walls. And then he walked down to the far end and saw what was lying on the workbench. He stopped in his tracks. It was the workshop manual for an MG TF-160, Cleo's car. I think we've just hit the jackpot, he said, grimly to Branson. Then he pulled out his mobile phone and dialed Cleo's home number. He expected she would answer within a couple of rings, as she normally did. But instead it rang on, four rings, six, eight, ten. Which was strange, because her answering machine was set to kick in after six. Why hadn't it? He dialed her mobile. That rang eight times. Then he got her voicemail message. Something didn't feel right. He would give it a couple of minutes, in case she was in the loo or bath, he decided, then try again. He turned his attention back to the MG manual. Several pages were marked with yellow post-it tags. One was the start of the section on the central locking. Another, the section on the fuel injection. He dialed Cleo's home number again. It rang on endlessly. Then he tried her mobile again. Eight rings followed by her voicemail. He left a message, asking her to call him straight back, his concern rising every second. You thinking what I'm thinking, Branson said. What? That we might have got the wrong man in jail. It's starting to look that way. But I don't get it. You saw the parents of Bishop's twin. Genuine people, you said, right? Sad little old couple. They seem genuine enough, yes. And their adopted son, Bishop's twin. They said he was dead, yeah? Yes. They gave you the number of his plot in a cemetery. Grace nodded. So how come, if he's dead, he's still around? Are we dealing with a ghost or something? I mean, that's your terrain, isn't it, the supernatural? You think we're dealing with a spirit, an unrested soul? I never heard of a ghost ejaculating, Grace said or driving cars, or tattooing people with power drills, or turning up in the A&E department of a hospital with a hand injury. Dead men don't do any of those things either, Branson said. Do they? Not in my experience, no. For her come we have one who does. After some moments, Grace replied, Because he's not dead enough. Chapter 117 Somehow the barricade was still holding, but it wouldn't for much longer. With every jarring thump on the door, it opened a fraction more. The chair had already collapsed, and she'd taken its place with her own body, her back jammed against the foot of her bed, the frame digging into her spine agonizingly, her legs wedged against the drawers each side of her dressing table. The dressing table was not sturdily built. It was cracking, its joints slowly giving out. At any moment it was going to shatter like the chair had done, and when that happened, the maniac would be able to push the door a good eighteen inches open. Roy, where the hell are you? Roy, Roy, Roy! She could hear the faint ringing of her mobile downstairs. Eight rings. Then it stopped. Blam, blam, blam on the door. Then a faint beep, beep from downstairs. Her mobile telling her, uselessly, that she had a message. Blam, blam, blam! A splinter of wood flew off the door, and a new, deep coil of terror spiralled through her. Blam! 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 More wood splinters, and this time the head of the hammer came right through. She tried to control her panic breathing, to stop herself hyperventilating again. What can I do? Please, God, what can I do? If she moved, she would have just a few seconds before he shoved the door open. If she stayed put, it would only be a few minutes before he smashed a hole in the door big enough to get his arms through, or even climb through. Roy, please, Roy, where are you? Oh, God, please, Roy! Another loud bang. More wood splintered away, and now there was a hole three or four inches across. And she could see one glass lens pressed up against it. 
the faint shadow of an eye flickering behind it. She thought for an instant she was going to vomit. Images of people flashed through her mind. Her sister, Charlie, her mother, her father, Roy. People she might never see again. I am not going to die here. It was a sharp crack, like a gunshot. For a moment she thought the man had fired a weapon at her. Then she realized, horrified, what it was. The wood on the right-hand bottom drawer of her dressing table had split, and her bare foot had gone through. She withdrew it, then jammed it against the next drawer up. That seemed firm for a moment. Then the whole thing began collapsing. He was really enjoying himself. It was like opening a particularly challenging tin of sardines. One where you got the lid to lift up just a tiny fraction, so you could see the sardines lying there beneath you, tantalizing you but you couldn't yet touch or taste them, though you knew in a few minutes that you would. She was feisty. He was staring at her now, her face flushed, eyes bulging, hair all tangled and matted with perspiration. She was going to be great to make love to, although clearly he was going to have to quieten her down or restrain her first, but not too much. He took a couple of steps back then slammed the sole of his shoe, his solid, metal-tipped and heeled workman's shoe, against the door three times. It yielded a good inch, the most by far for one attempt. Now he was cooking with gas. The lid was peeling. A few more minutes and she would be in his arms. He licked his lips. He could taste her already. Not bothering with the hammer any more, he stepped back again and kicked out. Then he heard the shrill ring of the front doorbell. He saw the change in the bitch's expression. Don't worry, I'm not going to answer it. We don't want anybody to disturb our little love nest, do we? He blew her a kiss. Although, of course, she couldn't see it. Chapter 118 There were windows on either side of Cleo's front door, but she had vertical Venetian blinds carefully adjusted so that she could see out while it was impossible for anyone to see in. Grace, standing anxiously outside her front door, rang the doorbell for the third time. Then he rapped on a window pane for good measure. Why wasn't she answering? He dialed her mobile phone again. After a few seconds, he heard it ringing from somewhere on the far side of the door, downstairs. Had she gone out and left her phone behind? Gone to get some food or to an off-license? He checked his watch. It was 9.30. Then he stepped back, trying to see if he could spot any movement in one of the upstairs windows. Perhaps she was up on the roof terrace, preparing a barbecue and couldn't hear the bell. He took another couple of steps back and collided with a young, shaven-headed man in lycra shorts and a top, pushing his mountain bike. I'm so sorry, Grace said. No problem. He looked vaguely familiar. You live here, don't you? Grace asked. Yep. He pointed at a house a few along. Seen you around a few times, too. You're a friend of Cleo's, right? Yes. Have you seen her this evening by any chance? She's expecting me, but she doesn't seem to be in. The young man nodded. Actually, yeah, I did see her earlier. She waved at me from an upstairs window. Waved at you? Yeah. I heard a noise and looked up, wondering where it had come from, and I saw her in the window. Just a neighbourly wave thing. What kind of noise? Sort of a bang, like a gunshot. Grace stiffened. Gunshot? That's what I thought for a moment, but obviously it wasn't. Every alarm bell in his body was ringing. You don't have a key, do you? He shook his head. No, got one for Unit 9, but not Cleo's, I'm afraid. Then he glanced at his watch. I've got a rush. Grace thanked him. Then as the young man walked away, the bicycle ticking, the detective heard several very distinct muffled bangs coming from right above him. Instantly, his anxiety turned to blind panic. He looked around for something heavy and saw a pile of bricks beneath a loose blue tarpaulin outside the house directly opposite, on the other side of the courtyard. He sprinted across and grabbed one, then removed his jacket as he ran back, wound it around the brick in his hand, then punched Cleo's left window, shattering it. Too bad if everything was fine and she just popped out to the shops. Better this than take a risk, he thought, bashing away more glass. Then, with his free hand, he pushed apart some of the slats of the blind and saw, to his cold, stark terror, the mess of water, smashed fish tank, the upturned coffee table, books strewn around. Cleo! he yelled at the top of his voice. Cleo! 
He turned his head and saw the young man with the bicycle, who had stopped in the middle of Opening's front door and was staring at him with a startled look. Call the police, he yelled. Then, ignoring the jagged shards sticking out of the frame all around, Grace hauled himself up onto the ledge and dived headfirst into the room, hitting the floor with his hands, rolling, then scrambling to his feet as fast as he could, looking wildly around him. Then he saw the trail of blood across the floor leading to the stairs. Sick with fear for Cleo, he sprinted up them. When he reached the first floor landing and peered through the open door to her empty office, he shouted out her name again. From directly above him he heard her voice, muffled and tight, call out, Roy, be careful, he's in here! His eyes shot up the stairs to the second floor landing, Cleo's bedroom to the right, guest bedroom to the left, and the narrow staircase up to the roof terrace. At least she was alive, thank God. He held his breath. No sign of any movement. No sound except the boomf, boomf, boomf of his own heart. He should call for backup assistance, but he wanted to listen, to hear every sound in the house. Slowly, tread by tread, as silently as he could in his rubber-soled shoes, he made his way up the staircase towards the second floor. Just before he reached the landing, he stopped, pulled out his mobile phone again and dialed 999. This is Detective Superintendent Grace. I need immediate assistance at... All he saw was a shadow. Then it felt as if he'd been hit by a truck. The next moment he was falling through air, crashing head over heels backward down the stairs. Then, after what seemed an eternity, he was on his back on the landing floor, with his legs up above him on the stairs and a sharp pain in his chest, a busted or cracked rib, he thought dimly, staring up, straight into Brian Bishop's face. Bishop was coming down the stairs, dressed in a green all-in-one suit, holding a claw hammer in one hand and a gas mask in the other. Except that it wasn't Bishop. Couldn't be, his dazed mind thought. He was in jail, in Lewis Prison. It was Brian Bishop's face, his haircut, but the expression on his face was unlike any he had seen on Brian Bishop's. It was twisted, almost lopsided with hatred. Norman Jex, he thought. It had to be Jex. The two of them were absolutely identical. Jex came down another step, raising the hammer, his eyes blazing. You called me an evil creature, he said. You don't have any right to call me an evil creature. You need to be careful what you say about people, Detective Superintendent Grace. You can't just go around calling people names. Grace stared at the man, wondering whether his phone was still switched on and connected to the emergency operator. In the hope that it was, he shouted as loudly as he could, Unit 5, Gardner's Yard, Brighton! He saw the nervous dart of the man's eyes. Then upstairs, there was a sudden screech of wood on wood. Norman Jex turned his head for an instant, looking anxiously back over his shoulder. Grace seized the moment. He launched himself up on his elbows, then kicked his right foot as hard as he could, straight up between the man's legs. Jex expelled a winded gasp, doubling up in pain, the hammer falling from his hand, clattering down the stairs and thudding past Grace's head. The detective swung his leg up again, aiming another kick, but somehow Jex, despite his pain, grabbed hold of it and wrenched it sharply round in fury. Grace rolled over, his ankle hurting like hell, going with the direction of the twist to stop the man breaking it and lashing out with his other foot, striking something hard and hearing a cry of pain. He saw the hammer, lunged after it, but before he could get up, Jex crashed down on top of him, pinning his wrist to the floor. Using every ounce of strength in his body, Grace jabbed back with his elbows and broke free, rolling over again. The man rolled with him, slamming a punch into his cheek, then another into the back of his neck. And Grace was on his face on the floor, breathing in the smell of wood varnish, a dead weight pinning him down, his throat clamped in a grip that was tightening every second. He rammed his elbow back, but the grip tightened further, choking him. He was struggling to breathe. Suddenly, the grip slackened. A fraction of a second later, the crushing weight on his body lifted. Then he saw why. Two police officers were clambering through the window. He heard footsteps running up the stairs. You all right, sir? The constable called out. Grace nodded, clambered to his feet, his right leg and his chest agony, and launched himself up the stairs. He reached the landing, stepping over the gas mask. There was no sign of Jex. He carried on up to the second floor and saw Cleo's face, badly bruised and bleeding from a gash in her forehead, peering nervously out of her smashed, partially open bedroom door. 
Are you okay? he gasped. She nodded, looking in total shock. There was a bang above them, oblivious to his pain. Grace ran on up and saw the roof terrace door swinging back against the wall. Then he limped out onto the wooden decking of the terrace and just caught a flash of olive green disappearing in the fading light down the fire escape at the far end. Breaking into a run, he dodged around the kettle barbecue, the tables and chairs and plants, and hurtled down the steep metal steps. Jex was already halfway across the courtyard, heading to the gate. It banged shut in Grace's face as he reached it. He hit the red release button, oblivious to everything else, jerked the heavy gate open, not waiting for the two constables behind him to catch up, and stumbled breathlessly out into the street. Jex was a good hundred yards ahead, sprinting and hobbling at the same time down past a row of closed antique shops and a pub with jazz music blaring and drinkers outside, crowding the pavement and part of the road. Grace ran after him, determined to get this fucker. Utterly, utterly determined. Everything else in the whole world blocked out of his mind. Jex turned left along York Place. The bastard was fast. Christ, he was fast. Grace was sprinting flat out, his chest on fire, his lungs feeling like they were being crushed between rocks. He wasn't gaining on the man, but at least he was keeping pace. He passed St. Peter's Church on his right a Chinese takeaway, followed by endless shops on his left, everything except the fast food places closed, just window display lights on. Buses, vans, cars, taxis passed by. He dodged around a gaggle of youths, all the time his eyes locked onto that olive green suit that was increasingly blending into the closing darkness as York Place became the London Road. Jex reached the Preston Circus Junction. He had a red traffic light against him and a line of cars crossing in front of him but he sprinted straight through and on up the London road. Grace had to stop for a moment as a lorry thundered past, followed by an interminable line of traffic. Come on, come on, come on! He glanced over his shoulder and saw the two constables some way behind. Then, recklessly, almost blinded by the stinging perspiration in his eyes, he raced across the road in front of the flashing headlights and angry blaring horn of a bus. He was fit from his regular running, but he didn't know how much longer he could go on. Jex, now about two hundred yards in front of him, slowed, turned his head, saw Grace and picked up speed again. Where the hell was he going? There was a park on the right side of the road now. On his left were houses that had been converted into offices and blocks of flats. The irony did not escape him that he was at this moment running past the Brighton and Hove City Council Directorate of Children, Families and Schools, where he had been earlier today. You have to start tiring soon, Jex. You are not getting away. You don't hurt my darling Cleo and get away. Jex ran on, past a garage, over another junction, past another parade of shops. Then, finally, Grace heard the thrashing wail of a siren coming up behind him. About sonning time, he thought. Moments later, a patrol car slowed alongside him, the passenger window going down, and he heard a burst of static, followed by a controller's voice coming from the radio inside. Barely able to speak, Grace gasped to the young constable, in front of me, that guy in the green suit. Do a hard stop on him. The car roared off, blue light showering from its roof, and pulled into the curb just past Jex, the passenger door opening before it had come to a halt. Jex turned and bolted straight back towards Grace for a few yards, then darted right towards Preston Park Railway Station. Grace heard the sound of another siren approaching. More back up. Good. He followed Jex doggedly up a steep hill lined on both sides with houses. Ahead was a high brick wall, with an access tunnel to the platforms and the street on the far side. Two taxis were parked up. There was a pick-up area in front of the station, with a couple of taxis waiting, and an unmade-up residential road to the right, which ran along the side of the railway line for several hundred yards. Jex turned into it. The first police car shot past Grace, following Jex. Suddenly the man doubled back on his tracks, then dashed into the tunnel and up the steps to the southbound platform, barging past a young woman with a suitcase and a man in a business suit. Grace followed, dodging through more passengers. Then he saw Jex running down the platform. The last door of the train was open, with the guard hanging out, signalling with his torch. He began to move. Jex leapt off the platform, disappearing from Grace's view. Was he on the track? Then as the guard slipped past him, the train accelerating, Grace saw its red tail light, and Jex clinging to a handrail on the rear of the last carriage, his feet perched precariously on a buffer. Grace yelled at the guard, Police! Stop the train! 
You've got a man hanging on the back. For a moment, the guard, a spindly young man in an ill-fitting uniform, just looked at him in astonishment as the train continued gathering speed. Police! I'm a police officer! Stop! he yelled again. The guard, now several yards ahead of him, was only just in earshot. The guard ducked inside. Grace heard a shrill bell, then suddenly the train was slowing, the brakes screeching. There was a hiss of air pressure, and it came to a jerky halt fifty yards beyond the end of the platform. Grace ran down the slope and onto the track, keeping clear of the raised live conductor rail, stumbling through loose, weed-strewn ballast and over the sleepers. The guard jumped down and ran back towards Grace, flashing his torch beam. Where is he? Grace pointed. Jex, looking fearfully down at the live rail below him, edged over to the right-hand buffer, then leapt, but not far enough, and his right foot brushed the top of the second conductor rail. There was a blue flash, a crackle, a puff of smoke, and a scream from Jex. He landed on the ballast in the centre of the northbound track with a sharp crack, then fell over, his head striking the far rail with a dull thud, and lay still. In the beam of the guard's flashlight, Grace saw his left leg sticking out at an odd angle, and for a moment he thought the man was dead. There was an acrid, burning smell in the air. Hey! the guard yelled in panic. There's a train coming, the 950! Grace could hear the rails singing like the whine of a tuning fork. It's the fast one, Victoria Express! Oh, Jesus! The guard was trembling so much he could barely keep the beam on Jex, who was gripping the rail with his hands, trying to drag himself forward. Grace put a foot over the conductor rail, onto the loose ballast beyond. He wanted this bastard alive. Suddenly Jex tried to get up, but he instantly fell forward with another howl of pain, blood trickling down his face. No! the guard shouted at Grace. You can't cross, not there! Grace could hear the sound of the approaching train. Ignoring the guard, he swung his other leg over and stopped in the space between the two sets of tracks, looking left. At the lights of the express train that were tearing out of the darkness, straight at him, seconds away. There was a space on the other side before the next track. Enough room, he decided, making a snap decision and vaulting the second live rail. He grabbed the partially melted, heavy-soled shoe on the broken leg, which was the nearest part of Jex to him, and pulled him with all his strength. The lights bore down. He heard Jex's scream of agony above the train's klaxon. He could feel the ground vibrating, the rails singing a deafening pitch now, the rush of wind. He pulled the man again, oblivious to the howl of pain, the shouting of the guard, the roar and blare of the train, and staggered back, hauling the dead weight over the far rail and onto the rough ground as hard and fast as he could. Then, losing his footing, he fell sideways onto the track, his face inches from the rail, and heard a terrible human screech. The train was thundering past, a vortex of air ripping at his clothes, his hair, the clang of the wheels deafening him, a final whoosh of air, then silence. Something warm and sticky was spurting into his face. Chapter 119 The silence seemed to go on for an eternity. Grace, gulping down air, was momentarily dazzled by a flashlight beam. More warm, sticky fluid struck his face. The beam moved away from his eyes, and now he could see what looked like a narrow, round length of grey hosepipe jetting red paint at him. Then he realised it was not red paint. It was blood. And it wasn't a pipe. It was Norman Jex's right arm. The man's hand had been severed. Grace scrambled onto his knees. Jex was lying, shaking, moaning in shock. He had to stop the bleeding, he knew, had to staunch it immediately, or the man would bleed to death in minutes. The guard was alongside him. Jesus, he said. Jesus, oh, Jesus. Two police officers joined him. Call an ambulance, Grace said. He saw faces pressed up against the windows of the stopped train. Maybe see if anyone on the train is a doctor. The guard was staring down at Jex, unable to take his eyes off him. Someone radio for an ambulance, Grace yelled at the police officers. The guard ran off towards a phone on a signal post. Already done, one of the constables said. Are you all right, sir? Grace nodded, still breathing hard, concentrating on finding something for a tourniquet. Make sure someone's gone to help Cleo Mori at Unit 5 Gardener's Yard, he said. His hands went to his jacket, but then he realised it was on the floor somewhere in Cleo's house. 
Give me a jacket, he yelled to the guard. Too surprised to query him, the guard ran back over and let Grace pull the jacket from him, then ran off again. Grace stood up and, holding both sleeves, tore it apart. One sleeve he wound as tightly as he could around Jex's arm, a short distance above where it was severed. The other he balled and jammed against the end as a plug. Then the guard ran back, panting. I've asked them to switch off the power. He should only take a few seconds, he said. Then suddenly the night erupted into a cacophony of wails. It sounded as if every emergency vehicle siren in the whole of the city of Brighton and Hove had been switched on together. Five minutes later, Grace was travelling at his absolute insistence in the back of the ambulance with Jex, determined to see the bastard securely into a hospital room with no chance of escaping. Not that there seemed much danger of that at this moment. Jex was strapped down, cannulated and barely conscious. The paramedic, who was monitoring him carefully, told Grace that although the man had suffered heavy blood loss, his life was not in immediate danger. But the ambulance was travelling urgently fast, siren wailing, the ride rocky and uncomfortable, and Grace was not taking any chances. There was a police car escort in front and behind them. Borrowing the paramedic's mobile phone, Grace called both Cleo's numbers, but got no answer. Then the paramedic radioed for him, putting him onto the controller. An ambulance was on site at Gardener's Yard, the woman told Grace. Two paramedics were attending superficial wounds to Cleo Mori, who was reluctant to go to hospital, wanting to remain at home. Grace then got himself patched through to a patrol car that was also outside Cleo's house, and told the two constables to remain there until he returned, and also to get hold of a glazier to secure the window as quickly as possible. By the time he had finished giving instructions, the ambulance was already turning sharply left, up the hill to the accident and emergency entrance to the hospital. As Grace climbed out of the back, not taking his eye off Jex for an instant, even though the man now seemed completely unconscious, a second police car wailed up behind them and stopped. A young constable climbed out, green-faced and looking very close to vomiting, and hurried over towards them, holding something inside a heavily blood-stained handkerchief. Sir, he said to Grace, what have you got? The man's hand, sir. They may be able to sew it back on, but some of the fingers are missing. It must have gone under the wheels a couple of times. We couldn't find the fingers. Grace had to struggle to restrain himself from telling him that by the time he'd finished with Norman Jex, he probably wouldn't have much use for it again. Instead, he said grimly, Good thinking. It was shortly after midnight when Jex came out of the operating theatre. The hospital had not been able to contact the one local orthopaedic surgeon who had had some success in reattaching severed limbs, and the general surgeon who was in the hospital, and had just finished patching up a motorcycle rider, decided the hand looked too badly damaged. It was the hand with the hospital dressing on, Grace noticed, and requested it be kept in a refrigerator to preserve it forensically if nothing else. Then he ensured that Jex was in a private room on the fourth floor with a tiny window and no fire escape and organised a rota of two police constables to guard him around the clock. Finally, no longer exhausted but wide awake, wired, relieved and exhilarated, he drove back to Cleo's house, his ankle hurting like hell every time he depressed the clutch. He was pleased to see the empty police car in the street outside and that the window had already been repaired. As he limped up to the front door, he heard the roar of a vacuum cleaner. Then he rang the bell. Cleo answered. She had a sticking plaster on the side of her forehead, and the surround of one eye was black and swollen. The two constables were sitting on a sofa, drinking coffee, and the hoover lay on its side on the floor. She gave him a wan smile, then looked shocked. Roy, darling, you're injured. He realised he was still covered in Jex's blood. It's okay. I'm not injured. I just need to get my clothes off. Behind her, the two officers grinned. But for the next moments, he was oblivious of them. He stared back at her, so desperately grateful that she was okay. Then he took her in his arms and kissed her on the lips, then hugged her, holding her tightly, so tightly, never, ever wanting to let go. God, I love you, he whispered. I love you so much. I love you too. Her voice was hoarse and small. She sounded like a child. I was so scared, he said. 
so scared that something had... Did you get him? Most of him. Chapter 120 Norman Jex stared up sullenly at Grace. He lay in the bed, in the small room, his right arm bandaged from the elbow down to the covered stump where his hand should have been. An orange hospital ID tag was clipped around his left wrist. His pallid face was covered in bruises and grazes. Glenn Branson was standing behind Grace, and two constables sat in the corridor outside the door. Norman Jex? Grace asked. He was finding it bizarre talking to this man who was such a complete clone of Brian Bishop, even down to his hairstyle. It was as if Bishop was playing some prank on him, and really was in two places at the same time. Yes, he replied. Is that your full name? It's Norman John Jex. Grace wrote it down on his pad. Norman John Jex. I'm Detective Superintendent Grace, and this is Detective Sergeant Branson. Evidence has come to light as a result of which I'm arresting you on suspicion of the murders of Miss Sophie Harrington and Mrs. Catherine Bishop. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something which you later rely on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Is that clear? Jex raised his left arm a few inches, and with a humorless smile said, You're going to have a problem handcuffing me, aren't you, Detective Superintendent Grace? Taken aback by his defiance, Grace retorted, Good point, but at least we'll now be able to distinguish you from your brother. The whole world's always been able to distinguish me from my brother, Norman Jex said bitterly. What's your particular problem? Are you prepared to talk to us, or do you wish to have a solicitor present? Grace asked. He smiled. I'll talk to you. Why not? I've got all the time in the world. How much of it would you like? As much as you can spare. Jex shook his head. No, Detective Superintendent Grace, I don't think you want that. You don't want the kind of time I've got banked away. Believe me, you really don't. Grace limped over towards the empty chair beside the bed and sat down. What did you mean just now when you said the whole world's always been able to distinguish you from your brother? Jex gave him the same chilling, lopsided grin that he'd given him last night, coming down the stairs in Cleo's house, after him. Because he was the one born with a silver spoon in his mouth, and me, you know what I was born with? A plastic breathing tube down my throat. How does that make you physically distinguishable from each other? Brian had everything, didn't he? Right from the start. Good health, well-off parents, a private school education, me? I had underdeveloped lungs and spent the first months of my life in an incubator, here in this hospital. That's ironic, isn't it? I had chest problems for years, and I had pretty crap parents. You know what I'm saying? Actually, no, I don't, Grace said. They seem pleasant enough people to me. Jack stared at him hard. Oh, yes. Just what do you know about them? I saw them today. Jack screamed again. I don't think so, Detective Superintendent. Is this some kind of trick question? My father died in 1998. God rot his soul. And my mother died two years later. Grace was silent for a moment. I'm sorry, there's something I don't understand. What's not to understand? Jex shot back. Bishop got a beautiful home, a good education, every possible start in life you could have, and last year his company... The idea he stole from me made the Sunday Times list of the hundred fastest-growing companies in the UK. He's a big man, a rich man. You're a detective, and you can't spot the difference. What idea did he steal from you? Chex shook his head. Forget it. It's not important. Really? Why do I get the sense that it is? Chex lay back against his pillows suddenly and closed his eyes. I don't think I want to say any more. Not now, not without my solicitor. See, there's another difference. Brian's got himself a fancy brief, the best that money can buy. All I'm going to end up with is some second-rate tosser courtesy of legal aid, right? There are some very good solicitors available, no cost to you, Grace assured him. Yeah, yeah, yada, 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 Jex responded, without opening his eyes. 
Don't worry about me, Detective Superintendent. No one ever has. Not even God. He pretended he loved me, but it's Brian he loved all along. You go off and cherish your Cleo Mori. Then, his voice suddenly icy, he opened his eyes and gave Grace a broad wink. Because you love her. There was an air of expectancy in the packed conference room for the Friday morning briefing meeting. Reading from his notes, Roy Grace said, I will now summarise the principal events that occurred during the course of yesterday following the arrest of Norman John Jex. He glanced down at his notes. One major item in our investigation into the murder of Katie Bishop is conclusive evidence provided this morning by the forensic odontologist Christopher Ghent that the human bite mark found on Norman Jex's severed right hand was made by Katie. He paused to let the significance sink in, then continued, D.S. Batchelor has discovered that for two years, until March of this year, a Norman Jex, matching our man's description, worked in the software engineering department of the Southern Star Assurance Company as a computer programmer. That timing is significant, in that he left approximately four weeks after Bishop allegedly took out a three million pound life insurance policy on his wife with this company. We have now requisitioned all Bishop's bank records to see if any premium was in fact ever paid. I suspect we may find he did genuinely have no knowledge of this. He sipped some coffee. Pamela and Alfonso have been checking further into the criminal record of Bishop. They have been unable to find any mention of either crimes in the local or national press around the times they allegedly occurred, or around the dates of the convictions. He turned another page. Yesterday evening, in a raid on garage premises rented by Jex, we discovered a duplicate set of license plates identical to those on Brian Bishop's Bentley. In a raid on his flat in Sackville Road, Hove, at the same time, we discovered evidence of an unhealthy obsession Jex had, or rather would appear to have, with his twin brother Brian Bishop. This included the discovery of video monitoring equipment linked via an internet connection to concealed surveillance cameras in the Bishop's Brighton home and in their London flat. Jex further admitted his hatred of his brother in a conversation Glenn Branson and I held with Jex under caution this morning. Grace continued, listing what had been found at Jex's flat, although he held back the information about the three dialed numbers that he and Branson had found on the man's pay-as-you-go phone, as they were not really supposed to have examined it, and it had now been passed to the telecoms unit. When he finished going through his notes, Norman Potting raised a hand. Roy, he said, I know it's not strictly our case, but I did a ring around the Brighton and Hove travel agents this afternoon, asking if they had any record of a Janet McWhorter asking about flights to Australia back in April of this year. There's a company called Aosa Travel. A lady there by the name of Lena found an inquiry form with the name of Janet McWhorter on it. She had put down her travelling companion as Norman Jex. When the briefing meeting was complete, Grace went to his office. First he called the SIO on the Janet McWhorter inquiry and told him about Potting's findings. Then he dialed Chris Binns, the Crown Prosecution Service solicitor for the Katie Bishop case, and brought him up to date on their findings. Although the evidence seemed to be pointing increasingly away from Brian Bishop and towards his brother, it was still early days, and it would be reckless to move too quickly in freeing a suspect. Bishop was due to appear in court on Monday for his next remand hearing. The two men agreed on a strategy. Chris Binns would speak to Bishop's solicitor and inform him that the Crown might be experiencing some difficulties with the prosecution as a result of new evidence coming to light, provided Bishop would agree to keeping the police informed of his whereabouts and to surrendering his passport. The bail application on Monday would not be contested by the CPS. When Roy Grace finished the call, he sat in silence for a long time. There was one part of the puzzle still missing one very big part. From one of the files on the pile on his desk, he removed Brian Bishop's birth and adoption certificates and those of his brother. His door opened and Glenn Branson's head appeared round. I'm just off, old timer, he said. What are you so happy about? Grace asked. She's letting me put the kids to bed tonight. Well, progress. Does that mean I get my house back soon? Well, I don't know. One swallow doesn't make a summer. Grace looked back down at the adoption certificates. Branson was right. 
One swallow did not indeed make a summer, nor, it seemed, did two men under arrest make a solution to a puzzle. Norman Jex just said this morning that he spent the first months of his life in an incubator, and that his parents were dead. And according to his parents, he was dead. Why were they lying about each other? Chapter 121 For the first time in what seemed a long, long week, Grace was in bed before midnight. But he slept only fitfully, trying to move as little as possible as he lay awake in order not to disturb Cleo, who was naked and warm and sleeping like a baby in his arms. Maybe when Norman Jex was behind bars, he would start to relax. All the time he was at the Royal Sussex County Hospital, it was too easy for a man of his cunning to escape, despite the police guard, and every unfamiliar noise in the night was potentially a Norman Jex footfall. It was the Black & Decker power drill that Cleo had found in her broom cupboard that upset him, and her, the most. She had never owned an electric drill in her life, and had had no workmen in the house recently. It was as if Jex had left behind a souvenir of his visit, a little token, a reminder. Because you love her. The drill was now in an evidence bag, safely locked up in the crime scene evidence store at the major incident suite. But the image of what it represented, and those words breathed at him earlier today by Jex from his hospital bed, would shadow him for a long time to come. His mind returned to Sandy, to Dick Pope's utter conviction that he and Leslie had seen her in Munich. If it was true, and she had run away from them, what did that say? That she'd started over again and wanted no connection with her previous life? But that made no sense. They'd been so happy together. Or so he had thought. Perhaps she had had a breakdown of some kind, in which case Cullen's suggestion of trawling all the doctors, hospitals and clinics in the Munich area might produce a result. But then what? Would he try to rebuild a life with her, knowing she had left him once and might do it again, and destroy all he had with Cleo in the process? There was, of course, the possibility that the Popes were mistaken, that it had been just another woman who resembled Sandy, like the one he had chased across the English garden. It was nine years now. People changed. Sometimes even he had difficulty remembering Sandy's face. And the truth was, in his heart, it was Cleo who now mattered most in life. Just that one day in Munich had nearly caused a rift in his relationship with her. To engage in a full-scale search of a city and all the time that involved would be a major undertaking, and who knew what repercussions that might have. He'd had nine years of chasing shadows and wild goose chases. Perhaps it was time to stop now, time to leave the past behind him. He fell asleep, resolved to try, at any rate, and awoke two hours later, shaking and shivering from the recurring nightmare that visited him every few months or so, Sandy's voice screaming out of the darkness, screaming for help. It was nearly an hour before he fell asleep again. At six in the morning he drove home, changed into his jogging kit and went down to the seafront. Almost every muscle in his body was hurting, and his ankle was too painful to run, so he hobbled down to the promenade and then back, the fresh morning air helping to clear his head. As he stepped out of the shower afterwards and began drying himself, he heard Branson's bedroom door open, then the toilet seat being lifted. Moments later, as he began lathering his face, he heard his friend urinating with a sound like a super tanker emptying its bilges. Finally the cistern clanked and flushed. Then Branson called out, To your coffee! Am I hearing right? Grace asked. Yeah, I've decided I'd make you a lovely wife. Just make me tea. Hold the nuptials, okay? Tea coming up. Branson was humming cheerily as he clumped down the stairs, and Grace wondered what pills he was on this morning. Then he turned his mind back to the business of shaving, and the problem he had still not been able to solve. Although at some time during the small hours, he had realised what his starting point should be. Shortly after ten, he was back in the small, cubicle-like waiting room in the registrar's office at Brighton Town Hall, holding a file folder. After only a couple of minutes, the tall, urbane figure of Clive Ravensbourne, the superintendent registrar, entered. He shook Grace's hand looking very much more at ease than on the previous occasion they'd met, a couple of days ago, 
if a little curious. Detective Superintendent, very nice to see you again. How can I help you? Thank you for coming in on a Saturday. I appreciate it. No problem. It's a working day for me. It's in connection with the same murder inquiry I came to see you about on Thursday, Grace said. You kindly gave me some information about a twin. I need you to verify it for me. It's very urgent and important to my inquiry. Certain things are just not adding up. Of course, Ravensbourne said. Whatever I can do, I will try. Grace opened the folder and pointed at Brian Bishop's birth certificate. I gave you the name of this chap, Desmond Jones, and asked if you would establish if he had a twin and the twin's birth name. There were 27 possible babies, all with the same surname. You suggested you could bypass having to go through each one simply by looking up the records from the index number on the birth certificate. Ravensbourne nodded emphatically. Yes, correct. Could I ask you to double-check for me? Of course. Ravensbourne took the birth certificate and went out of the room. A couple of minutes later he returned with a large, dark, red, leather-bound registry book, put it down with the birth certificate next to it, and leafed through it anxiously. Then he stopped and checked the birth certificate again. Desmond William Jones, mother Eleanor Jones, born at the Royal Sussex County Hospital, 7th of September 1964 at 3.47 a.m. And it says adopted, right? This is the right chap? Yes, he checks out. It's the one you gave me as his twin brother who doesn't. The registrar returned to the tome and looked down the page. Frederick Roger Jones, he read out. Mother Eleanor Jones, born at the Royal Sussex County Hospital, 7th of September 1964 at 4.05 a.m., also subsequently adopted. He looked up. That's your twin, Frederick Roger Jones. Are you sure? You couldn't be mistaken. The registrar turned the book around so that Grace could see for himself. There were five entries. That birth certificate you have, it's actually a copy of the original. The original is this entry in here, in this book. Do you understand that? The registrar asked. Yes, Grace replied. It's an exact copy. This is the original entry. Five entries to a page. See? The bottom two are your chaps. Desmond William Jones and Frederick Roger Jones. As if to demonstrate his veracity, Ravensbourne turned over the page. You see, there are another five on this. He stopped in mid-sentence and turned back a page, then turned it forward again. And then he said, Oh. Oh, dear. Oh, my God, it never occurred to me. I was in such a hurry when you came to see me, I remember. I saw the twin. You were looking for a twin. It never occurred to me. There, on the next page, the top entry, in neat, slanted black handwriting, was Norman John Jones, mother Eleanor Jones, born at the Royal Sussex County Hospital, 7th of September 1964, at 4.24 a.m. Grace looked at the man. Does this mean what I think it means? The registrar was nodding furiously, half out of embarrassment, half from excitement. Yes, born nineteen minutes later. The same mother. Absolutely. Chapter 122 Back issue after back issue of the Argus newspaper sped past Roy Grace's eyes. He sat hunched in front of the microfiche unit in the Brighton and Hove reference library, scrolling through the film containing the 1964 editions, slowing down occasionally to check the dates, April, June, July, August, September. He stopped the machine halfway through the 4th of September 1964 pages, then slowly cranked forwards. Then he stopped again when he reached the front page of the 7th of September edition, but there was nothing of significance. He read through each of the following news pages carefully, but still could find nothing. The splash of the 8th of September was a local planning scandal, but then, two pages on, a photograph leapt out at him. It was of three tiny babies lying asleep in a row inside the glass casing of an incubator, Inset next to this was a photograph of a small, mangled car. Above was the caption, Miracle Babies Survive Horror Death Crash. And there was another photograph of an attractive, dark-haired woman in her mid-twenties. Grace read every word of the article straight through, twice. His eyes went back to the picture of the babies in the incubator, to the woman's face, 
to the car, and then he read the words again, cutting through the sensational adjectives, just picking up the facts. Police were investigating why the Ford Anglia veered across the A23 in heavy rain early on the evening of the 6th of September into the path of a lorry. Eleanor Jones, single mother, science teacher, thought she was carrying twins, had been undergoing treatment for depression, eight and a half months pregnant, kept on life support in intensive care after they were delivered prematurely by a caesarean section. Mother died during the operation. He stopped the machine, removed the microfiche, replaced it in its container and handed it to the librarian. Then he almost ran to the exit. Grace could barely contain his excitement as he drove back to Sussex House. He was longing to see everyone's faces in the briefing meeting this evening, but most of all he was looking forward to telling Cleo, telling her that they had got the right man, for sure. But first he wanted to speak to the helpful post-adoption counsellor, Loretta Lebanite, and ask her one question, just as a double check. He was dialing her number on the hands-free when his phone rang. It was Roger Pohl, the SIO for the attempted murder of Cleo, thanking him for the information about the discovery of the MGTF workshop manual in Norman Jex's garage, and informing him they were now making Jex the prime suspect. You won't be needing to look any further, Grace told him, pulling over and stopping. Out of interest, how's the poor scumbag who tried to steal the car? Uh, he's still in intensive care at East Grinstead with 55% burns, but they're expecting him to live. Maybe I should send him some flowers for saving Cleo's life, he said. From what I hear, a bag or two of heroin would be more appreciated. Grace grinned. How's the officer from the car crime unit? PC Packer? Okay. He's been released from hospital, but he has quite severe burns on his face and hands. Grace thanked him for the information, then called Loretta Lebanite. When he told her what had happened, she laughed sympathetically. <laughs> I have known that before, she said. There's one thing that's bothering me, though, Grace said. His first two names, Norman John. When we spoke originally, you told me that adoptive parents change their names or perhaps move the birth name to a middle name. In this instance, he has both names. Is there any significance? None, she said. Most parents change, but some don't. Sometimes if a child isn't adopted for a while, they go to a care home, foster parents, and then they'll probably end up keeping their birth Christian names. Grace bumped straight into Glenn Branson as he headed across to his office. What are you looking so pleased about, old-timer? Branson asked. I've got some good news. And hey, you're in a pretty sunny mood yourself today, Grace said. Yeah, well, I've got some good news too. Tell me. You first. Grace shrugged. You remember that nasty social worker in the adoption services? The one with the pink hair and the bright green glasses, face like roadkill? The very one. Got a date with her, have you? She'd be well fit, so long as you take a paper bag to put over her head. Yes, I have got a date with her, and her boss, at three o'clock this afternoon. Remember I told her that if she was withholding information that could be helpful to us, I would hang her out to dry? Branson nodded. Yes. Well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hang the bitch out to dry. Not that you're a vengeful sort of person. Me? Vengeful? Nah. Grace looked at his watch. I've just had an interesting time down at the town hall in the reference library. You're going to like this a lot. I think we're game, set and match on Norman Jex. Fancy a lunchtime jar, and I'll tell you about it? I would, but I have to dash out. So what's your good news? The DS beamed. Actually, you know what? It's probably good news for you, too. The suspense is killing me. His beam broadening into the happiest smile Grace had seen on his friend's face in many months. Glenn Branson said, I've got to see a man about a horse. The End You've been listening to Not Dead Enough. Written by Peter James, narrated by David Borkham.